Okay, I'm calling this meeting back to order of the Sacramento City Unified School District Superintendent, Item 4.1, Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, audio good. Okay. We're we're good. Um, I'm hearing feedback. Good. Okay. Uh, Superintendent, Pledge of Allegiance. Please. Ready? Salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item 4.2, broadcast statements. Good member Jane. Do you have it? Um, I do not have it either. Do we have her broadcast statement? Thank you. This meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse. Today's meeting will air Sunday, de December 19th at 6 p.m. and Monday, December 20th at noon. It is also webcast at metro14live.sitecounty.net and can be viewed on Metro Cable 14's YouTube channel. The public has been given the opportunity to address the board through public comment, either by submitting comments which are posted on our website or by speaking during the meeting. Members of the public who wish to speak during the meeting and submit a speaker form will be sent a link to participate. When it is your turn to provide comment, we will call on you to provide comment orally. Your video will not be on. Please always limit comments during public comment to items that are not on the agenda. If you do comment on an item that is, <clears throat> we'll ask that you please defer your comments until your item comes up. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Item 4.3. We are lucky enough tonight to have two stellar students for December. Um, the first one, Jalea, uh, Jalea Perez from Parkway Elementary, and the second, Anna McNatt from C.K. McClatchy. So first, we'll go with uh, Jalea. Member Rhodes. Thank you, President Pritchett. So... Today we have Jalea Perez, uh, who's a fourth grader and was nominated uh, by her PM, Chrysalyn Morganan at Parkway Elementary School. Uh, Jalea was nominated for being a role model for the rest of her peers and always trying her best. Uh, Jalea is the first to offer a helping hand and does not allow anyone to be put down or bullied when she is around. Uh, she's a safe space for those around her and is an overall excellent example of an outstanding student. Thank you, Jalea. Um, I think we have our, Jalea and her parents here today. Uh, would you like to say anything? Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Jalea. <laughs> Thank you. All right. In the second, we have Anna McNatt, a junior from CK McClatchy. Uh, Vice President Morosky. Thank you, President Pritchett. It's my great pleasure to introduce Anna, Anna McNatt. McNatt. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> to introduce Anna McNatt as our stellar student from CK McClatchy. Anna's a junior and won the California Interscholastic Federation Cross Country State Championship at Woodward, Woodward Park in Fresno. She ran the second fastest time in California state history. <laughs> <laughs> Anna then competed in the U.S. Uh, Cross Country National Championships in San Diego and finished 27th in the nation. Anna also competes on the CKM track team and carries a 4.4 grade point average. She's being recruited by major colleges across the country and expects to make her college choice this time next year. A oh, hearty congratulations to you, Anna. Wow. Great job. <laughs> Anna, would you like to say anything? Um, yeah, just thank you. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, 
uh, it's amazing to see the support that I have. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. We are so proud of you. Very proud. Thank you, Anna and Julia. Keep up the good work. We're very proud of you. All right. And uh, we've had uh, actually several um, of our Sac City students that have made um, come a long way and made records um, over the past month. And so next month, we'll be bringing back uh, Rosemont High School's football team to recognize them for their efforts. So thank you. All right. Item 5.0, announcement of action taken in closed session. Good evening, President Pritchett. There are five announcements coming out of closed session. First, the board approved a special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20211-00021 by a unanimous vote, 7-0. Uh, the board also approved a second special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20210-80842 20 and approved that unanimously, vote 7-0. Third, the board approved a special education settlement agreement identified as CDE compliance case CDES 0564-2021 uh, by a unanimous vote 7-0. And fourth, the board approved a special education settlement agreement related to a special education matter uh, unanimously 7-0. The fifth announcement will come from the superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Uh, this evening, I am very pleased to announce that the board approved the following appointment by a unanimous vote. Uh, the board approved the appointment of Ms. Jackie Glasper as Principal of Success Academy. Congratulations, Ms. Glasper. All right. Thank you, Superintendent. Yes, congratulations, Ms. Glasper. All right. Um, item 6.0, agenda adoption. Can I get a motion? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion passes. Item 7.0, public comment. Um, we currently have 53. No, how many do we have? We now have 68 public comments. Okay, 68 public comments. Um, if it is the will of the board, um, I will allow one minute for each public comment. I'm going to ask that. Each of our public comments, please, um, we were gonna reduce the, the public comment time down to one minute per public comment so we can hear from each of you. I will um, be uh, trying to keep us all on time here um, to be able to hear from each of you. If you are speaking on an item that is on the agenda and you're listed under public comment, I will um, interrupt you and please ask you to um, stay online until we get to your agenda topic. Okay, with that, Ms. Allen, first one. Our first public commenter is Tracy Adams, and she has three other people that are donating time to her. Okay, so um, Ms. Adams gets four minutes. I should actually have five minutes. There should have been four. Can we fix that, or I'll just try to talk faster? Okay, do you have the fifth one, Ms. Allen? I'm sorry. Who was the fifth person? Do you know? Stephanie Kuroda, Stephanie Kuroda, Joy Cruz, Kelly Toomey, and Sarah Berger. Okay, five five minutes, Ms. Adams. Go ahead. Thank you for the time. My name is Tracy Adams, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and most of the Crocker Riverside teachers. We ended this summer with hope and excitement, even more so this year because kids have returned to in-person learning, and not for our own classrooms, but for a larger hope one for our whole district, to use COVID funds to change kids' lives and to shape our district to the best in the state. Kids have suffered both academically and emotionally for the last year and a half, and for a change, we have the district resources to actually make a difference. As we approach Labor Day, there were so many questions about training, when do I start work, what do we tell parents about online learning, quarantined kids, but we did what teachers do best. We saddled up, got to teaching, and made sure our kids in our rooms were cared for, safe, and learning. But questions continued. Where are the subs? What do we do with classes with no teachers? What is happening to the long-term distance learning kids on my role? And what do I do with quarantined students? So again, as teachers, we do what we do best. Cover the extra yard duty, plan for the extra classes that have no teachers, correct and grade not only our own classroom, but the vacant teacher positions work, students works. We pick up the slap so kids get an education and can be safe. 
Now I look around and all I see are overworked, exhausted teachers who are let down by the loss of potential. Four months into our year, these questions have become true screams. How can we as a district justify the 150 kids in the distance learning program that have received packets and no instruction since day one? How does the district's plan benefit these students and their families? How do we as teachers help all the kids academically that are behind with no help in our classrooms, no aids, no intervention teachers, and having to take extra kids because there are no subs? We all know there's a teacher shortage, but there are other routes to pursue with the COVID dollars, different curriculum, more aids, college interns, mentorship programs, community partnerships with community agencies. Where is the systematic intervention program, the MTSS, that is talked about in board meetings? We are losing children daily as they slip through the cracks. They don't qualify for special ed, but they need more help than one teacher can do alone in a classroom. Speaking of teacher and shortages, how does this district ever expect to recruit new teachers, let alone keep the experienced ones that we have when they're talking about cutting take-home pay by having teachers to have cover huge portions of their benefits? We will be the last destination district and we, when we have middle of the road pay and the most expensive benefit package for teachers. With the current plan that the district has proposed, new teachers may lose up to a third of their take-home pay to cover putting their family on a benefit plan. We already have experienced teachers at our site looking to leave just under the pressure of the threat that the loss of benefits takes. We are trying to focus on kids and the learning and we can't focus solely on that when we have all this outside noise that is not leading to successful district practices. The fifth scream. Thank you, Ms. Adams. If you can please wrap it up. That, oh, sorry. The, nope. You still have two minutes. Go ahead. The clock just does. <laughs> Go ahead. Where's the social emotional help that the COVID dollars we can use to help our kids? In the last four months, we've had to reach out to our school psychologist more than in the in more, more times in total than in the last four years. We've had two sixth graders hospitalized already this year. Where is the COVID money going? We need things, filters, test kits, computers, but we have millions sitting in the account and it is not benefiting our children. These are the screams I hear daily from the teachers I work with. It has been the school site staff who has made this fall and their return to campus as successful as it could be not the district administration policies that have been presented to this board. It is the teachers, principals, and site staff who have stepped in and problem solved and fixed holes left by the layoffs and the bad hiring practices in the past. It is the teachers, principals, site staff, and parents who have to make lunchtime remain safe. It has been the teachers, principals, and site staff that have done the tutoring for interventions, paid and unpaid. It has been on the teacher's back and the school site staff's back that our district has limped along. At Crocker, we have done everything in our power to make sure that our kids come back to clean, safe classroom activities that are engaging, rigorous, and classrooms where they are loved and accepted. We are trying our best to keep kids from falling through the cracks that are now crevices and need support from this board and the district office to stop the losses. Please note that most of these policies I'm mentioning are not things at a school site level control. They are how the big funds get spent and how we get resources allocated from a district level. We need to use our COVID money to support kids and the school site staff. We need to have enough energy to fight for our kids and our students and not waste time fighting to keep our pay and for some of the crazy issues. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Up. Please wrap it up. We need to be included in the planning policies that affect our children and our teaching. And we need to approach this year and all years in the future as a team. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Ms. The Allen. next speaker is Ingrid Hutchins and she has three people donating time to her. Okay, four minutes, Ms. Hutchins. Good evening, thank you for, um, allow me to also use a few minutes of time from my colleagues at my school. Sorry, my notes <laughs> went away, okay. Um, as a staff member at Cap City, I have some urgent items for you to consider. Every year our district administrators go through projected budget and staffing for the following year. Since the district failed to adequately prepare for our current school year, what efforts will be made to ensure there's proper planning for next year? 
Specifically, does the district plan to have independent study program return to its sim smaller size? If so, why is this decision being made when so many families are still requesting an online option for their students? Has the district made a plan to adequately staff the program next year so students don't miss months of instruction because they don't have a teacher? We currently have 400 students who are still on our waiting list. Is the district making plans to survey parents now rather than in late summer so they can get an idea of what the families in our district will need next year? Over 1,000 students found out firsthand what happens when a district ignores their needs until the last minute. Will the district start preparing to meet the needs of our families who, don't, who still don't feel safe coming back to in-person learning in the fall? Are they going to let hundreds of families twist in the wind again next school year? On a broader level, as an employee of the district, I want to know what you as a board are planning to do to keep our district from falling apart. When are you going to insist the district engage in good faith negotiations? I'm sure you all realize the market for teachers will be highly competitive this summer. Without a desirable contract with SCTA, you won't be able to hire new teachers. If any surrounding districts are watching the three ring circus that Sac City has become, they will offer to match years for seasoned teachers. When that happens, the students in our district won't have many qualified teachers left to educate them. You can't behave like an emotionally abusive partner who tells teachers to tolerate the district's ongoing disrespect, gaslighting, refusal to engage in good faith negotiations, then tell them to stay for the children. As in any abusive relationship, sometimes the children gain life lessons from watching the adults in their lives stand up for themselves and leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Next speaker. Please. Next speaker is David Fisher, and he has two people donating time. Okay, three minutes, Mr. Fisher. Hello. For years now, the superintendent, with the support of the school board and Dave Gordon at the Sacramento County Office of Education, have demanded unprecedented cuts in certificated and classified staff's take home pay, all the while claiming the district was on the brink of insolvency. In every case, those claims have proven to be false. Despite these claims, tonight the school board is scheduled to vote on a new contract for the superintendent, which includes huge increases in compensation while continuing to demand almost $10,000 per year in cuts to take home pay for staff. On top of his already large salary of $327,000, an additional estimated 5.6 salary increase of over $18,000 based on the California Consumer Price Index for this year, an additional lump sum of, quote, longevity bonuses. I'm sorry, Mr. Fisher, are you speaking on item 9.1? Are you speaking on public comment? Public comment. And by the way, the superintendent's contract came up after most people had signed up for it to speak. That was too late to change it at that point. But I've got, I, I, whatever, I got more to say. But to, uh, suffice it to say that the, the superintendent, you added all up. And we're talking an increase of over $66,000 in the first year only. Now, I mean, this only makes sense if, you know, in the next scene, three ghosts appear to get you guys to come to your senses and do the right thing. It's ridiculous. I mean, seriously, the superintendent has continually projected, along with staff, budgets that have been wildly inaccurate. Now, Sac City budget is projected to end a 21-22 school year with a $13 million surplus. As you well know, this past spring, both certificated and classified staff voted overwhelmingly that they did not have confidence in the superintendent's leadership. One of the multiple reasons for that vote is the mismanagement of the district's finances. Since August of 2018, Mr. Aguilar and the district staff have incorrectly stated that Sac City is on the brink of insolvency. Every year since then, Sac City has run a surplus rather than the massive deficit projected by the superintendent. Now, once again, after stating that Sac City would end 21-22 with a $6 million deficit, the district is now projecting to end the year with a $13 million surplus. I was looking over old board communications. You guys were told in 2018 by the superintendent that last year you would have to cut $40 million, otherwise we would be in insolvency. When this happens year after year after year, where is the accountability? Those cuts don't happen. We don't make concessions and you end up with surplus after surplus after surplus. What's happening again? The district is now projecting to end the 21-22 school year 
with $116 million Thank in you, Mr. Fisher, if you could please fund, wrap it up. The highest in Sac State history, another record. Our teachers and our students deserve leadership that prioritizes the students in the classroom over the highest paid administrators in the district, not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Ms. Ellen. Next speaker is Lisa Stinson, and she has one person donating time. Okay, Ms. Stinson, two minutes. Thank you. Oh, Miss uh, Lisa's not online. Oh, okay. All right. Our next speaker is Amy Tunin. Go ahead, Ms. Tunin. One minute, please. Hi, my name is Amy <laughs> Tunin. I have been a school teacher for Saxony Unified for 28 years. I am a widow with two dependents. Um, my daughters and I have insurance through Sutter Health through the school district. Um, I've chosen Sutter Health for the mental health coverage that they offer, and I also have glaucoma, so I see a doctor that specializes in this. To keep myself and my two daughters insured with what the district is proposing, it would cost my family $19,895.28. That's almost $20,000 a year net reduction from my take home pay. Um, I'm asking the district to please reconsider this. I've given my heart and soul to this district and this is my last eight years and my family can't afford that reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Finnan. Next speaker. Next speaker is Teresa Hanneman. Hi there, my name is Teresa Hanneman. I've spent my entire 20 year career teaching at Parkway Elementary. This has been the hardest year of my career so far. Our students came to us this year with gaps in their academics and compounded trauma due to the pandemic and the pivot we had to make to distance learning the last year and a half. We are seeing frequent aggression, including fights, as well as disruptions to learning. We have a staffing crisis across all bargaining units, which impacts instruction, safety and social emotional supports for students, not to mention the mental and physical health of staff. Staff is being asked to do more with fewer resources. I am tired of hearing from the district team that everyone is experiencing staffing shortages. It is ex easy to explain it away when you are not directly impacted by this crisis. What are you doing to address this? The district is proposing a huge cut in take home pay for SCTA members. I have sat across the bargaining table for the last three years and witnessed the district team come unprepared and unable and unwilling to answer basic questions or explain their thinking on their own proposals or rejection of ours. The fact that this Thank board you, is Hanneman, if you could please wrap it up. a raise or a contract extension for a superintendent who has failed our students and staff so miserably is disgusting. Shame on you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Dawn Peters. Do we have Dawn? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dawn. Can you hear us? Uh, uh, you're on mute. Okay, if we could please go back to Don, next speaker. Next speaker is Alice Mercer. Good evening, Alice. She's not on? Oh, okay. Hello, um, I am using time from Julie Catchell and Melissa, um, Melissa Reynoso. Did, did we get? Both of them are on. Okay, so you get three minutes. Go ahead, Ms. Mercer. Okay. My name is Alice Mercer. I am a teacher at Huber Bancroft Elementary. I'm commenting today on the absolutely critical levels of mental health need our students are experiencing and the lack of a comprehensive, cohesive, long-term plan by the district to address this. I have students who were already experiencing attendance problems, unsettled home lives, and academic problems prior to the 10 pandemic, but those 18 months were like adding 50 mile per hour winds to an already burning grass fire. The kids are not all right. 
the teachers are not all right. And we need help, not just now, but probably for the next five to 10 years. The district is treating this like a short-term problem and their solutions often feel like they are providing band-aids to gunshot victims. It's not adequate, it's not suitable. It does not meet the need. I will share that this is the hardest school year of my 20 year career that includes time teaching in Oakland, at Success Academy and at Oak Ridge Elementary in this district. Here's a quick example. I had a parent meeting to address the needs, which are many for her child. She is trying to secure private insurance, but will need to file appeals and go over and argue with them about what she's entitled to to get the correct services. The school nurse very helpfully suggested to get services started now, we use a school counselor, something her other school sites often employ. Except our school site does not have a counselor. We have limited site funds and have focused on academic intervention, which is also needed. We need comprehensive school-based wrap around services, not CERNA-based services, not a list of community service providers who are already overtaxed, but services on our school campuses, not at some campuses, but all the campuses, because these problems are no longer limited to schools in highly vulnerable zip codes. To get the, those counselors, they'll need to have some assurance that their position will not be held hostage in the yearly game of budget chicken that you continue to play. They'll need to know that the salary and benefits package offered will not be slashed or just played with as a sadistic cat plays with a mortally wounded mouse. <sighs> SCTA has offered plans for spending money in ways that improve student services. There were state funds made available for just this sort of use, but deadline passed recently without the district applying for them. Instead, we're hearing about another raise for the superintendent. The board says they need to do this because it would be tragic to have high turnover at the top. We have it. Most superintendents have served five plus years since I've been in the district. I'm sure it's heartening to Mr. Aguilar that you have his back, but that is not your job. It's to have the children's back. Thank we you. Oh, thank you, Ms. Mercer. Thank you. District administration thank you, Ms. Mercer, if you could please wrap it up. Never address the problems I'm seeing in my students now if you don't change the wrong- Thank you, Ms. Mercer. Could you please wrap it up? I'm done. Thank you. Our next speaker, um, is Don Peters. Don, are you here? No. No. Okay. Next speaker. Next speaker is Kirill Lukinski. Kirill Lukinski. No. no. Okay, next speaker. All right. Next speaker is Chrissy Goats or Gotez. No. No. Okay, next speaker. Next speaker is Chris Love. <clears throat> Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Fantastic. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm coming in as a uh, parent of a kid that's eligible for the district but is not attending. He's going to private school. I'm also a teacher at Pacific Elementary. I want to invite you guys, room two, Pacific Elementary School, swing on by. I promise I'll be nice, but I just would love to talk with you guys. I want to make this work. Um, I want to encourage... Um, the superintendent, uh, Superintendent Aguilar, come on by my room, room two, Pacific. We'll talk, man. I'll get you some coffee. All right. Um, I just, I just want you to come to the bargaining meetings and just work with us. I, I promise. Like we're good people, man. We are. Um, and it, it just, it, it's not. It's kind of tone deaf for to give raises at Cerna and then ask for the teacher's pay to get cut. And I, I just, I just want, I just want to understand why. What's going on? I'm not angry. I'm doing what I can. Thank you, Mr. Levin. You know, if you could please wrap it up. You got it. I just, I, we, let's just work together, you guys. Seriously. Thank you. Let's thank you for together. the invite. Thank, thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tiffany Colasante. 
Tiffany, are you there? I'm here. Can okay. you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm a parent and a teacher in this district, and I quit a teaching job in another district in 2017 in order to accept my current position. I took a significant pay cut when changing districts, but knew I wanted to work in the same district where my kids attend, teach closer to my house, and have more and better benefits. I would love to stay in SCUSD and finish my career, but I have to be able to afford to do so. Planning to take away pay and require me to choose to pay for my children's health care or have them go without will have me looking elsewhere. Because of the teaching shortage nationwide, we need to recruit and retain teachers more robustly than ever. A salary decrease and less contribution to benefits will not accomplish these goals and, in fact, are an insult when you're considering increasing the superintendent's pay and perks. Please stop trying to balance the projected budget on the backs of teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Brian Moore. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a teacher at Leonardo da Vinci School, and I'm speaking to you tonight about the staffing crisis in SCUS in Sacramento City Unified School District. Not a shortage, but a crisis. There are currently 126 certified vacancies. Those are students who do not have classroom teachers, special education teachers, or counselors, not including independent study, where 380 students have not had contact with the teacher. So that means all they have done this year is fill out packets of work. In my opinion, that is not an education. On average, there are 60 classes per day where the district cannot provide a substitute and teachers are giving up their prep time or multiple classes of students are being put into a gymnasium or divided up into other classes to be babysat, not taught the curriculum they are needed. This is unconscionable. The district and board should be doing everything Thank in their you. power. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Our next speaker, our next uh, commenter is Peter Hart. Mr. Hart, are you there? Yes, I am. Go right ahead. All right, thank you. And I'm from uh, Fern Bacon Middle School. And I want to say that the contract negotiations are at a standstill with the cliche argument of insolvency. At the same time, district jobs are getting raises at the Cerner Center, and the superintendent is getting the obscene salary of over $300,000 a year. During this pandemic, it was us at the schools that keep things going. We educate the children, we ease their fears, we guide families to nutrition and health clinics. Not the district, not the board, and certainly not the superintendent. Legal action will surely happen with budget cuts and stalled contract negotiations. Audits will be done, money will be found then, and the cost to the district will be substantially more. You could avoid extra costs by finding the money now for the budget. You can avoid extra costs by negotiating a contract in good faith now. Do right for the teachers. Thank Do you, right Mr. Hart. The, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Hart. Do right for the students. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Our next speaker is Marcy Amparo. Marcy, are you there? Hello, good evening. Uh-oh. Nope, you're here. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good evening. As a teacher, I'm fed up with the dysfunctional management. Many of us have given up all hope that the superintendent and this board will do the right thing for these children. A lot more of us are going to leave this district. I asked last night what it took to get the mayor involved last time and actually get the superintendent to the table to talk. The answer was a strike. Is that what you're waiting for? for action to happen to get the decision makers in a room together to have a productive conversation. The superintendent needs to step up and be the leader he's paid to be by having an uncomfortable conversation with the people who are actually in the room with the students that you all are supposed to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nafisha Young. 
When is this board and superintendent going to address the massive failures that are happening in special education and around the district? How is Sacramento City Unified School District going to recruit new staff and retain certain uh, current staff with the current practices? Yes, there are shortages everywhere. And when I look at the news, employers are doing things to incentivize staff by increasing wages, making sure staff feel supported and treating them like valued team members. Sac City, on the other hand, is offering its frontline workers because that is what we are wage freezes income reductions absurd amounts of extra work and making it abundantly clear that our expertise is not valued while at the same time rewarding those in the Cerna Center by giving wage increases to the superintendent and in-house counsel just to name a few I thought I was coming to a place that aspired to be the destination district and instead I find myself in a district that is so dysfunctional the principals and teachers are fleeing at an alarming rate it is time to put students first Thank you, Ms. Young. Next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Durazo. Are you there, Ms. Durazo? Hello? Yep, go ahead, Ms. Durazo. Hello? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was giving, I'm donating my time to Charmaine Brown. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Next speaker. So, okay. The next speaker is Eddie Spiller. No. Okay. No, no. Next speaker is Olivia Miner. Miss Miner, are you there? Oh, you are on mute. Okay. I would like oh. to donate my time to Cassandra Will. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker. Christine Velasquez. Please go ahead. Christine. I also would. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can. I, I also was donating my time to SEIU. Charmaine, is it Charmaine? Miller. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next speaker is Linda Hegney. Linda, are you there? Linda is not on. Thank okay. you. Our next speaker is Anthony Bell. Anthony, go ahead. No it. Go ahead, Anthony. All right. All right. There we go. And I've taken the time to fill this fog. Oh. Is that good? I'm sorry. You're taking time for who? Fill this fog. Do you have that person? Sound? One minute. Go ahead. Okay. Go sorry. ahead. All right. Oh, are you giving your time to that person? Uh, waste my time. I, I want to say first, uh, I've been a parent in the district a long time. Um, I've been a coach. I've been an employee and I'm still an employee. I currently work at uh, Hiram Johnson High School, and I am the shop steward at this time for the campus, I believe Co. And uh, we've been experiencing a lot of uh, extreme situations at our campus. And I believe across the board that it's been a struggle to get kids back on task. They've had adults turned off and everyone's a little bit stressed out and overworked. And this just seems like kind of a slap in the face to the people who've been in the front lines, keeping this thing going. And uh, you know, the faculty, the teachers support the, the classifieds and the classifieds support the faculty. And we have to have that going and we have to take care of each other and the administration has to be able to take care of its employees and you just can't kneecap the administration and uh, when we have administrators like mine on my campus who are dealing with major issues they need all the resources they can have Thank everything you. they can Let's have at their disposal to Thank be you. getting these kids the services that they need not going and looking at cuts we need to be getting uh innovative and finding ways to be increasing incentives to increasing the pay 
and uh, finding a way to make that work and make that happen. We need to get back to the bargaining table. And I really implore you and beg you and, and hope that you will consider uh, coming back with a more reasonable and humane offer for the hardworking uh, employees of Sac City Unified School District. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Next. Our next speaker is Jean Sato. I have Jody Bones minute as well. Okay. Go ahead. You have two minutes. I've been a teacher in this district for 23 years. I'm a big picture person and I pride myself at looking at multiple sides of the situation. Here's what I see in my big picture. We are losing students and many that we have don't have teachers. We are short staffed and can't hire new staff. We have untold amounts of money from the federal government to help with COVID, but what is that money actually being used for? Recruitment of qualified staff, instructional aids for students, a quality independent study option? Not in my big picture. I see families using grandma's or auntie's address so they can attend that other district. You know the one, the one that openly invests in its students. It has 28 to one ratio in intermediate. It has an emphasis on VAPA and STEAM. Weekly, they bust every fifth grader pre-COVID to a hands-on science experience called Starbase. Each student had a Chromebook before COVID so that the transition to home learning was much smoother. Elementary schools have full-time counselors. Or they pick the other nearby district, which is investing its money in new state-of-the-art buildings for its students, or where they've been able to hire instructional aides because they held job fairs and offered signing and retention bonuses of $2,000. Why can't we recruit teachers? Why are teachers going to STIRS meetings after school to see if they can manage an early retirement? Why are special ed teachers in tears as they try to navigate an ever-changing landscape of shifting rules, regulations, and demands? <clears throat> Why are student teachers learning in our district with no intention of actually working here? Yes, they do openly discuss on social media and in their college classes which districts to avoid and which ones to apply to. This is the new talent, techno technologically savvy group of people that we need in our district, our students need in our district. Teachers don't want to work in our district because when they have 31 students, they are considered under-enrolled, but when that neighboring district's teacher has 31 students, they are getting paid 75 extra dollars a day. Teachers can't afford to work in our district when they're facing unfathomable proposed pay cuts. And yes, losing $700 or more from your paycheck is unfathomable to most people. We are looking to you for leadership. We are looking at you to communicate openly and honestly about monies received and how they are being spent. Thank you, we Ms. want Sutter. you to help make this a district teachers and other necessary staff want to come to. Thank and you, we are yearning to help you make decisions that honestly serve our students and truly put them first. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike DeSantis. Hi, I'm here. Um, I had trouble getting on, so I'm not fully prepared, but bear with me. I um. My name is Mike DeSantis. I work at New Joseph Bonheim as a third grade teacher. I just wanted to log on. I only have a minute, so thank you. I wanted to tell you that for the last few years now, I've dedicated my, my energies, all of my energies, um, to creating joy and happiness in my life. And I tell you this because I got a, 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 a knot in my stomach when I found out that my family could be losing anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 a year. I'm not one of those teachers that's required to stay. I've only been with the district five years. I can go anywhere I want. I don't have what's called golden handcuffs. Mr. Between in the classroom and my students at home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leah Frame. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Um, hello, I am commenting as a Sac City parent and an employee. The proposed cuts to take home pay for employees will have a severe impact on my family. We have an elementary age child and a preschooler who will soon be coming up the Sac City pipeline. The proposed cuts are about the amount we personally pay for high quality preschool. The pay cuts will make it very challenging for us to afford two more years of preschool for our child. Per Sac City Unified website, preschool prepares your child to succeed in school and is critical for a child's development. 
So I'm confused about how these cuts further Sac City's own stated goal of supporting young children in being ready for school. I'm sure there are many Sac City employees with young families in my situation. You are cutting off funding many of us use for our children's early education. Yes, I'm aware of SB 130, promising you, pre preschool. Crane. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Cox. Go ahead, Ms. Cox. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. We've asked so much of our teachers over the last 18 months. At every new challenge, we have risen to the occasion. With limited resources, little support and direction, we have gotten our students through the last two years of school. If you listen to teachers here in our community and across the country, you will hear a pretty clear message. We are at our breaking point and you can't expect more at this moment than what we have been getting. We love this community and we are ready and willing to pitch in. Being part of, part of being members of a larger community is about equity. Asking teachers to take a pay cut when there is a current deficit and all members of district leadership are taking a cut is equitable. Asking teachers to take a pay cut when we are facing a budgetary surplus and providing ample salary increases to higher levels of leadership it's just inequitable. It is a statement about not valuing your frontline workers, and it is a recipe for disaster. Teachers will quit, and students will suffer more than they already have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Darby. Not online. Not Thank, online. You. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mo Kashmiri. Go ahead, Mo. Mo Kashmir, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Go right ahead. All right. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I'm just, <laughs> it's just sad to see all the hypocrisy of forcing teachers and bus drivers back into school and into stuffing the full of kids and the board still hasn't opened up their own meetings um, like they promised they were going to uh, several months ago. Uh, it's just, you know, like I'm tired of it, you know, in terms of this classified staff, they haven't gotten a raise for three years. Um, and now at the bargaining table, which I'm at, we don't even, all we hear is that they'll give us an economic proposal when we have all our proposals in. But then in the in the agenda packet, you put that you want everyone to take a 1% pay cut, a furlough, and pay more for health, dental, and vision. Our folks can't handle that. A lot of our folks are barely making minimum wage, are, you know, making above minimum wage right now. It's embarrassing. These, they're, they're not just your staff. These are our community members. These are the parents of our families. Uh, they deserve better than what they're getting. Thank you, Mr. Kashmiri. Please wrap it up. The district of, is imploding in terms of losing top leadership, losing good principals, losing good teachers. we got to turn it around. This way that we're going is not working. And the definition of insanity is doing the same Thank thing you, over Mr. and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Darkay. Uh, my name is Aaron Dark, and I'm a middle school teacher at Alice Burney, and here to speak about the lack of understanding the district leadership has about what we as teachers are experiencing, and more importantly, how that affects our students. My colleagues and I show up every day to schools without enough teachers, without enough substitutes, without enough support staff. We worked incredibly hard before anyone ever heard of COVID. Now we are being asked to do even more. Still, we show up every day because we care about the well-being and education of the children in front of us. Throughout all of this, our voices are constantly being disregarded by district leadership. We are the ones on the front lines. We are the ones who know our students best and have great ideas about how to take a tough situation and make it better. Our proposals are consistently disregarded and not once has our superintendent come to a bargaining session. We are willing to make great sacrifices for our students, but we are human and there are limits to what we can do. We need to be seen and valued for who we are and made partners in working toward a solution for the betterment of all students. Thank you. Thank you. Next Our next speaker is Mary O'Toole. Go ahead, Ms. O'Toole. Oh, you are on mute. Okay, please go back to Ms. O'Toole. Next speaker. All right, next speaker, Joseph Fuentes. Mr. Fuentes, go right ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jose Martin Fuentes. I've been an employee since 2005. I've been at the John Morse Therapeutic Center for over the last 15 years. Thank you for listening to me. I also want to commend 
the board for taking on additional roles at the district level. The other day, a colleague of mine was bitten by a student. This is because we lack sufficient staff. And although we lack about approximately six staff members right now, that still represents over 22% of our normal uh, staff ratio. I also realize my staff saves the districts hundreds of thousands of dollars as we do not send our, these students to non-public schools, but we're at our breaking point. Our employees are tending to positions they were not trained for. Everyone is wearing multiple hats and it's only a matter of time before a student or a staff member becomes Thank critical. Thank you, Mr. Puentes. Please wrap it up. I, the action I want all of you to take is to increase special education employment. The benefit will be safer schools so that our students can learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Borez. Linda is not, not online. online. Okay. Our next speaker is Lori Jablonski. Ms. Jablonski, go right ahead. Okay, hi there. Um, my comment or more accurately questions about the state of the district and this board. So I'm going to ask how in the world does such a proposal as the superintendent's new contract even get on the agenda? Ms. Jablonski, you, is this a comment about hey, and I, I signed up and I did not know this was on the agenda until after I signed up. So please, please let agenda, me speak. But, even in the best of times, this would be obnoxious. But given the massive cuts on the table for teachers and staff, you've entered the grotesque zone. How does this happen? Board President Pritchett, is this your doing? Um, you know, there's a, new to there's a near total disconnect between the superintendent and all of you on the board as to what is desperately needed at the school sites. What the heck is going on outside the public eye that convinces any of you that this disconnect is good for kids or accomplishing anything other than district collapse? Who are you talking to? How are these conversations taking place? These closed sessions must be doozies. Thank we you, do Mr. Blonsky. We do not hear what's going on in the public eye. Comfort and joy for Jorge Aguilar. Thank Misery you, Mr. Blonsky. Please wrap it up. Thank you. Please vote no. Thank you. I want to remind the public that this has been on the agenda since it was posted. Thank you. Next comment. Benito Aleman. All right. Rick Redding. To the distinguished board members and Superintendent Aguilar, I wish you a good evening. My name is Rick Redding, and I started teaching at Hiram Johnson High School in 2006, and I have been a member of the Tahoe Park neighborhood community for 53 years. This year, we've experienced numerous staff assaults leading to emergency room visits as well as vicious fighting amongst our students. As reluctant as I am to say this, many of us lack confidence in our leadership's ability to be proactive, transparent, and resolve these issues. In addition to increasing the number of campus monitors, Many feel the return of an SRO and an independent review of safety protocols is essential to restoring order on campus. California has the fifth largest economy in the world. The compensation of its teachers should reflect that. Inflation has risen 6.2%. Thank if you. I'm Thank so you, bold, Mr. Redding. If I may be so bold, SETA's proposal of a 3.5% salary increase isn't enough. Thank I you. feel- Thank you, Mr. Redding, if you could please wrap it up. Yes, you should pay us the 3.5% and an additional 6.2% for inflation for an adjustment of a total increase of thank 9. Thank you, Mr. Redding. Thank that is the fair thing to do. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Cassandra Wills. Yes, good evening. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I'm Cassandra Will, a driver of transportation 26 years, dedicated in safety, transporting these children, our children, back and forth from home to school. On behalf of my myself and every classified employee at transportation, the majority of us begin our day in darkness and end our work day in darkness. Safety is our number one goal 
But at the present time, I question each and every board member and Mr. Aguilar, how important is safety to you? Not just for the kids, but all employees of this district. At transportation, I hear my coworkers constantly saying, we, you know, we're overworked, we're frustrated. Coworkers is, is, is stating, I, I'm tired. You know, um, today was hard. Employees taken off work because they're exhausted. Children not being Thank picked you, up. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. You know, please wrap it up. Excuse me, but you know what? I also want to let you know that I have the minutes from Ramsey Odom and Olivia Minor. Thank you. And as I was saying, children are not being picked up because okay. there's no driver. Buses zipping through Sacramento, doubling up, tripling up routes. Parents calling, cursing out dispatchers, yelling out the drivers. Why? Because we're an hour late. Vans overloaded. We have we have to return students, return for students that was left behind because we're at our capacity. You guys listen, this is so not fair to us. We have come to realize that you all just do not care. Although you all have a heart, where is the compassion in that heart? When you all go home tonight and look in the mirror, please think of me. Please think of me, Cassandra will. Please think of me. And I just want to say one thing to you guys. This is what I do to encourage myself. Every day I get behind the wheel of that bus. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay? Our logbook that we sign in and out on, or those that take off, is full already. There has been calls being made for tomorrow that their kids is not going to be getting picked up. You guys, we need your assistance. We need your help, okay? The most important thing in this world is the cargo that we drive, and those are children. We need you guys' help. And I appreciate the one person that promised me that you guys would come and ride the bus with us. Thank you. The other ones that said they would, they didn't do it. But that's okay. That's okay. It just shows me exactly who you are and where we stand. I thank you guys so very much. Please show that heart. I thank you guys. Thank you. So very thank, much. Thank you. Remember Ms. me when you look in that mirror. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis Plotz. Not online. All right. Our next speaker is Phyllis Fogg. Not online. I think... She gave her time. Okay. Our next speaker is Rich Vasquez. Go ahead, Mr. Vasquez. Good evening, Board President, uh, Superintendent. Uh, again, we had uh, a lot going on over at Johnson. Uh, we had a donation for uh, uh, to help us. Uh, I want to see about the baseball field. What are we going to do with that? Uh, I, when we <laughs> received the uh, donation, we were talking about we're the only school in the region with no ba home baseball field. And, uh, you know, are we going to start working on that? What's going on? We're we're doing our part at the school site. When is the district going to start supporting that? Also, with uh, this CTE program of uh, health and medical sciences, uh, what, what are we doing? <laughs> or do we need to start uh, reorganizing our CTE programs again? These kids chose this uh, pathway and there's no teacher. When, when are we working on it? I don't know what's going on. Uh, this, uh, this it feels like the education in this CSUD is a sham. Uh, where's the equity? I had one, one daughter, my older daughter, go to West Campus and we're having completely different. She didn't live this type of stuff. Why are you doing this to the most needed help students? You talk about a Title I high priority school. Thank you, Mr. You aren't our needs. Please start. Uh, even at the SIPs, I'm doing all my time work putting in. We're giving your feedback and you're not meeting us. It's your fault. You're failing the school, the district, and the leadership. We can't make any happening until you guys start doing what we're asking. Thank we're you, on the Mr. Cycle. Vasquez. Thank, Thank you. you. Step it up. Get better. Thank you. Thank Our you. next speaker is Thomas Vidicic. Hi, thank you for the time. So my name is Tommy Vitisich. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Elder Creek Elementary, and I have Sac State student teachers in my class every year. Uh, and when it's time for them to look for jobs, they ask me if they should work here. And I'm conflicted because I love our schools, care deeply about our students. I'm a K-12 uh, Sac City product. So I, my heart is really in this district. And as much as it pains me, I have to honestly recommend that they look in other districts. With proposed salary and benefit cuts, 
their future is not secure in Sac City. I've seen so many great student teachers turn away from SCUSD to neighboring districts. Our students deserve the best educators and we can't attract and retain good teachers if the district demonstrates over and over that they are not valued. We can go back and forth all day about money and budget lines, but in the end, let's remember that it's the children and the classrooms that are harmed. Let's keep the students front and center as we navigate these uh, changes to the teacher contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Next Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Bailey. Go ahead, Ms. Bailey. Hi, um, I believe that I have some time from Rowena Zamlao. Is she on? I do not have that name. How about Joe Smith? Um, yes, I do have You've Joe Smith. You've got two minutes. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, because I have a little extra time, I won't have to talk 100 miles an hour. And I, I guess I want to start with, I just, there are teachers, I'm a classified employee, and to my fellow classified employees who've called in, Cassandra and all the people at um, transportation, I hear you, and it's this just feels so hard to fe hear people struggling. And um, I see you, and I hope the people that are decision makers are paying attention. Um, I also um, would like to just say I hope that um, you know the level of attention that's made to make sure people are done at their 60 seconds. Um, I can appreciate that. I also would love to see that sort of attention taken to the to the bargaining table. That'd be great. So um, I'm going to carry on with what I originally planned to say. Um, so I'm a classified employee and I'm an instructional aide in the SDC class. I love my job. I love the students and the families, the teachers, I, all of it. Um, but this year has been a beast of a year. It's been harder than any other year in just about every single way. I hear you all um, with talking points about um, caring about students and that messaging. And at the same time, the district is proposing furlough days for folks who are the lowest paid in the district. In addition, 1% pay cuts and also having to pay more for health insurance. People are struggling and the proposal is to cut school counselors in middle school and high schools. I, I just can't wrap my brain around that decision. We are understaffed, underpaid and doing our very, very best to serve families and students and to keep our heads above water. You all are sitting on $12.9 million surplus, and your proposal is to take supports and resources away from the folks that are directly serving Thank students. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Oh. Could you please wrap it up? That's two minutes? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah. We'll go back to Mary O'Toole. Mary, are you there? On mute. You're on mute, Mary. Could you please unmute yourself? Okay. We will move on. Our next speaker is Zachary Bryant. Zachary Bryant. You're on mute, I believe. There we go. I apologize. I'll also be using the time of Dennis Plotz. Okay, you got two minutes, go ahead. Thank you, so myself and many other uh, staff members, teachers have been uh, working extra, working extra periods, um, covering classes that have no substitute or teacher on our preps, oftentimes without having gotten paid for those coverages so far. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the layoffs that the superintendent and the board approved uh, to lay off staff members and teachers. And now we're stuck with vacancies uh, even at our site, one teacher was hired for a vacancy, but left to another district after waiting on HR for a month to be uh, actually hired. Um, so, you know, if this continues based on what was being proposed, I've been going to the bargaining table on the proposals that are there. We all know what will happen. We've heard several teachers already and other staff members say what will happen. And teachers are already leaving, let alone with the proposal. If it goes through, more will leave and nobody will come. So uh, I just ask that you please don't continue on the path that you're on, make some changes, uh, work with the, the unions and the bargaining table. And uh, again, please don't stay on the path you're on. Please wrap it up. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. 
Next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Ortiz. Do I have Ms. Ortiz? Oh, you're no. not on? Okay. Okay. Our next speaker is Terrence Gladney. Good evening, Mr. Gladney. Good evening. I have a lot to say, but I would rather uh, spend the rest of my minute uh, just so you guys can absorb the comments that have been made and actually listen. So I'm going to sit on mute. Okay. Our next speaker is. I think I'm, he wanted, I'm to, not, say, he yeah, wanted I'm, to stay I, on mute. I'm not yielding my time. Yeah, he's not oh, yielding his time. I'm I've sorry, got it on Mr. timer. Gladney. Thank you, Mr. Gladney. Thank you, Mr. Gladney. Next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dominique Chadwick. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. The disrespect I feel as an employee of the district is unbelievable. Never did I think that we would be met at the table with cuts, yet we thought we would be met at the table to at least discuss a, some sort of raise based on the skyrocketing price prices um, of living increase. We at transportation, when I first started, had 150 plus employees. Therefore, we were able to meet all of our needs. Now we sit with less than 80 employees with more than, more than most of our drivers doubling, if not tripling route. We have students being left at home or being returned to school over an hour, two hours late. We also have to come to make uncomfortable decisions like whether or not it even is, if it's affordable to come to work. Um, right now, I mean, based on the decisions that you guys have to make, it's how, Thank how you, could Chadwick, you even if you could please wrap it up. How could you guys even think that a cut would be something to discuss with the amount of money that Aguilar is bringing in every year? It's ridiculous. You guys got to do better. Thank you, Ms. Chadwick. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Walker. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Chris Walker, I am a parent of a student uh, who has uh, been educated through uh, the Sac City Unified School District and a current uh, student, another uh, child who is a student at uh, McClatchy. I'm here tonight to ask that you reconsider the ban of the SROs on campus. Uh, what you're hearing tonight uh, are significant issues. We have chaos going on on our campuses system-wide. The Hiram Johnson incident should be a, a, a pretty good indicator uh, of the need for SROs. We don't need to have teachers and students harmed because of fights that are going on. McClatchy, we had an incident where there was a gun threat last Friday, December 10th. There was no SRO on campus. My daughter's friend who got the information didn't know where to go. They ended up going to a gym teacher. This is ridiculous. This is unacceptable. You need to restore the contract with Sacramento Police Department immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Our next speaker is Juan Martinez. Go ahead, Mr. Martinez. Hello. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna make it quick, as fast as I can. I'm uh, I'm a parent. I'm here to speak and bring light to the hypocrisy of the district. You know, I want to know how can the district send letters to parents of, of absenteeism, you know, being absent uh, from school, but yet not have my son. But yet have my son missing his education on a regular basis by not having a permanent teacher or the substitute, not having a substitute. How can the board sleep at night knowing that this is happening? Maybe because it's not your child? How can this be allowed? The atrocities. I mean, it's just hypocrisy. 
When does the district want to take responsibility and accountability for this grave and dire situation? How can there be a reach agreement with the superintendent, Superintendent Agu Aguilar contract while it's in shambles with the staffing crisis and yet not having Thank you, Mr. Martinez. The other districts with the other bargaining units. Thank you. I hope Thank that, you. Thank I you. know it's not your kid, but this is serious. Come on, let's get it together, folks. Let's work together. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Martinez. We appreciate together. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marty Ortiz. Go ahead, Mr. Martiz. Ortiz. Ortiz, sorry. I don't see them online. Uh, I think, go ahead. I think, are you on mute? Unmuted. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Go My name ahead. is Mario Ortiz. I've been with the school district since 1986. I'm a lead mechanic in transportation. I'm also a recent retiree from the California Army National Guard, which I was a proud member serving for over 32 years. Uh, Mr. Aguilar has uh, received a pay increase. I also understand that he recently applied for another position at another district. As soldiers, we expect our leaders to lead by example and from the front. It's not all about me and my group of friends or cronies. Leaders must encompass everyone in their, every one of their subordinates all the way down to the lowest level. I find it disappointing that the leaders we put our trust in uh, here at the school district make me feel like, I, like they don't care about us or our families as much as they do themselves and their closest circle of friends. Our families are your students, at least mine were. As an army leader, soldiers care is the most important. I didn't eat until my soldiers had food and I didn't sleep until my soldiers had a place to bed down. Are my expectations too high for the district leadership? Have I Thank put you, too Mr. much Ortiz. trust in them to do the right thing? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Felton Calloway. He's not online. Okay. Our next speaker is Charmaine Brown. Go ahead, Ms. Brown. You're on mute. Hi, good evening. I was gifted time from two of my SEI sisters, Deborah Durazo and Christina Velasquez. Thank you, ladies. My name is Charmaine Brown, AKA Ms. Brown, and I'm the office manager at Oak Ridge Elementary the mom of two new tech alumni, and a brown and black woman raising a Mexican, Asian American, non-binary sophomore at West Campus. Me and my babies are at where we want to be, but why does my employer want to take the little that I earn for us? Whose debt is our livelihood paying for, and why is that okay? It's simply not. It's not okay to cut our salaries and benefits as district leadership brings in administration to navigate futures for those you've never met but are quick to be on camera and act as if you have. No disrespect, just keeping it real. It's not okay to not see us as your VIPs. It's not okay not to have a bus to take a learner to school. It's not okay to dump on and not build up the capacity of your doers. It's not okay to keep taking what's not yours, and I simply will not and cannot stand to empower you to think that it is. Please stop while you're ahead and make things right so we can educate, empathize, and pave pathways for young learners and families. Love on us like we love on our learners. Don't take away. Add, multiply, encourage, uplift, and support. Please, I beg of you, and so do my babies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank next you. Step. Our next speaker is Onithia Riley. Please unmute yourself. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. Yes. Um I only have a minute, so I'm not going to try to be cute and kiki with you all right now. Um, I don't know. I get the impression that maybe we need to strike. I need to remind you all that the CTA and the SEIU are unified. So if that's what we need to do to shut it down and to bring you all to a point of realization that we matter, that you can't just do to us what you feel like doing because you all are sitting in your privilege as I'm sitting here watching you all. You're unmoved. Maybe we need to do things in order to move you. 
If it needs to get like that, if it needs to be confrontational, sometimes confrontation brings about positive change. And I think that's where we're at at this point. Because y'all won't even sit down and have a conversation with us, with the union representatives like you should. And then you want to cut us a thousand times? No, absolutely not. Not when we are putting our lives at, at risk. Thank you. Please wrap it up. Oh, I'm done. Thank Hopefully you. you all are done too. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Veronica Baldars. Go ahead, Veronica. You have Veronica on. Okay, you're on mute, Veronica. Please unmute yourself. Okay. okay, please go back to Veronica. Okay, and our last one is Mary O'Toole. If she, I see her online, but it's either Mary or Veronica. Okay, Veronica, are you there? Okay, how about Mary O'Toole? Okay, Mary, if you can unmute yourself. Hi. Okay, it's Mary. I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Mary. It's really, it's just my first time doing this. So I just wanted to listen to what everyone else had to say. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Go ahead. And I appreciate all the voices of my colleagues, parents, teachers. Please listen to us. We are struggling. I can't say more than what everyone else has already said. So please listen and support us. That's all I can say right now. Thank you, Ms. O'Toole. Thank you so much. All right. And our last commenter is David Gonzalez. Go ahead, Mr. Gonzalez. You can please unmute yourself. Oh, we are unable to hear you, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay, can you oh, hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, hello, greetings. During the pandemic, the superintendent's unlawful behavior has made our district number one in California for the most labor law violations. And the school board chose to give him a raise instead of addressing the workers' vote of no confidence. They chose to care less about the people who are in direct contact with your children on a regular basis. Right now, the school board is actually going to give the superintendent another raise in this new contract they're approving. The district's behavior has led to the negligence of an education for hundreds of students. But they're more concerned about giving Aguilar another raise? Are we rewarding him for the most labor law violations? How about failing to plan for an independent study program? Is it for laying off over 22 credential teachers last year who happened to have the necessary credentials of currently vacant positions? Our students don't even have on-site nurses or counselors, but you're more concerned about giving George a raise? What if I fail the community? Will, I, will you give me a raise? Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. As the community, let's not allow this leadership or the lack thereof to furthermore demoralize and damage our students. Let's Thank you. vote no incumbent. Thank you. Um, I believe our last speaker is Nicole DeVore. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. DeVore. Hi, thank you. I am uh, um, I'm coming to speak about um, our lack of support for all of our newcomer students. I think it's absolutely appalling. Over a decade ago, we took away all of our support for our newcomer students, which were students that are new to the United States, who do not speak English, with less than a year, excuse me, or two years in the country. Um, we currently... Um, are having difficulty because we have many students of uh, a variety of backgrounds who do not get any um, additional support and they need more support. They can't just come into a fifth grade, fifth grade classroom and just jump right in. We don't have any after school programs. Uh, we don't have any additional services for them. And when the parents ask us, we have to sit there and tell them no. 
There's nothing else we can do. There are more Afghans coming from Afghanistan after what happened in August. They're starting to come. My you families have more. No, my families have gone and gotten more. We are continuing to not provide them with an education that is rightfully due to them. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. That is the last public comment for 7.0. Okay, thank you. Member Phillips, do you have your, your hand up? Okay, go ahead. Um, first, I, I, I want to say that I've heard the points of view from many of my constituents, and my constituents are um, anyone that's in the district. So I hear from a lot of folks on this. Um, I've heard the points of view, and I'm just curious right now, um, give you a little bit of my CV. I, and I'm, I wrote it down just to make sure. I have been a preschool teacher. I have been an instructional assistant an instructional, instructional, instructional aide, sorry. Um, I have been a foster parent. I am a parent. I have a bachelor's degree in child development. I have a master's degree in psychology. I have been a visitation supervisor, and now I'm a social worker. Um, what I'm seeing or what I'm hearing, the first comment that we heard tonight said everything that we needed to hear. Um, you know, I, I, I truly am frustrated with the voices that I'm hearing. These people are hurting. I am a frontline worker at, at CPS, and it is the same situation with higher-ups not necessarily listening to the needs of us. Our needs are something that are very important. We're not saying anything that is new. We're saying the same thing over and over again. Um, our, our scholars are, are not learning. They are not thriving. They are not as safe as we would like them to be in their learning environment. Mental health is a serious concern. Um, you know, in, in my line of work, I have calls that come in regarding persons at our schools who are struggling. And it's, you know, just like we heard, the kids are not okay. The parents are not okay. The teachers are not okay. Our classified staff is not okay. And it's really time that we listen. Um, I, I understand the, you know, the beef with the, the superintendent's salary. It's something that I have tried to understand for quite some time, or at least the last year. And it, it's frustrating to me. But um, if we believe the message that's coming from all of those people who had something to say tonight, um, we really have to be clear in our expl explanations to them. Um, I say this as a person with a learning disability. When it comes to explanations, I need them in English. So I am hoping that tonight we find our way to come to the level of where people are, meet folks where they are so that we can have a conversation about this. Um, I will say, though, because I'm flipping papers, SROs have um, no purpose in our schools, and we have to remember that when, and I, I know that their job is to protect and serve, but there are many populations that are just being policed by police. Um, it's really important that we consider that before we put cops back in the schools. Um, it's, it's just frustrating to me right now that People are asking for SROs to be put back in schools when we really should be um, focusing on the mental health of our students and of our staff. So I'm listening. I hear what everyone is saying. It is extremely important that we make some kind of shift, some paradigm shift that's going to have these people feel like they're heard. They don't feel it. Everyone tonight was, was pretty much upset and mad. And it wasn't a happy thing to hear folks this angry. So um, I, I, I think we're going to have to really not just hear them, but listen to what they have to say and act upon what they're saying. They're on the ground floor. They know what's happening. Um, it's, it's very important for us to, 
to accept what they're saying. Member Phillips. Yes. Some of the, the items that you're bringing up are out of order. So we just need to make sure that we bring this back up on a future agenda topic. So the SROs was another yeah. agenda tonight? It, it, no, no, not tonight. We'll bring them up on a few. We don't want to pull this meeting out of order. Okay. I made my point about the okay. SROs. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I need to say for now. Thank Thanks. All right. Item 8.0, Special Presentation 8.1, Resolution 3244, Recognition of National Special Education Day, December 2nd, 2021. Mr. Linares. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so for this resolution, I'm just going to share a little bit of background. Um, so December 2nd, we celebrate uh, National Special Education Day. Uh, December 2nd commemorates the anniversary of our nation's first federal special education law, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was uh, signed by President Ford on December 2nd in 1975. Um, the uh, Individuals with Dis Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, made public education available to all eligible children with disabilities across the nation. Uh, this law was a critical first step towards making education resources equitable for all students. And as our district continues to push for greater equity, address our significant disproportionality, uh, and work to establish a sustainable and effective uh, multi-tiered system of support, this resolution serves as a reminder of the work that still needs to be done, as well as a reminder that in order to do this work, we will need, need to continue to advocate for uh, more adequate funding at a federal and state level to support the valuable instructional programs of our students with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any public comment on this? Oh, we do actually, three, three public comments? Four public comments, okay. Nicole DeVore. No? Okay. Our next public commenter is Daniel Darby, and they have two minutes or one minute? Two minutes. Two minutes. Mr. Darby, are you there? Okay. Our next public commenter is Renee Webster Hawkins. Renee, let me see if she's online. Renee Webster Hawkins, she's online. Renee, are you on mute? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you, thank you for your patience. And dear President Pritchett, trustees and Superintendent Aguilar, I'm grateful that you're taking the occasion of National Special Education Day to recognize the importance of fulfilling the civil rights and meeting the educational needs of all of our students, including those with disabilities. As the resolution documents, we have over 7,000 students in our district. That's about one in six of our student body who have a disability that impacts a major life activity. I wish that after 45 years of the passage of the federal IDEA, we could be truly proud of the services that our students receive. But as you know, and as Mr. Linares acknowledged, but the resolution does not we have much more work to do here in this district. Work that this res resolution should acknowledge and set meaningful commitments to achieve. If this resolution is to have meaning, it should humbly acknowledge the findings and recommendations of numerous reports, lawsuits, and due process claims, all documenting the ways in which our students are not receiving a free and appropriate education. What it could do is to celebrate the significant ways in which this board and district leaders have begun to make true commitments to inclusion and high quality education for students with disabilities in adopting the 2021 LCAP. As you know, that document acknowledges that students with disabilities are general education students first, commits to MTSS and evidence-based supports, and a general education program, which through the principles of universal design will increase the access to 
and outcomes of all of our general ed classrooms for all students, as well as our special day classes. I'm disturbed by the amount of text in the resolution devoted to deficits of funding, especially when you have tranches of funds, some one time, some ongoing, that are intended to improve special education services and invest in the professional development for our teachers. I'm wishing that the resolution acknowledged that you were first using these funds to fully fund the activities in the LCAP that you approved. Thank you. Where is, thank you so much for considering these concerns. Thank you, Renee. Our next public commenter is Terrence Gladney. Go ahead, Mr. Gladney. Hello. Um, this is another resolution that, you know, again, in title and in language, it looks okay. But, you know, if we combine this with what we heard coming up, the closed session, there were four settlements around special education. So I hear the plea for additional funding, but how smart are we being with the dollars that we do have? How transparent are we being in these resolutions when we don't acknowledge the vast, wasteful amounts of money that we spend on litigation when we could initially provide the services to which students are entitled? There, there's no acknowledgement of the failures we've had for these schools, but we, again, we just deflect the blame on we just don't have enough dollars, right? If a student doesn't have enough time to do their homework because they have you know, band practice or a basketball or football game, or they have family engagements, teachers in our system says, make it work. We have the amount of dollars that we have, but we're making it work by forcing families to go through litigation until we do the right thing. That's what SCUSD is, you know, doing things when forced to. It's not kids first, it's litigation first. It's, you know, let's do what we're told to do when we're forced to do it. Let's twist the language and the intent of law. The law says to, you know, we, we, we redirect students and families to least expensive or least costly solutions that don't fit the needs of those students. How truly committed are we really to college and career readiness for all of our students? Thank you, Mr. Gladney. Thank you. That was the last public comment. Oh, we have one more. Okay, go ahead. Hello, thank you for acknowledging my my hand. Um, I'm Ingrid Hutchins, and I just wanted to speak up on this just for a quick second and use this as an opportunity to re remind the board and to remind the district that we have numerous special ed students who are not able to access independent studies, although the law says they should because they're awaiting the IEPs. Um, I think there's close to 100 right now that are sitting in a pile just waiting to, to be um, taken care of and acknowledged. And so this would be a wonderful time to make this resolution into something meaningful and make sure those kids actually get in with a teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hutchins. Is that the last comment? I, I believe Animal Lander has a public comment. Do you have Animal Lander online, Vincent? Okay, go ahead, Anna. She, you are on mute. Anna, are you there? You are on mute. Okay, we don't. Right. We don't have her on. Okay. Thank you. That was the last comment. Okay. Do we have any board comments on this agenda topic, Member Morawski? Thank you. Real quickly. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to um, Ms. Webster Hawkins for, for your eloquence and advocacy and, uh, and calling out um, many of the, the items that we, that we um, maybe should be talking about when it comes to special ed. Um, but just, you know, this is not the first resolution. It won't be the last. It's not the first programmatic item on special ed. It won't be the last. So um, just wanted to recognize that, yes, we do have a long way to go. I do think it's worth you know, taking a moment to celebrate that we have made great strides since IDEA was passed. Um, we're nowhere near done. Um, but the one thing this resolution does is call out the funding for IDEA specifically um, and full funding for IDEA at the federal level is, is worth calling out and worth advocating for. And um, that's just what this resolution does specifically. So on that basis, I'm happy to move it at the appropriate time. Thank you. Perfect. I have a motion. Do I have a second? All right. Uh, Ms. Collin, do you mind taking roll for me?
Aye. 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 Oh, I. <laughs> I'm sorry. Student preferential vote. I promise I won't forget again. <laughs> All right. A resolution passes. Thank you. Item 8.2, update on mandatory COVID-19 vaccine for eligible non-exempt students and staff. Mr. Lyons, Ms. Flores, and Mr. Bozio. Uh, good evening. I'm Victoria Flores. I serve as your Director of Student Support and Health Services. Um, and uh, or, sorry, <laughs> I meant to say good evening, Board President Bridget, Superintendent, <laughs> and members of the board. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, I have with me here tonight um, Chief Information Officer Lyons, um, uh, Chief HR Officer Conti McCarn, and our Community Engagement Manor, uh, Manager uh, Nikki Kangas. Next slide, please. Um, so just a brief summary of the mandate that we passed and that we've been working so hard to implement. Remember, all students 12 and over um, have some choices here. They're either fully vaccinated or they can file for an exemption and register for COVID testing. Right now, we are really trying to focus um, on COVID uh, registration for COVID testing for all of our non-compliant students or even students that are in that um, vaccine series dose. So if they've got one dose, we still would like to get them registered registered until they're fully vaccinated. And then we can continue to work with our families on pursuing those exemptions or potentially vaccine red, uh, records. Same really for our five to 11 year olds, right? We, we passed a board resolution. I'm really focused on the safety for this age group because they weren't yet eligible for vaccine. So we said we really want our students to engage in testing. So they all need to be registered for COVID testing or they now of course have that option to um, seek vaccination. Um, and so we are asking for those records. They are not required to submit an exemption at this time. We have not you know, required that yet. And so again, that focus on registration for all non-vaccinated students. Next slide, please. Some quick updates. There's been a lot going on in our world with the pandemic as there has been for the last two years. Um, we do see our case counts starting to creep up. We, we kind of anticipated this after Thanksgiving, 14.1 um, new cases per 100,000 residents. Um, it's continuing to eke up. We did meet with the county today, Sac County Public Health. They said it's kind of starting to hold steady, um, but we know we're going into more holiday gatherings. Some really Really good news, our 16 to 17 year olds were approved for the Pfizer booster dose. They can actively seek booster. Um, we are advising that they seek a walk-in clinic at this time. Uh, the My Turn website wasn't quite ready <laughs> for um, students to register, um, but we are able to serve them. We encourage our students, our children of this age in our county to go seek booster uh, as long as they're six months past that second dose. Um, and then, of course, we've all been paying lots of attention uh, to Omicron, uh, this new variant that's been detected pretty much everywhere in the world and has now been detected here in Sacramento County. Today, we learned that one of our neighboring districts in Yolo County, Washington Unified School District, is experiencing what they're deeming an outbreak in one of their classrooms. And so our hearts go out you know, to that district and all of those impacted students. Um, one of the things I really appreciated that the public health officer in Yolo County said, um, I think Dr. Sisson is how you say their name is, um, they, we already knew Omicron was here um, in the community and our schools are a reflection of our community. Um, so I just think we all need to prepare our hearts and minds for seeing this you know, likely parallel in Sacramento County, but we are gonna double down on all of those mitigation measures. We've been through Delta and you know, we, we feel pretty confident, you know, we will do everything we can as we learn more about Omicron. We also learned that um, CDPH did reissue that statewide masking mandate, but I just want to reiterate, it doesn't change anything for us here in Sacramento County. We were already under that indoor masking mandate, and we reconfirmed with Sacramento County Public Health, we are good. All of the current guidance around masking still stays the same. 
We also heard a lot of news this week about different, you know, California school districts and their vaccine mandates. Um, we heard that Oakland Unified, you know, looking at their submission rates did bump back their timeline. So they had an initial or their final deadline was January 1st. They've now bumped that back to January 31st. And then probably one of the bigger news, um, LA Unified School District did, you know, vote to bump back their timeline as well to the fall of 2022. Um, they got really far. They also have different um, vaccine mandates than we do here at Sac City. And so we are still plugging ahead. I'm really helping our families understand that they do have options in our district to either vaccinate or participate in testing. Next slide, please. So I always like to ground us in why we did this. Why did we take this, you know, board action and really work so hard around vaccination and testing? This is really about keeping our students safe, our staff safe, our community safe. Um, and so as we reflect on our COVID cases in our district, you can see from August to now, we've had 975 cases that were physically present at work or school. 74 of those cases are currently actively impacted by COVID, you know, at home isolating. And if you can see this little box that talks about total cases by month, it's those orange bars. You'll see when we started school in September, we were in the height of Delta. We had lots of cases, but every month what you're seeing is this successive decline. Now we don't know what this new variant will bring, but as we test and we contact trace and we get better at our mitigation measures, we're able to catch these cases and slow that spread. We are though, as I come over here to the right, um, seeing this, this impact to our youngest students. So our TK through fifth graders now represent 46% of all of our positive cases, keeps ticking up about one percentage point each time I bring this data point to you. This is why we feel so passionately about vaccination or testing to protect our youngest students. 39% of our positive cases are in that sixth to 12th grade range. And then 15% uh, uh, our cases are with staff. That number is actually going down, which is, uh, you know, we believe a, a positive trend. Next slide, please. And so as we look at our positive cases, we also want to reflect on our vaccination rates here in our, our county and nationwide. So nationally, 61% of children 12 to 17 are vaccinated. That's still not where we want to see that number. We hope for, to have it much higher for that age range. Um, the heartening number, I believe, is 18% of 5 to 11-year-olds uh, nationwide are, are at least partially vaccinated. And what I want to draw your eye to is this is a place where Sacramento County is actually outperforming the national uh, the national stat there. 20.4% of our 5 to 11 year olds have gotten at least one dose. And I know I've had the privilege of watching families and kiddos come in for that second dose in these last couple of weeks. And it's really, really sweet. Um, 12, in our 12 to 17 population, we have 58.4. That number is moving really slowly, but it does continue to inch. Um, and we hope that as we are able to talk with our families and answer their questions, we'll continue to see that number go up. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Lyons, who's going to walk you through our local district data. Oh, good evening, I'm Bob Lyons. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the district. And uh, this slide is a screenshot of our student COVID vaccination dashboard that's published on the district website. Uh, this data has been verified by our health services department for ages 12 plus um, as of this morning and entered in our uh, student information system independent campus. As you can see, about 46% of our students 12 and older have reported full or parcel uh, vaccinations. One and a half percent have filed for an exemption and about 52% have not submitted information. Um, and it's very hard to see, but the pie chart lists the actual numbers associated with the percentages displayed in this chart. Uh, this dashboard does not reflect about 1,500 students submissions that are in the queue uh, being processed by the health services team. This represents about 6% of the unreported total. So we do have uh, submissions being turned in in big numbers now. 
So we are also requesting that parents to uh, please submit their student forms and records, whether vaccinated or filing an exemption. Uh, the website dashboard defaults to the 12 plus age group. Now looking for the whole district, if you on the far right side under uh, under age group, there's a little eraser button that will pop up when you hover over it. If you click that eraser button, it will default to the whole district, so ages uh, five and older. And uh, the last data, uh, last update is listed next to the reset button. So this was just updated. This was just updated this morning. So uh, the dashboard is updated daily when school is in session. Uh, this dashboard is important because it will help us understand. Uh, compliance rates across the district by school, and it informs us where additional efforts are needed. Next slide, please. This slide is a screenshot of our enrollment reason by status of approximately uh, 18,000 student uh, respondents as of noon today. This table indicates any planned student movement as a result of the vaccine mandate and allows us to predict any budget concerns. So if you look at uh, rows one and two, uh, it's about 99% of in-person and independent study students will not change their enrollment. They'll just stay where they're at. Row three indicates about four-tenths of 1% or 89 students will move from independent study to in-person. And the next row, uh, you'll see that uh, moving from 87 students will move from um, independent study to uh, or from uh, in-person to independent study. So those are a wash. Now, uh, rows five and six indicate that less than two-tenths of 1% or about uh, 34 students will move, uh, will move out of the district and disenroll. Now, just as a reminder, this is just survey data only. And when parents submit this, they are not uh, committed to these submissions. So this is just um, anecdotal data from this survey. Next slide, please. This slide is our staff vaccination dashboard and indicates vaccinated and unvaccinated staff and those filing for an exemption as of Monday morning. We just recently had the update. We didn't have time to update the dashboard, but the current data is very close to what these numbers are right now. At this point, about 76% of staff reported being partially or fully vaccinated and about 22% have not submitted vaccination information. About 2% of staff have filed for an exemption. Now, this dashboard does not reflect uh, about 180 submissions that are being processed right now by the health services team. And uh, that represents about 16% of our uh, unvaccinated staff. As a student dashboard, uh, or as in the student dashboard, the bar chart lists the actual numbers associated with the percentages um, in the chart. Now, they're very hard to see in this slide. Uh, but they're from your uh, computer, you'd be able to see these. The staff dashboard is updated twice a week just because of the time it takes to, to update this dashboard. Next up, Victoria is up again. Actually, I think I'll step in to try to help with this one really quickly. The dashboard that you just saw around employees is gonna help allow us to predict anticipated staffing concerns. So we've reached out, as you can see, with 75.84% fully, percent fully vaccinated. We still do have some way to go and some needs. So we have sent emails to work and home addresses. We have sent postcards. We have made phone calls, trying to make sure that employees have awareness of the requirements, trying to ensure that if help is needed, that they have access to sessions that we are holding one each week. Um, some of them taking place at departments, such as at transportation or at nutrition, to help with things like they have their documentation, they're just not sure where it goes, where to upload, what that process looks like. So we provide individual assistance in that way. Some have questions about exemptions. What are the options? And so we talk through that. We work with our risk management team who are helping to fund, um, sorry, helping to staff those sessions so that employees can have their questions answered and have the additional assistance that they need with their documentation. So with about um, a thousand staff non-responsive yet, 
to these outreaches, we're going to continue to hold sessions, which have been fairly well attended, even more so when we have them at the departments. So through January, we will see continued sessions taking place, one each week, where people can come, get questions answered, um, have actual help. We have laptops ready to go and helping them input the data. What we expect when we, as we continue with the outreach, we do see increases in the, um, in the response rates. So we will continue to do that and continue to be there as long as we can to help people access the information they need. And with that, I will turn it over to Nikki. Good evening, everyone. I would like to provide a quick overview on our communication strategy to make sure that we're reaching every family in our district during this timeline. So this is a quick overview slide of just how district-wide we've been using every tool at our disposal to inform families and staff of the vaccination requirement and how they can be in compliance. At this point, as the deadline is approaching, we have brought in our school site leaders to help um, engage in, in the communications and outreach if you go to the next slide, we know that our principals and our school staffs um, have the most relational connections with our families. So on December 6th, we hosted a meeting um, to walk them through how they could help uh, with the vaccination requirement outreach. We've provided them with scripts, resources, um, but basically making sure that every school had enough of the forms in multiple languages that they could be backpacking home. We've provided PowerPoints that they can host their own um, virtual meetings with their families, uh, provided a tutorial video that shows them exactly where to find and how to submit those records. And those can be found um, on the SUSD YouTube channel as well for anybody who uh, is struggling and needs to know where to look. Um, and we've shown them how to pull compliancy reports through Infinite Campus so that they're able to target those students who have not yet reported their status. Um, and we're hoping that they can also help conduct home visits to make sure that we're reaching everyone and getting those reporting um, documentation in on time. Next slide. In addition, we've also engaged our board members to thank you board members to participate in a video shoot, which we did today with a we're unified against COVID in Sacramento message. So we are creating this video and asking them to share it with their networks as well in an effort to amplify this message and share how this affects not just our students and staff, but our entire community. Next slide. In addition, um, following winter break, we will be sending families confirmation that they are in compliance, uh, also notifying non-compliant families that they may be moved to independent study if they do not report their vaccination or consent to testing. And we will continue to ask our school sites to pull those weekly non-compliance reports to perform multi-tiered uh, targeted outreach to our families and get as many of our students to report their status as possible. Next slide. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Victoria. Thank you so much, Nikki. Next slide, please. As I'm gonna take you through some of the kind of operational logistics around vaccine and surveillance testing. I know there were quite a number of questions. So we're doing lots of vaccination clinics multiple times a week today. We actually hosted a clinic uh, at Pacific Elementary. So that number that says 63 vaccine clinics today is actually now 64. Um, we've provided over 26,000 vaccinations to our community. Um, and I am really excited to report that we are now officially a COVID-19 vaccine provider. And um, we're submitting our first, um, uh, um, Gosh, order. <laughs> Sorry, I can't find my word. Submitting our first order that last week in December, and we will be hosting our very own uh, vaccine clinic resuming on the Fridays, uh, how we used to host Friday evening from 4 to 7 p.m. We are very deliberate with that time and that day so that if our families do want to bring their students or our staff or themselves, they have the weekend to rest and recover should they, you know, have any um, um, of those kind of side effects, usually kind of 
tired. You can see a host of vaccine clinics out at school sites as well as CERNA Center and lots more in the works. We post them all on our website. Um, and I just want to say, all of our clinics, our standard is first, second dose, booster, five and older. We want to be able to serve everyone. And they're not just for um, our students or, you know, Sac City families. They really are open to our whole community um, because the healthier we have our community, the healthier our schools are. Next slide, please. Also, just another plug for all of the free COVID testing that we are doing. Our school site care rooms will remain open. I know I've gotten some of these questions, like, will we still have our health aids? Yes, we still want to be able to provide that responsive COVID testing, particularly if somebody becomes sick during the day. We are also launching our school site surveillance testing days on top of the health aid programs. So they will run concurrently. And then our regional testing centers are slowly starting to expand. We're still here at CERNA Monday through Friday, 12 to 3.30. You likely see some of our <laughs> equipment down there in your boardroom. Um, and I'm really excited to say we were able to open and launch uh, another regional testing center at Albert Einstein Middle School Monday through Friday. It's actually from 6 to 3 or 3 to 6.30. I forgot the 30 on the end there. Um, and we were intentional in opening that one first because there's quite a testing desert. There's not a whole lot of resources out on that end of our, our um, district. And we will be opening them regionally throughout our district in January. We're really focused right now on getting our surveillance testing up and running. Next slide, please. So I know last board meeting, we had a lot of public comment and some board comment. I'm wondering how we're going to be doing this regular routine surveillance testing. So just a reminder, all individuals not fully vaccinated, whether you're staff or student, will need to participate. And our cadence right now, remember in, in the board resolution, was going to be based on public health guidance and current case rates. So given where we're sitting with a 14.1 case rate, our testing will be required on a weekly basis. And we will likely be updating the board should that shift in the future. Um, the testing type that we're really going to be focusing on is using that rapid antigen test. Um, it provides results within 30 minutes, which really allows our schools to quickly identify positive cases and respond accordingly. Contact trace, you know, get folks home and, and take all those actions that we need. Of course, like we saw early in the fall, we had this rapid antigen shortage. So should that happen, we are able to pivot quickly and do PCR testing as well. Our schedule is posted on our website, um, and so our surveillance testing teams will be rotating to school sites on specific days to conduct that surveillance testing. So all of this information, including our schedule of when each site is, is um, scheduled, is posted on our website now at susd.edu backslash COVID-19-testing. So we invite uh, individuals to go and see if their school is scheduled. It will be on there um, by day of the week. Um, and we just added four more schools and we're working to get that up on the website. Lastly, we'll be bringing on our comprehensive high schools here in January and everyone will be starting surveillance testing well ahead of that January 31st deadline. Um, I will say this has been a huge logistical lift, um, really looking at the numbers now that we have some really good reports and data, thanks to our tech services team, we can look at a report and see how many students are required to test and how many students are consented to test. And that's the report we'll be pulling every day of the week that that surveillance testing team is there. So you can imagine there's a lot of math behind that. I'm trying to calculate how the number of students with the number of testers we need. And if any of you have ever watched like a vision screening or hearing, you know, hearing and vision or even picture day, think of it like that. You've got someone checking students in, a couple of different testing stations, uh, funneling students through and getting them right back into class. We know that, you know, we're pulling away from learning time no matter what, you know, class you're in. And so we're really working to be efficient and effective while also scheduling around recess and lunch and snack time and fire drills <laughs> and all the stuff that happens at school sites. Um, it has been an interesting ride. Um, I will say um, 
when we're looking at this data so far and we just have this report functionality, um, so far we have 17,352 students that are required to test and consented to test. We actually were really, really pleased to see this number because we hadn't even really built that functionality to reach out and notify our families. And then we know we've got 13,471 students to date that are required to test and are not yet consented. I'll just share that when I ran that number yesterday to today, it had already dropped by a thousand. So our sites are doing a great job getting that message out and getting our families to register for testing. Um, and I just wanted to share with the board and our community um, that we started scheduling our surveillance testing um, and providing this testing well ahead of our timeline because we wanted to make sure that we were ready, that we had all of those kinks worked out and that we could calculate our staffing correctly. So this was very targeted and intentional. We have figured out now we need about 10 more testers to really um, effectively and efficiently um, have some cushion for call outs, for other you know, testers being quarantined, just sort of the normal things that happen with staffing. So we're looking at about 65 uh, staff members who are serving in our district doing testing on a daily basis. Um, I will say if you ever get a chance to see them, they're largely young people who come from our community. Some of them are our graduates. Um, and I just feel really honored to be a part of their workforce development um, and their ethic of serving our community and keeping our community safe. They have the biggest hearts. They are literally on the front line of this pandemic, caring for our community and our children and our staff. And so if you get a chance, say, hey, <laughs> next slide, please. So as we shift from vaccine and testing, we also wanted to come back to that consideration on a timeline for uh, students ages five to 11. And um, we did, like we had shared, convene some of our local health experts um, from various you know, health organizations and got together to just have a discussion. Of course, they somewhat have to be careful about representing their agencies, um, but they were really open uh, with their time and their thoughts and their research. And they all agreed there are no concerns about the emergency use authorization of vaccine for 5 to 11. They support vaccination. They strongly encourage our families to get their children vaccinated. The vaccine has a really strong safety profile. Uh, at the time we met, about 21% of our um, children had received that first dose. And you know, from the trials, we saw very similar effects um, like we did in 12 to 15. When we started to talk about that reasonable timeline, it's very different than kind of the hard science, right? And they really shared the hard science is good. But when you start talking about timeline and parents and, you know, this is their precious baby, their child, um, you really start to get into these bioethical concerns and really ensuring that parents feel comfortable and have enough time to consult with their provider. So they were, they were pretty uh, vocal about that. They did agree two months seemed a little too short, you know, when, you know pushing that, that a little too hard um, and also kind of reminded us that we had limited data on those second doses. So we're just now seeing that first wave of students that got vaccinated getting those second doses. Um, so that's something for us to hold. The other considerations we're thinking about, we did check in none of the other large urban uh, districts or even not large. Um, no one else is, is um, you know, looking at establishing a timeline for students five to 11. Um, I think, you know, there's such the focus on the current population. We definitely need to consider our operational capacity to implement. We are still partway through our own implementation We've learned a lot um, and we still have a whole lot more to learn as we have this another month and a half. Um, and then we also want to continue to assess the impact of Omicron um, and kind of, you know, seeing what data comes um, from that. We know it's still pretty early um, in, in the, you know, science around this new variant. Next slide, please. So we really did kind of ground ourselves and okay, well, you know, what are we doing currently? And currently, you know, the way that we have, you know, designed this uh, resolution again was to really provide that, that protection for our youngest students. And so they do either need to be fully vaccinated 
or consent to COVID testing. And we really realized that is a really strong safety net for our youngest students, either ensuring vaccination or testing, as well as all those other layered mitigation measures that they're really good at, by the way. They're very good rule followers. Um, you know, and they will remind you about your mask and all those other things. Um, so, so, you know, we're, we're kind of grounded in what we're doing right now. We will continue to convene and consult with our local medical um, experts uh, moving forward here into January 2022, particularly as we learn more about some of these new variants and impacts um, in our schools. Next slide, please. So next steps, I think you heard our data entry will continue over winter break. A few of us are you know, gonna be checking in with our team still. Um, we will continue to process all those submissions and look at that data that Chief Lyons showed us. Um, and then, you know, as, um, as Nikki shared, you know, really looking at that targeted reminders and outreach uh, to the families that were not quite connecting, really encouraging, you know, that they receive or submit that documentation by that June 14th day so that we can help them understand what their next choices are. I um, mean, I'm sure we'll be coming back to the board with all of those updates. Uh, last slide here, almost done. Just wanted to take a moment to do a, a little shout out to the California Department of Public Health. Um, they reached out, um, it was kind of last minute, um, but offered to school districts to provide free take home test kits to families or to our students and to our staff. And so we were able to get these um, supplies are somewhat limited. We didn't quite get you know, all that we had ordered, but I think about 95%. Each um, kit comes with two tests in it. Um, and it it does require you to be registered for COVID testing in our district through that primary health link. So we want our families to know, please make sure you're registered by December 29th. And what will happen is we will send you a specific link, um, whether it's on your cell phone, if that's what you prefer, or email. I know when my children test, I get both. Um, and you're going to click on that link and follow uh, how to report your at-home results. Um, some have already gone out on Wednesday, largely they're going to be going out today uh, if they hadn't already and Friday. They should also be coming with this flyer that walks our families how um, through how you know to what to do the timeline um, and a couple of links. There's a link on there for translated versions as well as a QR code that you can watch a video about how to conduct the test. Um, and it, as as we're learning where extra kits are available, we are working to redistribute those. This is a screenshot of what the little test kit looks like. Um, that control line will pop up. You always want to have that control line that tells you your test is working. And then that T line, if that T line is it comes up, that means that you are positive for COVID. And so we are um, providing our families with, um, you know, the reminder to please report to their school site or their supervisor and that COVID report at susd.edu. It's a really important time to remind everyone if you are sick, please stay home. As painful as, as that is for me to say when we work so hard on positive attendance, this is just a time we do need to be mindful. Stay home, get tested, um, and, and reach out and let us know. So we hope that this is a good resource. This is a pilot project that CDPH is, is doing, and we will see what the impact of this is and how we might be able to use this resource in the future. And with that, we are wrapped up. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we have um, one public comment. Yes, uh, Daniel Darby. I don't see Daniel's him. not online. So, okay, that's it. Um, I'll open it up for a board comment. Member Morowski. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll be, be very quick. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the staff who presented. Um, thank you for all the work that's gone into operationalizing this mandate. I'm really, really happy to see the CDPH um, doing the at-home test. I think it's just a really tangible, easy thing that our, our parents and uh, our students can do. And I'm um, just really, I think it's awesome. Um, Congratulations on becoming a vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine provider. That was a huge step and just really, really happy to, to see that. Um, excited to, to come out to one of the clinics. Um, I, I guess a, a word on 
some of our communication um, about the the vaccine mandate. I do want to also make sure that you know, as we're focused on kind of compliance and what folks have to do, that we that we really also transmit the message of you know the the why you know of <laughs> of why we really need to do this to protect each other. Um, so just you know, want to kind of put that out there. Um, and I think that's um, oh the one I mean the one other thing I wanted to also come back to the issue of um, making the vaccine mandatory the vaccine um, mandatory for five to eleven. Um, this is a really tough one for me. I'm I'm very strongly in support of making it mandatory. Um, I that said I I respect um, your recommendation as staff and. I don't want to undermine that. I know you know you've you've raised a lot of um, a lot of reasonable considerations, but if if we are not moving forward with a mandate for this age group in, in you know immediately, I would like to see us do all we can to strongly, strongly, in the strongest terms possible, encourage our families to to get their children vaccinated and spread that message about the safety of it and um, just do do all we can. I'm, I'm very, very anxious about Omicron and the transmissibility and just the impact that's going to have on our schools um, and our kids learning. January and February is looking, um, you know, like the experts are saying, it's going to be very, um, it's going to be a lot of spread. And so I'm just worried about, you know, pretty severe impacts. And we just have to do all we can to transmit that message that every 16, 17 year old needs to get boosted to stay in school. And every every five to 11 year old who can like really, really, really should get vaccinated. So um, thank you so much for uh, for your hard work on on this. Thank you, Member Morowski, Member Rhodes. Thank you. Um, once again, kind of echoing uh, Member Morosky, I, I think that the, the I love this pilot uh, that we have going on for the winter break take home test for uh, our our students and families. Um, it's a, it's amazing, especially going into the break and um, you know not having the school sites uh, available uh, for testing um, like like you like we usually do. Um, now families can uh, do that right at home. And, and I'm looking forward to the data that comes back around how that uh, impacted um, our, our students and families. Um, and then also I had a question and, and you might have said it, but I just wanted to get clarity on page seven. When was the, uh, when was this survey given out? Was this the, is that, when's the most recent surveys? Like what date was this giving out? On, on page seven, in, uh, enrollment reasons by yeah. um, member Rhodes. Um, let me um, just clarify. Um, it's the idea is that when uh, a parent completes the upload process, this is one of the questions that is it's asked. Ongoing. So it's not gotcha. it's not a survey that's conducted across the system. It's um, more of an individualized survey, if you will as right. part of the upload process. And in that regard, uh, where a parent may have um, completed the, 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 the form uh, several months ago, it may no longer accurately reflect their thoughts today. Um, okay, uh, thank so, you. So it's not a district-wide survey, if you will. It, it's what families have to, up, uh, have to include as part of the upload process. Okay, great. So, so yeah, I, we were looking at you know, um, at our, our independent study numbers. And that was a great explanation because um, I was wondering, does that independent study numbers remain the same due to uh, the new variant and people's uh, apprehension uh, of that? Um, and then how does that look uh, for people's possible apprehension um, for them wanting to uh, be an independent study? Um, and how are we hedging for that? Um, but thank you for your explanation, uh, Superintendent. Uh, also had another question here, and I got to find it for you real quick. Um, oh, I, I'm rough top of my head. So 
is there a breakdown? Mr. Uh, I mean, Bob had it. Uh, he had a, a, a little list of, you know, where we're at. But I want to know how, what, are the, what is the breakdown of uh, students who are vaccinated uh, by trustee area? And then also by uh, trustee area broadly of, of our uh, impacts uh, of COVID and what are we seeing of, of the um, COVID infection rates uh, and comparatively to the vaccination rates? Um, and then, um, and how, do we, how are we hedging uh, to put even more focus um, on those communities uh, that might have higher infection rates? Uh, because that's gonna impact our system. Um, and if we were to guesstimate, uh, a lot of, uh, we have higher rates in under-resourced um, neighborhoods. Um, and so it, it would be very detrimental uh, if we were to have some kind of surge and then under-resourced neighborhoods and schools uh, end up being impacted by that. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about that and, and possibly plans uh, that we are thinking about. Why don't I ask uh, Ms. Flores, um, because uh, part of these efforts, for example, the test kits that are being sent home, um, it is being done with that lens in mind of which schools um, uh, do we think that students would benefit the most from taking home those uh, test kits, as well as how we identify uh, the vaccination clinics and the areas in which we operate those. And then on the question of the dashboard, um, the public facing dashboard that is available to our community does allow everyone to do some data disaggregation mm -hmm. by school, by trustee area, uh, by a number of other factors. Um, and the other uh, last comment that I would make is because we are uh, very carefully monitoring uh, uh, the Omicron variant, uh, we are in the process of developing a multiple uh, 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 data point dashboard uh, that might allow us to analyze uh, 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 several data points that are critical for us to continue monitoring uh, vaccination rates by zip code, positivity rates by zip code, um, uh, uh, number of, of students and staff that have been quarantined. Um, so trying to figure out how can all of those uh, data points uh, inform us of, of places where we need to intervene and provide additional resources in order to uh, continue to operate and serve our students through in-person instruction, which uh, to Member Murawski's point, I think uh, it's critical that we continue to focus from a communication standpoint on, on why this is so critical for us and, 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 and certainly continuing to be able to operate our schools and keep them open is, 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 is a primary mission for us. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, once again, and, and back to uh, staff um, and, and the general team here at the district, we um, have done some amazing work when it comes to um, vaccinations, um, testing, uh, one of the leaders in the region uh, with this work around COVID. Um, and obviously it's at the top of our minds um, and it's something that's uh, very important to our communities, um, how we really um, give back and make sure that our, our students, our staff, uh, principals are supported. One of the ways is to make sure that we kind of tackle this issue because COVID has been um, one of the main detriments uh, to um, educational success outside indicators and in school, uh, in the school day. And so um, I personally, have a uh, very, very disdain for COVID-19. Um, and and uh, whatever we can do uh, to continue pushing forward uh, to, to really, and to have our communities at the forefront of this work um, is, I'm all behind it. So thank you guys for what you guys have been doing. Um, and um, let, let's, let's get this thing under control. And, and Trustee Rhodes, I did just want to share um, many of the vaccine clinics are targeted using not just zip code data, but census track data, which is even more targeted. And so you've seen, you know, clinics at 
around New Joseph Bonheim and out in the South area, you know, you'll see those schools that are listed, Ethel I. Baker, Pacific, you know, very targeted um, for where we've maybe been missing little pockets. Um, and we will continue to do that work. I know the South area right now is experiencing an uptick in COVID cases. We're feeling it and seeing it in our schools. And so that will likely be our next regional testing center um, stood up as well. So thank you for, you know, all of the board members for supporting these efforts and um, you know bringing your community ties and your thoughts for how we can be more targeted and intentional, um, especially around working with our community partners as well. Okay, thank you, Member Phillips. Just to um, build on what Trustee Rhodes was saying, we're doing testing in our comprehensive high schools, but are we doing anything in our not so comprehensive high schools, like our continuation schools? I'm just curious about, um, I guess, Area 7 and specifically what's going on in terms of testing at schools there. So every single school site has access to a health aid um, that should be staffed on site. So a school like American Legion um, does have a health aid assigned and they will all, every single school site, um, have a surveillance testing day scheduled to them where a team comes out on that specific day, as well as then that access to the daily COVID testing should they need it. If, if you know, anyone becomes symptomatic or oftentimes we learn in the middle of the day that we've been exposed to COVID. Um, you get that text or that phone call where your stomach drops, uh, you know, and, and so yes, we do want to make sure. And if, if you're hearing of any concerns or issues, please let us know. This even extends to adult education and, and our preschool programs as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. I just I wanted to take a moment and thank you for um, the work that's being done and um, also recognizing that um, the Far East area is kind of off on a little island by themselves. So thank you for putting a clinic out in that area. Um, I do just have one question for Victoria. Um, have you heard of any um, uh, considerations of doing uh, COVID-19 rapid tests prior to vaccination or boosters to make sure that they're not COVID positive and, um, and maybe just asymptomatic? You know, we have seen some clinics that have partnered that, like providing testing and vaccination at the same time. Um, we haven't totally done that here, but I will say, you know, with this new variant and, and new, you know, considerations, um, that's definitely something we could do. I mean, we have capacity to do, um, you know, out at our school site, hosted clinics, or even here. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I think it's a safe thing to do. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Well, not seeing any other board comment. This is an informational item. And we'll be I'm sure we'll be talking about this. <laughs> Thank you, staff. I appreciate it. All right. Item 8.3, trustee area redistricting full demographic presentation with map options. Mr. Reynolds. Good evening. We do have a. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, we have a really short presentation this evening. Uh, we just wanted to update you on the status of the trustee boundary study. Uh, our, our first next slide here basically talks about the work that's happened since we last met. On November 30th and December 6th and December 8th, we had community meetings and we received public input. We presented all the map options and we, did have uh, several questions come up. Uh, some of the questions were not really necessarily on topic. They were maybe more concerned about school boundaries, school attendance patterns and things like that. But we did have a few comments on the maps and trying to understand what the real impact of these boundary adjustments are going to be. And so we were able to explain how it adjusts the voting areas for each of the trustees. And so really the net impact is it would impact which position you could run for if you choose to run for the board and it impacts who shows up on your ballot on election day. And in terms of 
actual any proposed new maps. We have not seen anything uh, come about in, on that topic. There was a comment about what is the population in each high school boundary, uh, because why can't we just use the high school boundaries as our trustee areas? So I do have a new slide that shows that information. So if we go to the next page, I showed the 2020 census population. This is again, the total population for each of the five high school attendance areas. Now, of course you do have seven trustees. And so we can't, even if these high school populations were balanced, right there with only five high school areas, uh, we can't have an equal balance for seven trustees. And our, again, as a reminder, our ideal population for each trustee is 50,672. So we can see that actually none of the high school boundaries themselves would be a valid trustee area individually uh, because there's too much variance between their populations and a trustee population. So again, we were able to do these calculations based on the comments that were received. and. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is just a reminder of the maps. And it's, again, this is our close up view showing you which areas are changing. And so if you have any questions on the maps, they're here for your review again. This is map A, the next one shows map B. And again, a lot of the differences are just in that Northern area on how area two can reduce its population. And then map C is the next one. And so we had a, again, a change in that Northern area between areas two and th seven, and then between areas four and seven in the South area on this one. And then our next slide, again, just talks about the next steps. We have until February to make a final decision and uh, so again, here it's just, again, for information only. And again, any additional input you wanna provide me, we can do any additional calculations and research for you. And that's our presentation for tonight. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Reynolds. Um, I believe we have uh, two public comments. We have three public comments. Three public comments, okay. The first one is Daniel Darby, but I do not see him online. Okay. The second one is Rich Vasquez, but I do not see him online. And so the final commenter is Terrence Gladney. Okay, go ahead, Terrence. Hello again. Um, I think that the maps themselves sort of ring hollow if we're not talking about the dollars generated by the students within those boundaries. If we're talking about affluence and poverty and socioeconomic factors um, that our students carry with them, um, if we're not talking about where the students that live within those boundaries, they may be, again, voting for someone who doesn't represent the school that they actually attend. So this silo conversation about boundaries Again, it rings hollow without dollars. You know, our LCAP is tied to specific students that generate a specific amount of dollars. What does that mean for our district and what is the impact there? You know, where are the specific uh, subgroups or populations of scholars and how will they be affected? Um, but also where's the overlay with our existing open enrollment uh, configuration and system and what does that look like? And what would it look like if those students stayed there? How would that change what our existing system looks like in terms of LCAP do dollars and, and resources available to neighborhood school sites? Um, so so I, I'm obviously not in a position to ask for that, but if you guys could ask on my behalf to the gentleman that offered to bring that, um, you know, as someone who sits on LCAP, uh, the, the BAAAB, um, Bond Oversight Committee, um, all of those things intersect and we need to see that um, if we're going to do our work as constituents and and people that represent our students and families thank you great thank you all right uh, open up for board comment member villa yeah thank you for this um this is really interesting to see these different maps i'm going to kind of uh reiterate what uh, mr darby just said i think it's really important that like i'm looking at my own trustee area for and a lot of the students that attend, say, Hiram Johnson live in my in where I'm in my vicinity. 
So I think it's really important to look at where those students predominantly live. I mean, I see them walking to and from school and it's area four. So it's something that we should look at as, like he was saying, of where the kids are coming from and make sure that we're representing them appropriately. All right, thank you. Member Garcia? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so I've been looking at these maps for quite some time, um, realizing that trusty area two is the one that's going to be most um, impacted, I guess, so most changes happening there. And I've been um, coming back to map A. So, um, and then just realizing that all the maps at some point or time um, really um, change the boundaries in such a way that trusty area two essentially loses two important schools um, that uh, are a true reflection of who the rest of the district is. So those two schools being Hiram Johnson and Tahoe Elementary, who have a predominantly, um, you know, high, uh, low-income student population. They're very diverse um, in terms of um, demographics. So I, I would like to offer to my colleagues um, so that the demographers can go back and come back with a revised map A to really think about um, putting back Tahoe Elementary and Hiram Johnson and Trustee Area 2. And this is why. If we move forward with some of these maps as they're currently being proposed, Trustee Area 2 would not have any Title I schools. And I think that would be a problem because it would mean that Trusty Area 2 is a pocket in this city of uh, well-resourced communities, well-resourced schools, higher performing schools, and I, am, I proudly serve them. I proudly um, serve the, the, the voters and constituents of Area 2. But having been a, their trustee for the last three years, the needs of the schools are vastly different. So I think that today I'm in this seat, tomorrow I won't. These boundaries would be in place for 10 years. I do think that it's really important for the trustee in Area 2 to have a front row seat to, um, to what the needs are that are, are basically the needs of the vast majority of our students, which are 80% low income, 40% Latino, 20% English learners. That's who, our, that's who our, um, our district is. Going back to the LCAP, that's where the resources need to go, these schools that have high needs students. So I would like to propose, and I hope my colleagues agree, that it's really important that all trustee areas have schools that have high need students. And with some of these maps, that will not be the case for trustee area two. Further putting, I think, trustee area two in alienated and in a bubble that um, it's, it's gonna be really hard to really understand what some of those needs are when when you don't have a front row seat into what some of these schools are going through. Um, so again, I'd like to propose that uh, map A be, um, be modified to put back Tahoe Elementary, so the boundary being like either at 59th Street or 58th, and then Hiram Johnson into Trusty Area 2, so the boundary being at Reading. Thank you. All right, thank you, Member Garcia. Are there any other board comment? Member Phillips? Um, looking at these maps, it, it makes sense to make sure that every area is touched by the level of socioeconomic factors that, that affect a majority of our students. Um, I will agree with Trustee Garcia. I'm a little out of breath today, sorry. <laughs> um, I will agree with that, and I'm, I'm looking at what happens to Area 7 if we put two more Title Ones in Area 7. Um, balance is what we need, but it sounds like it's more 
a misunderstanding perhaps of equity versus equality. Um, it is somewhat, it, it, I mean, some people would call it elitist if we have um, area two blocked off to not the suffering so much, but the experiences of our, our student base. So I, I agree that that would be something that we could bring back. All right. Any other board comment? All right. Um, I hear what you're saying, Member Garcia, um, but I all, and I also hear Member Villa, um, and uh, I know that it's always been a topic of discussion that um, that area represents the majority of the Hiram Johnson students. Um, and so if it's the will of the board, we can ask for the next presentation in January, January, <laughs> in January that we bring back um, the different options to show um, the options that we currently have by board discussion. And then an option that has um, one or two <coughs> of the um, the uh, Title I schools um, back into Area 2. I'm asking for both schools to be back in area two, so the modifications. But yes, that's um, I agree that those m multiple maps need to come back. Okay, is this the will of the board? Yes. Yes. And Go ahead, Member Phillips. Yes. So, can we make sure that the maps are labeled appropriately so that we can see where our Title I schools are located within those? Yeah, is that a possibility, Mr. Reynolds? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to suggest the same thing, Member Phillips. Uh, these these maps have to include uh, more details with more um, legends, if you will, um, names of schools with a little logo of a schoolhouse something and some other logos for Title I versus non-Title I, um, maybe even percentages of, 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 of students who are LCFF eligible. Uh, they just need to be clear for the discussion for our board members and our community to be able to see because my eyesight is not very good and it's hard for me to see uh, where the boundaries are in terms of streets and I've got to remember in, in my day-to-day -day travels where, where schools are located in terms of very specific uh, streets and, and it's hard to see that in these maps. So we, yeah. we, will, we will do something to overlay information in a more clear uh, manner. And to be honest, it'd be nice to maybe just have each trustee area on one page for, to show us like the different areas. Okay. Yeah, that shows the school site. Okay, it sounds like it's the majority of the will of the board um, that we will bring this back um, with the different options in January. All right, this is an informational item. We'll see you back next month, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, oh, all right, go thank ahead. you. Uh -huh. President Pritchett, uh -huh. very quickly, just because uh, I'm looking at the sequence of the, of the, uh, of the next agenda items, and, and, and we do have uh, Mr. Bozio here who's been instrumental in helping uh, with 8.3. Um, and then I'm seeing in other agenda items, um, he will probably step away. And I want to just um, take a few minutes to recognize Mr. Bozio. Um, today is his last board meeting. Uh, he um, is going to uh, 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 focus some, some of his energy on, on, uh, in an area that, that he needs to focus on um, uh, as, as, as just a father and a husband. And I want to just really uh, recognize um, the immense efforts um, and uh, successes and difference that Mr. Bozio has, has made um, in his time here at Sac City Unified, first as a, as a teacher uh, and now as our in-house legal counsel. And, 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 and I just wanna say that when I uh, started my journey here with everyone in 2017, I understood that his responsibility primarily fell in the area of PRA requests. And of course, our board knows that we receive a lot of those um, and there is plenty of work to do in that area. But I also uh, saw um, a lot of other talents um, and abilities. And uh, I can say as superintendent that I have capitalized on every one of those abilities and that has resulted in a lot more stress and a lot more work and countless hours that he's had to put in uh, to benefit our students and families here in Sac City. So 
Uh, he is going to be a tremendous loss uh, to Sac City Unified uh, board members. And I want to just take a, a moment to thank him personally. Um, uh, just a, a fine individual, very honorable individual, um, extremely ethical, responsive, and uh, very responsible. So um, I, I want to just present him with um, with a, a token of our appreciation, uh, Board President uh, Pritchett, and uh, allow any other board member if they would like to uh, make comments uh, to Mr. Bozio. Yes, thank you, Superintendent. And Vowell, you're going to be sorely missed. I hope you know that you are a rock of Sac City. Um, and uh, I can't imagine life here without you, to be honest. Um, and if you ever want to come back, please call us. <laughs> um, I just, I, I hope you're a very hard worker. Um, and I hope you know that how much we really appreciate you. Okay. Member Morawski. Just really quickly wanted to say thank you for all you've poured your heart and soul into this work and you will be missed greatly. Thank you. Member Villa. Um, it's obviously only been a short time, but I just want to really, truly thank you for everything. You've really helped us new board members uh, navigate the last year. Your wealth of knowledge, our district definitely will be, uh, you will be tremendously missed. I could say so much more, but thank you for everything you've done, the countless hours, the late nights. Thank you to your family, too, for letting you be here with us all the time. So good luck to you on your next adventures. Um, and yes, you please come back whenever you decide. <laughs> if you want to, we'll miss you. Member Wu. So I've been here the longest, <laughs> longer than uh, superintendent. And um, I too had uh, originally a job where I responded to just PRAs and subpoenas and things like that. And I know uh the tremendous amount of work that is entailed and then you took on more and i am very extremely thankful for that uh you are um one of the heart and souls of this depart this uh agency and i very much uh appreciate all the work that you've done i i'm sure i'll see you around town uh so uh, good luck to you thank you member, member garcia um, yes, Rural, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your hard work, um, all the time you dedicated to the students of this district. I don't think um, many know, but you started off as a teacher and, um, and you, you became in-house counsel. So um, I know that you have spent many, many years um, giving it your all to um, serve the students of this district. So I just want to thank you. And also, as my colleagues mentioned um, before, thank your family, because I know it's been um, it's been a lot of hard work. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Member Garcia. Raul, it's it's been a pleasure. never felt like there's anything below him. He's even gone for an occasional caffeine run when the board president <laughs> is really tired. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, okay. Item 8.4, approval of annual organizational meeting of Board of Education, election of officers. The board shall elect a president, vice president, and second vice president. As we know, every um, meeting or one meeting in December is dedicated to uh, re the reorganization of our executive committee. So uh, do we have any public comment on item 8.4? Yes, we have Terrence Gladney. All right, Mr. Gladney, go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to say I recognize that, um, you know, that to, to sit on that dais, you know, takes bravery and, and courage, um, but it does come with the 
tremendous responsibility to remember what it was like when you're on the other side of the dais, right? The structure is set up so that even when we return in person, those of us in the community have to look up to you. You know, it's not just figuratively, it's physically as well. And you guys have to hold yourselves in the highest esteem with every vote, every comment, you know. Um, you know, even, yeah, I mean, when we get cut off at a minute, but then Mai can return and go beyond the two minutes and not be told to wrap it up, right? That's what you guys are supposed to represent for us. You guys are supposed to uplift us and our opportunities to use these once or twice a month engagements with you to let our voices be heard and really listen and, and, and let it sit on your heart and then move to your brain and your hands and take action upon that. So um, again, I do recognize this a tremendous commitment from you guys. Um, and I hope that uh, you guys will just honor the commitment that you have chosen to uh, to serve. And, and thank you guys. Thank you, Terrence. All right, I'll open up to the board, Member Morosky. Thank you, President Pritchett. And thank you for your leadership over this last year and, and the just tremendous work you put in personally to, to make sure our work as a board runs smoothly. Um, so it's been a great honor over this last year serving as your first vice president um, along with you. And in order to maintain that continuity and also to build our leadership bench, I am pleased to nominate you, <laughs> President Pritchett, as board president, um, member Garcia as first vice president, and member Rhodes as second vice president. So with this leadership team, you have an amazing mix of experience, energy, great ideas, governance mindset, and I look forward to a very productive year with this strong leadership team in place. So looking for a second on that motion um, for this leadership team. Thanks. All right, I have a motion and a second. And Member Morawski and Member Wu, I have to say that it's been a pleasure serving with you too. Um, all right, I have a motion and a second. Student preferential vote. All right, and Superintendent, roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a, I, I apologize, Member Garcia. Go ahead. Oh, you accidentally hit. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Superintendent, roll call. Member Pritchett? Aye. Member Morawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Aye. Member Phillips? Aye. All right. Thank you, board. Ooh, all right. <laughs> Item 9.0, board workshops. And I, just a quick moment, congratulations to Member Rhodes and Member Garcia. <laughs> or I should say Vice President <laughs> Garcia and Second Vice President Rhodes. Congratulations. <laughs> Item 9.0, board workshop strategic plan and other initiatives. 9.1, approve the superintendent agreement for Jorge Aguilar. This would be me. Hold on just a second. All right. Uh, this um, next item addresses the board's discussion and possible approval of an employment agreement with Superintendent Aguilar. The proposed new contract contains the following material terms if approved. Replaces, and, uh, replaces the existing superintendent contract that was dated May 4th, 2017. Number one. The term of the contract under the existing agreement through an addendum approved on January 16, 2020 is currently, in, is currently June 30th, 2025, with a provision that following a positive evaluation in any subsequent school year, the terms of the agreement will be extended by one additional school year. This term remains unchanged. The superintendent's base salary for the current school year remains the same as for the 2021 school year at 327-071. Number three, following any satisfactory or higher evaluation after the effective date of the agreement and through the end of the 24-25 school year, the superintendent shall be entitled to an annual base salary in increase provided to members of the Certificated Bargaining Unit. Unless the district and Certificated Bargaining Unit are unable to reach an agreement on salary for any given school year, 
In that case, the superintendent will receive an increase, a salary increase consistent with the California Consumer Price Index for that school year in lieu of any increases subsequently negotiated for that school year. Number four, the superintendent is also entitled to receive the same health and welfare benefits as certificated management employees as for as those benefits may change from time to time. Number five, the superintendent is also entitled to lifetime health benefits on the same terms and conditions as other qualifying certificated employees as the time of his initial employment. Number six, the district will reimburse the superintendent up to $6,000 annually towards life insurance and will reimburse the superintendent no more than $7,770 annually towards the annual premiums for disability insurance. Number seven, to incentivize longevity of leadership uh, and uh, to provide stability to our district following any year in which the superintendent receives a satisfactory or higher evaluation, a lump sum will be paid to the superintendent as follows. On July, um, July 1st, 2022, 4% of the superintendent's 21-22 salary. On July 1st, 23, 5% of the superintendent's 22-23 salary. On July 1st, 2024, 6% of the superintendent's 23-24 salary. On July 1st, 2025, 7% of the superintendent's 24-25 salary. Number eight, the superintendent's work year will be 239 days. He shall earn one day of sick leave with pay for each full month of service, 22 days of annual vacation, not to exceed 44 days, and receive an expense allowance of $750 per month for reasonable act, um, actual and necessary business-related expenses, all as provided for in the existing agreement. Number nine, following a satisfactory or higher evaluation, the district shall contribute a supplemental retirement plan for the benefit of the, um, of the superintendent, a lump sum equal to the maximum salary reduction contribution permitted for a 403B plan. Number 10, the superintendent will be provided technology devices by the district and be reimbursed for actual and necessary expenses incurred within the course and scope of his employment for travel and related expenses under the same terms as the current agreement. Uh, similarly, um, the district will continue to pay for the superintendent's membership and community services and professional organizations. This concludes the summary of the existing and proposed new mat uh, materials to ter uh, material terms to the superintendent contract. Complete copies of this are available from the, um, from the district office, office upon request. Is there any public comment on this item, Ms. Allen? Yes, we have 13 public comment. Okay. The first one is Mr. Darby. I do not see him. All right. Um, the second public comment is Allison Lau. She's not on. Okay. Okay. Next public commenter, Mo Kashmiri. Um, I would urge the board to vote against this proposal. Um, our, our district is in shambles. Our district is on fire. It's failing across the board. We don't have enough folks to be able to even fill the positions, which is kind of basic. The superintendent has failed on the independent study program. He's failed on increasing enrollment. He's failed at building any goodwill with any of his labor partners. He's failed at engaging teachers and, and classified staff. He's failed building schools that we're proud of. Instead, we're a local embarrassment. Instead of working with our partners like every other school district around us, we go backwards partially because of his lack of just ability, you know, lack of ability to build the relationships with the folks that actually do the work. 
Um, it's a slap in the face to the folks that actually do the work to give him 22% bonuses just to get a satisfactory evaluation. It's a slap in the face to give him a total compensation benefit package of over $450,000. That's ridiculous. It's outstanding. And it's completely inequitable by design. It's not right. Our classified folks are working near poverty level, just making it day to day. And they won't get CPI raises. They haven't gotten raises in three years. And many of them work for close to minimum wage. They have to work two or three jobs just to get by. You think anyone in this district, anyone in this community came to this district because of Jorge Aguilar? Nobody did. And has anybody wanted to bring their kids more into Sac City Unified since he's been here? No. It's been a disaster. We need a change in leadership. The last thing we need to do is give him huge bonuses and claim they're not raises, right? You know, like, I think everyone who actually does the work on the ground should get these kind of benefits and wages. Thank but you, Mr. Kesmary. So please vote no on this proposal. It's time for a change in leadership of this district. Thank you, Mr. Kesmary. Thank you. The next comment is Michael Minnick. Hello, board member Minnick. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Michael Minnick. I'm a community member and school board member from 2016 to 2020. Um, I am speaking to support moving forward with the new contract for Superintendent Aguilar. Um, when we as a board chose him to lead our district in 2017, it was because of his dedication and focus on students. He has unapologetically put the needs of students first throughout his tenure. And I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you that he is tirelessly working for our kids seven days a week. He hit the ground running in 2017 and hasn't slowed down a bit. And consistency is important. He has led the district through some incredibly difficult times and showed his commitment to the community. And it's really important that our community gives him the opportunity to continue the work that he's begun. So I ask that you all vote to approve this next contract for Superintendent Aguilar because our kids deserve him. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Middick. Nice to hear from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next. next public commenter is Ingrid Hutchins. Ms. Hutchins, go right ahead. Hello again. Um, this time I'm combining time with Alan Cox, Shelley Lawson, Jean Seto, Janine Johnson, Jody Bone, and Holly Conway. Okay, wait, I I'm, lost track. How many minutes was that? How many people so was that? That would be me. And then I have um, Alan Cox, Shelley Lawson, Jean Seto, Janine Johnson, Jody Bone, and Holly Conway. So that would be a total of seven people, That's myself plus six. Okay, you get 14 minutes. Thank you. I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of the multitude of teachers who are absolutely livid that this agreement is even being considered. I want to begin with a few questions to activate our collective critical cognitive thinking skills before I dive deep into the details of the agreement. As I point out each item, please ask yourself, what has the superintendent done to deserve such a generous contract? Are you rewarding him for filling the students in our district? Or is this a reward for his efforts to destroy labor relationships? Let's look at a few crucial points. Section 1A states, if the superintendent receives a positive annual evaluation in any subsequent school year, the term of the agreement shall be extended by an additional school year. I realize this item was added back in January 2020, but I'm curious about the evaluations themselves. How can you, in good conscience, and as elected trustees for the areas you re represent, give a positive evaluation for a superintendent who had two of the district's largest unions deliver you a vote of no confidence in his leadership. The fact that you blatantly ignored the input from such a large number of the district's employees makes us wonder if you're serving the needs of the students or of the superintendent when you evaluate him. Those of us who actually work in the district have direct experience with the effects of Mr. Aguilar's tenure with our district. I'd love to know what information you use to decide um, that you had more confidence in his leadership than his employees did. Section two, 
The superintendent's current salary shall remain the same for the 2020-2021 school year at, uh, let's see, $327,071. That sounds like a wonderful concrete number, but then the next subsection added some ways in which his salary will be increased. Uh, the first one, the board reserves the right to increase the superintendent's salary at any time during the ter his term, so long as such an increase is approved by the board. I'm sure this decision will be made with the same ambiguous rubric that you use for his evaluation, so I'm pretty sure that salary will be increased. Following any satisfactory or higher evaluation, um, the, the superintendent's salary shall be increased by the same percentage increase provided to any members of the certificated bargaining unit. Right there, that sounds great. But then you say, if the district and the certificated bargaining unit are unable to reach an agreement on salary for any given school year, then the superintendent will receive a salary increase consistent with the CPI for that school year in lieu of any increases subsequently negotiated by the certificated bargaining unit for that school year. Well, SCTA is asking for a 3.5% increase. The current CPI is 5.6%. Seems to me that it should be an item that you as the only group that provides oversight to the district should have seen as a huge red flag. You're allowing him to benefit more from not reaching an agreement with his labor partners than from engaging in good faith bargaining. It seems to be an enormous conflict of interest that you're allowing if you approve this agreement. Um, the third section is fringe benefits. I was searching through this section for the cuts that you plan to make to his health insurance since you're allowing the district to cut teachers' health benefits, but I failed to find any. I did, however, find some items that he wants to receive that teachers could only dream of. He is set to receive lifetime benefits from his first day of employment rather than earn it by being a long-term employee. These are the same benefits that teachers must work decades to receive, and these are benefits that he wanted to take away from teachers. He also wants you to agree to reimburse him up to $6,000 annually towards his life insurance. While his job in here is not inherently risky, teachers' lives are at risk not only from COVID exposure, but from the current threats of violence on our school campuses. Why would you agree to reimburse his life insurance benefits but not offer the same to the people who willingly go to work every day when danger is involved? He also wants you to agree to reimburse him for the annual premiums for a disability policy up to $7,770 per year in an effort to provide disability income equal to approximately 100% of his then current total annual salary. I couldn't figure out if this was a joke or a misprint. Teachers are not refunded their disability insurance payment. In fact, your female employees who pay into and use their disability benefits for maternity leave also don't receive anywhere close to 100% of their yearly salary while on leave. Um, longevity pay. As a 20-year employee, I'd like to know exactly what this is and why you don't value the people who work with our students enough to offer this to them. According to your agreement, every year you give a, a lump sum that increases, and it not only increases in percentage, but it also increases because of the overall um, salary from that year. I'm not going to go through the entire chart with you because um, Ms. Pritchett did already do that with us, but imagine what lump sum longevity pay would do to support teacher retention or teacher recruitment. Uh, business expenses. The district shall provide the superintendent with expense allowance of $700, I'm sorry, $750 per month for the payment of reasonable, actual, and necessary business related expenses incurred by the superintendent in the course and scope of his employment. He's not required to provide receipts to prove how the money was spent or why. What are these monthly expenses that are so important to his job performance that he receives this benefit? Why on earth don't you hold them accountable to, prov to prove how these expenses benefit our students? Why do you allow this benefit to, for an already highly paid employee, but then expect your teachers who make far less money than he does to buy supplies for their students out of their own pockets? I only have time to highlight a few of the items in this agreement, but I assume that all the trustees have read it thoroughly. How can you as elected trustees of integrity even consider approving this while the district is, is in such disarray. If you are truly providing the oversight that you were elected for, how can you consider approving it before the district negotiates in good faith 
with their own labor partners? How is it right to improve his financial situation while allowing him to claim that other employees should reduce theirs? How does making our district an unattractive place for teachers and other school staff members to work help our students? If there aren't enough educators to teach our, our students, how can you claim that you're doing your job? Stop trying to make the role of superintendent into an opportunity to fleece our district. Your constituents did not elect you for that. Trustees, it's easy to go with the group. I hope you remember tonight that you were not elected to go with the group, nor to reward a superintendent who does not have the support of a significant percentage of the district's employees. You need to do what's right. You need to hold the superintendent responsible for the mess that the district has become. You need to stop worrying about being comfortable with group dynamics of our board and start doing what you've been elected to do. Tonight, Sacramento voters are paying close attention to who stands up for their community and the future of our district. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Salon. Our next speaker is Shawanda Wesley. Thank you. This is Shonda Wesley. I'm a parent of a third grader. My child was scheduled for a COVID test today at school, but my child and many more were not tested due to a staffing shortage. And instead of prioritizing my child's safety through having adequate testing staff, we will instead grant our superintendent a huge salary and benefit increase while cutting staff benefits and salary. We cannot recruit and retain staff with the way this district is functioning. This isn't the, in the best interest of my child, nor of the school district. We have a $13 million surplus. I encourage you to revisit your priorities as a school board, ones that reflect our children's safety and the teachers who keep them safe. My first experience with the district was during the disastrous independent study rollout. If I ever leave this district, it will not be because of the teachers. It will not be because of vaccines. It will be because of the mismanagement by this administration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wesley. Next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frank DeYoung. Hello, Mr. DeYoung. Good evening, uh, President Pritchard and uh, Superintendent Aguilar and other board members. I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am a grandparent with grandchildren at Sutterville Elementary School and McClatchy High School. I'm speaking strongly to support this superintendent, who I will tell you has been under attack from day one when he stepped through the door before he even tried to do anything. And yet this superintendent knew what change was going to take and how hard it was going to be. And he had a vision and he had plans. And our educational partners have chosen to put walls up in front of him every time he's tried to make a move, and then they dare to blame him for this district not moving forward. They're the ones that need to look in the mirror. And any of you board members who choose not to vote for him because the union is in your pocket or has the power to believe they're in your pocket, you should be ashamed because it's about our children. And trust me, our educational partners who were ruled by PERB to not be bargaining in good faith. Make no mistake, this isn't about our kids where they sit. They could have had a bargaining agreement a long time ago that could have included raises and could have worked out their health insurance. But this union was not interested in doing that. So they need to look in the mirror instead of telling everybody else to look in the mirror to not vote for this superintendent and support him when he's chosen to stay here. Most wouldn't. Why would they want to be in this environment? So don't tell me he's not committed to this community and he's not willing to dig in and do the things that need to be done to help our children. I'm telling you now he is. And to not vote for him would be a serious mistake by this board. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. DeYoung. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Terrence Gladney. Good evening, Terrence. Um, it wasn't that long ago that the superintendent said he gets confused on where our schools are. And he needs, you know, reference points to understand our communities. It's not that long ago that he said that Cabrillo was a gentrified school and neighborhood. That doesn't show someone that's committed to our school. 
So, I, uh, you know, I respectfully disagree with Frank. Um, I love him to death. But, um, you know, to to address uh, Mr. Minnick's comments um, about the work that the superintendent has begun, um, he's been here four years, but yet openly said he has not implemented any new academic programs. I would like to see on record, other than what you guys have on the website stating his accomplishments, accomplishments around graduation rates what are his actual accomplishments we're supposed to be a data-driven district but people speak in very vague terms about his impact and he's willing to stay you know why he's willing to stay because he's rewarded for mediocrity we have had a tremendous amount of turnover and exodus but you guys are saying that you're unwilling to go a different direction but yet the culture that has been created under the last four years of this superintendent has been turnover so it's okay for our teachers, our site administrators, our classified staff, our central office staff to leave because of this culture, but you guys want that to continue by keeping the person responsible for that in place. The hypocrisy, the hypocrisy that you guys blame lifetime benefits of teachers, but are willing to attach that to the person at the top who is fighting to undo that. The hypocrisy. We have declining enrollment while our neighboring Competitors, Fortune, Sava, St. Hope, they're increasing enrollment because our students are leaving. But you guys are willing to reward someone for continued. Are there things that existed when he got here? Yes, but has he changed them? That's progress. You guys reward our CBO when you say that we're in a financial crisis. That's hypocrisy. So yeah, we all need to look in the mirror, but we're not all the ones making the decisions. You guys Thank are. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you. Our final commenter is Anna Molander. Go ahead, Anna. Well, I, I apologize. I, uh, apparently I signed up for the wrong thing and then I went to get milk because we ran out of milk and you called me. Oh. Um, so <laughs> I, I meant to be here much earlier, um, but that's, that's how it is as a parent, right? We spend a lot of time multitasking and doing many things and we don't always, we're not always able to keep our eyes on the prize. And what's frustrating to me about this contract isn't necessarily the terms of it, although I do think several are very questionable. It's that it was posted five hours before your meeting started. That's just not enough time for anybody in this community to take a look and see what's in the contract. Um, I do contracts for a living. I write them. I read them. And 20-page contract for most people is not easy to read. And I'm a lawyer, and I've been doing this for 20 years. So I didn't have time to read the contract today. And I certainly didn't have time to double check what you're telling me is in the contract. Um, so I would ask you to please table it for today. Give us a month to take a look at it. Let us look at it over the holidays and see what's going on in the contract. We don't need to vote today on whether uh, Superintendent Aguilar gets an extended contract. This isn't a vote for or against him right now. So let's table it. Let's look at it next January um, because I, I want you to hear, I can hear it in Ms. Pritchett's voice and I can hear it in a lot of voices tonight. Parents are tired, we're angry. Um, it, and it is not uh, a good time for you to, to shut us down and not hear our voices. Um, you know, I've been saying for well over a decade that Sacramento has the ability and the opportunity to be, be the best school district in the state. And I feel like you are stopping us from being that district. So be transparent take more time, listen to some dissent on this, and most importantly, as part of the job review process, the superintendent must be reviewed by the community themselves. There should be a survey done to all the parents and community holders so that you know what your community thinks of the job the superintendent is doing. You have a very different view of this from your dias than we do as parents down in the trenches. Thank you for your time. Thank you. With that, the last comment. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. I appreciate all the input that was um, shared by our community tonight on this item. Um, regarding the superintendent's role in negotiation, there has been no change in either the contract language or the district's practice in having designated teams negotiate with our labor partners. The board will continue to work with the superintendent and his designated negotiation team members on all collective bargaining matters. Tonight, I am prepared to vote to approve this contract, and this is why. The terms of this contract make our district competitive, competitive with other districts in California that are like us, 
that are seeking to retain and recruit a superintendent. This contract also recognizes and incentivizes the stability of leadership. You know, I got to tell you, when uh, we were doing superintendent search meetings throughout our communities, um, I attended several of them. And the biggest thing that I heard from the community was that they wanted longevity. They were tired of the revolving door of superintendents. They wanted someone that was here to stay. Under this contract, Superintendent Aguilar will be the longest serving superintendent since Dr. Sweeney was superintendent in, tw in uh, 2003. He lives in our community. He breathes in our community. His kids go to our community. That's what people wanted. The students in Sacramento City Unified School District benefit when we have stable and effective and experienced leadership. Superintendent Aguilar is a highly qualified superintendent who has demonstrated and engaged in commitment to this district. I am personally appreciative of his interest to continue serving as the superintendent over the next four years and hopefully beyond. <laughs> there is no question that our district faces challenges. Some that, are, um, that all districts are struggling with, like supporting our students during the COVID-19 pandemic, and some that are unique just to Sac City Unified. Superintendent Aguilar understands these challenges and has a track record of working hard to address them while staying focused on equity and supporting all of our students. Our goal is to make Sac City Unified a high-performing district that gives all students an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary choices from the widest array of options. Superintendent Aguilar fully embraces this guiding principle. And we'll open it up for uh, board discussion. Member Garcia. Oh, did you not have your button? No. Okay, Member Morawski. Hi, thank you, President Pritchett. I, I don't have too much to, to add to what you said. Um, I, am, I am also excited that Superintendent Aguilar uh, is as committed and as dedicated to our district as he is. Um, is, he, is he solving all of our problems? No. We have tremendous, tremendous challenges in Sac City, as many districts do across the state. Um, staffing. Um, all, all kinds of you know social emotional um, issues that our students have like across the board we have many 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 challenges um, but he is working diligently on understanding them on piercing through to understand what in the system has to change in order for our students to have academic success and he sees our students success as his success that's what he measures himself by and that's what we measure him by as a board. So I, I just want to, you know, it's, I understand it's very easy to, to rail against executive compensation at any level. As a board, one of our most critical, our most sacred duties to hold this, hold this all together is to hire a chief administrative officer for the district. That is what we are doing to re retain a highly qualified, competent, respectful, responsible, responsive, uh, smart, creative. Uh, I, could go, I could go on and on. Is he solving every, every problem? No. And that's, and, and that's just life. But he, he, is, he has been great for our district. He will continue to grow and, and be able to actually implement things that he wants to do. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I know there are, there are elements because I've been, I've been following, I've, I've looked at the SACB archives over the last 30 years about newspaper articles, about superintendents and, and things that people were saying about him. And if Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, well, that's just what boards have been doing in this district. It's been a revolving door of superintendents. And, and that has not served us well whatsoever. So I think we are, we are lucky as a community to have a dedicated public servant like Superintendent Aguilar, and I will support it at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Member Morawski. Any other board comment? All right, I have a motion to move. Uh, we have a motion on the table. 
So what was that? Uh, it, it, I did not ask for a motion, but we have a motion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is there a second on the motion? There is a board comment, yes, on the motion. Okay, Member Phillips. <laughs> Um, basically, I just want to say we know our district is in a crisis. We know there's crisis with our children, crisis with our teachers. Um, what I want to make sure that we understand as a board moving forward is that a lot of the measurements that we're using or the measurements we should be using to evaluate our superintendent, we really need to make sure that we are firm in how we're going to design that. Um, because, I mean, a lot right now is we don't have the specific language to describe what has happened, what things are not going well. We need to talk about what's not going well and then work into making ways to repair that. Um, I just, part of me is that we really just, we need to recognize that we need to pull together as a board and we need to absolutely make sure that we have the proper measurements in order to let the public know and our constituents know that we are evaluating him properly. Um, that's something we need to move into. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Member Phillips. Member Garcia? Um, I'd like to just build upon uh, Board Member Phillips's um, comments in terms of the evaluations. I have felt that they have been inadequate um, thus far, and so I'd like to see maybe an ad hoc being um, formed with, um, you know, the right number of board members because we can't all be there to start this process to see what that looks like, um, you know, so that we can come up with um, an evaluation uh, process. Um, the metrics that we're going to use, um, you know, in terms of holding the, um, the, the superintendent accountable as we consider uh, future evaluations. I'd love to see um, multi more, like not an annual evaluation, but also um, check-ins, regular check-ins, so that we have that back and forth throughout the, um, the, the process. And I'd also like to bring in um, one of the uh, you know, subsections here in the contract of community relations, you know, um, really pulling in, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the input and feedback of, of our community. Um, so, so those are just some of the things that I, I, I feel very strongly need to happen um, as we move forward with, um, with taking into consideration this contract that is before us. Um, I'd also like to make a comment about um, the, the tremendous needs of our district. Um, you know, they start in the classroom. They start with um, everybody who supports the entire village of educators and school um, staff that support students. And um, that, that's a separate process in terms of how we decide to compensate all of our workforce. Um, that's a process that the board is not involved until there's a final product. I look forward to a final product coming before the board so that we can take action on making sure that we're supporting the entire village that supports our students. I look forward to that day, um, and I hope that it happens soon, but it's a process, and that process is lengthy at times, um, but I, I have to respect the process that's in place by law, um, by local agreement. So, um, so again, I just want to make sure that for, for um, the, the workforce that called, um, we hear you. We know what's happening. I'm a parent in this district. I know I, I, I hear it from my, my children. Um, there's, there's a lot of needs, and I think um, the resources we have a lot of it on the one-time basis, but um, we 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 just can't often find people, and and we want to make sure that those supports are here for our students and also for staff. But again, that's that's a separate process. Um, so thank you. 
Thank you, Member Garcia. Member Rhodes? Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think when it comes to evaluating our superintendent, one of the uh, commenters, I, I, I don't remember which one, one of our community members uh, gave an, a great idea that I think we should uh, add into our repertoire. Um, member, our vice president, uh, Garcia, also uh, mentioned it as well. Um, the idea of uh, the community uh, having input on, on the evaluation of our superintendent, or at least us getting that community input from broadly across the district, community survey for the superintendent evaluation, I think is going to be very important um, as we move forward. Uh, there's things here that, that give me pause. I've, I've voiced them before, um, but I think we're, as we move forward, uh, we have to look at um, truly um, evaluating our superintendent, our main employee, uh, well, uh, so that we can do well. Uh, if we continue um, not having the structures in place, um, then we do a detriment to uh, our superintendent, we do a detriment to our board, we do a detriment to uh, our system and our students at the end that, who are the final end uh, users. And so, uh, that's what I'll say for right now. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, colleagues. I have a motion and a second on the table. Student preferential vote. All right. Superintendent, roll call. President Pritchett, can I defer uh, perhaps so oh, that the roll call uh, Maybe is we can ask um, Ms. Collins. Counsel, yeah, no, that's fine. Yes, President Pritchett. Uh, President Pritchett. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, Member Morawski. Yes. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Um, there are things in that contract that I, I can't vote in good conscience to improve, so I'll say no uh, this evening. Member Phillips. No. All right. Thank you, colleagues. We have a. Majority vote. Thank you. All right. Uh, item 9.2. President Bridget, can I yes. make just, oh, a, go ahead, just a, Superintendent. a comment yes. here? Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to um, thank uh, you, President Pritchett, members of our board. Uh, thank you for your confidence in me and your, your commitment as board members and your service on behalf of students in Sac City Unified. This is a board that I would say uh, works very long hours, uh, and uh, we demand a lot of your attention and time on a daily basis and into the weekends in trying to keep you informed of everything that is happening that I think is relevant for you to know as uh, board members. Since July 1st of 2017, when I started as your superintendent and as your employee, uh, I, I've awakened every morning committed to Sac City Unified uh, not just as your superintendent, but as a proud parent in the district. And I look forward to, over the next four years, uh, two of our children, who are now in the ninth grade, will finish high school, their high school careers in Sac City Unified. And I hope that our youngest child, who's a seventh grader, will have the opportunity to graduate from Sac City Unified as well. I also want to thank uh, the Sacramento community for welcoming me and my family since we moved here. We've uh, put down roots in Sacramento, and I very much value being part of, of our community. Yes, I'm proud of some of the progress that we've made, uh, but much work remains to help Sac City Unified achieve the thought and the goal of becoming a high-achieving urban school district. And yes, stability of leadership at the helm of any organization is usually a positive attribute and it's no secret that high-performing districts across the state have consistency of engaged leadership. But I would offer this evening, board members, that leadership stability in and of itself should not be our essential objective, nor should we allow stability to become overrated by having leadership stability but tolerating the status quo. Our objective needs to be and should remain to relentlessly and courageously focus on our students as we work together to make Sac City a high-performing district that provides equitable opportunities for all students to learn, to grow, and to reach their full potential. 
and that it prepares them for college, career, life, and any choice that they make once they leave our system. And here I would ask uh, all of our community to review our LCAP plan summary statement, which came from our community, uh, because it captures it way better than I can and way better than we've been able to as a district. There are many opportunities and challenges before us board members, and we have to navigate to improve how our district meets the academic, social, emotional, physical, mental health needs of all of our students in Sac City Unified. The agreement specifies that you will evaluate me as a district employee annually, and it's right that you hold me accountable for progress in each of the areas of the agreement. However, in doing so, I want to highlight an important challenge we must address in our collective work ahead and say to you that I will not give up on ensuring that you as our board and those that you represent in our community can hold me accountable in larger part on the academic well-being of our students as measured in some form or fashion on a robust system of benchmark assessments which haven't been in place in Sac City since 2017. We are allowing and have allowed a generation of students to go through our system without me being able to report to you on any advances that we have made that our initiatives have made. We cannot, I've said it before, we cannot improve what we cannot measure. We cannot improve what we cannot measure. It's simple as that. Implementing some form of an assessment system has nothing whatsoever to do with our district's budget challenges or the structural deficit that we also must address that has taken up a lot of our time, a lot of our energy over the years. The work to right our district's fiscal ship must also continue, of course, and I will stay focused on that. And operating our schools in the midst of a pandemic has laid bare and has shown the extent of students' social and emotional and mental health needs. By using our limited COVID relief funding wisely, we can make great strides toward implementing systems that compassionately address those needs in partnership with community-based organizations. I remain impatiently patient and eager to continue making progress on these issues and I'm grateful for the support, commitment, and partnership of the board. I applaud and thank the board for the healthy governance practices that you've been engaged in, for some of the policies that you've put in place that, as I heard Member Murawski, other, board mem other boards of education of the past, other superintendents have not been able to achieve, and those will create a lot of discomfort and a lot of anxiety and a lot of criticism that you will feel and I will continue to feel. Lastly, I of course look forward to continuing to work with you in the years ahead, really to pierce through and solve long-standing challenges that will put our district and our students on a path to a brighter future. Thank you, board. Thank you, superintendent. All right, item 9.2, the 2021 first interim revised budget. Uh, revised budget approval and FICMAT update. Ms. Ramos? Yes, good evening, President Pritchett, board members and members of the public. Uh, presenting with me tonight are a couple of our staff members, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, uh, Mr. Adrian Vargas, and our Director of Accounting, uh, Jesse Castillo. If I could get the next slide, please. Uh, the agenda for tonight is we will go over the financial reporting requirements, the district's fiscal status, and then some changes that have happened since the uh, adopted budget for 21-22, um, the multi-year projections, and we will review with you the budget calendar, the FICMAT matrix update, uh, the COVID funding sources, and then finally we'll end with, an, with a summary and uh, seeking your approval for the first interim budget. Next slide, please. Um, as you know, I've shared, we share the slide at all of our um, uh, financial reporting periods. Uh, these are the educational codes that guide school districts' financial reporting. Uh, the first one is uh, with respect to the interim reports. There's two that we have to do um, every year. The first one we're doing now is called the first interim report, which covers the period of July 1 through October 31st. That represents our actual activity since that during that time period. 
And then our second one is the second interim presented in March, which covers the period through January 31st. And both of these reports then will project the remaining months of the year through June, just to provide an update on what we anticipate in terms of the expenditures and revenue. The second code um, is, uh, it refers to the board um, that based on this information that you are uh, receiving and based on the certain criteria, uh, the district must certify whether or not uh, we will be able to meet our financial obligations for the current year plus two years out. And then finally, the last code uh, refers to districts that receive a qualified or negative of any of their interim reports uh, will file a third interim report as of April 30th. Next slide, please. And um, so here we go to the district's fiscal status. Um, as you may recall, the district's 21-22 adopted budget was conditionally approved by SCOE um, because of our continuing um, structural deficit and uh, the use of a lot of one-time funds. Uh, in addition to that, the, the letter from SCOE stated the district must approve a fiscal recovery plan by December 15, 2021 to address the ongoing structural deficit. And following this report, um, we, the next board item is the um, proposed fiscal recovery plan. So the 21-22 first interim will be uh, filed a, a, as a qualified uh, certification for many reasons. Some of these are listed here for you. Uh, we're still in need of an approved fiscal recovery plan that addresses the deficit. Our projected structural deficit stands at 19.5 for the 22-23 year and 26.2 for the 23-24 year. Cash flow, although positive um, as seen in the multi-year, um, nonetheless continues to diminish rapidly because of the deficit. So in other words, the reserves are paying for those deficits because our revenues do not balance to our expenditures. Our enrollment um, has seen a significant decline um, and we, our negotiations are unsettled for both of our bargaining groups, our certificated and classified units, excuse me. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to the proposed state budget. We're not sure. We know that there's additional fund uh, revenue in the system uh, statewide, but we're not sure how that's going to be rolled out to school districts, whether it's going to come by way of categoricals, which really doesn't help our deficit situation, or if it would just come unrestricted, that would certainly um, be of assistance, but that's an, an unknown right now. And therefore, um, the Sacramento County Office of Education Fiscal Advisor uh, will remain assigned until the deficit reduction plan is achieved and therefore remain under stay and rescind authority. And I'm just gonna pause here for just a quick second and just to spend a little bit, not a whole lot of time just to explain um, some districts that do file a positive because that question has come up since our cash flow is positive, and since um, our reserves are, are pretty high, um, why isn't it that you know we, we're not filing a positive or recommending a positive? Um, some districts, as many of you are familiar, if you look at their financial statements that have been filing a positive, they filed a positive most likely in the recent last uh, few uh, interim periods. In addition to that, most likely they do not have a structural deficit. Um, in addition to that, their enrollment may be stable and their negotiations may, may be settled. In those events, in those districts where they might be operating a deficit or um, they might have enrollment that's declining or they're on the, on, 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 in the process of settling negotiations, what they will often have to, to mitigate those um, losses in revenue or those increased expenses are approved, implemented um, plans. Uh, fiscal recovery plans to address those uh, those shortcomings, whether it's reducing expenses in the near future or whether it's seeking alternative revenue sources, such as um, one of our neighbors here, for example, uh, Davis Unified, has a parcel tax in place to offset some of their salaries. Uh, some of our neighboring districts in the Bay Area are implementing some budget reductions in order to be able to afford raises. So those are examples of districts that maintain their positive certifications and do spend additional dollars, but they're reducing expenses or they have implemented plans to uh, increase their revenue. And our district is not currently in that situation. Um, in fact, if we do not address the structural deficit, um, you'll see that in our multi-year projections that of course we start to diminish our, our reserves quite quickly. So just wanted to kind of put a little bit more context on that. And of course, you know, once we get to the end of our presentation, um, I'm sure you'll have more questions. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Adrian Vargas for the next slides. 
All right, thank you, Bruce. Um, so I'm going to go through the summary of changes um, within the first interim report um, at a high level and then get into some of the detail, and then I will talk about multi-year projections. Um, so some of the uh, changes uh, involved are unrestricted revenues being increased by 5.7 million. Um, and again, this is compared to the adopted budget. Uh, our restricted revenues increased by almost 147 million. Uh, we are seeing at one time unrestricted expenditure savings and budget adjustments of 11 million. Um, restricted expenditures increased by almost 137 million due to budgeting for CARES and COVID funds and other carryover like Title I, Title II, uh, Title III, and, and then funds related to our CTE programs. And then also our contributions decreased by 3.2 million, and primarily that is due to an increase in our special education funding, which we talked about in the August um, update. Next slide, please. And then, as Rose mentioned, um, we're projecting a positive cash flow through the end of the fiscal year of June 2022. Um, our multi-year projections will meet the required 2% reserve for the current year and two subsequent years. But also, as Rose mentioned, um, we are projecting an unrestricted deficit spend uh, of 19.5 million in 22-23 and 26.2 million in 23-24. And again, um, we need the fiscal recovery plan, um, which includes a negotiated solution to achieve uh, sufficient ongoing reductions. Next slide, please. So this slide is just basically two tables showing the difference between the adopted budget um, and the first interim budget. So the first interim budget's on top. Um, and as you can see, um, our expenditures, I mean, mainly the, the biggest change uh, outside of the 11,000, uh, 11 million in savings on the unrestricted is the increase in expenditures on the restricted side of the budget. Um, and as I mentioned in those previous slides, I believe is over 130 million or close to that. Um, so that's the biggest change um, between the adopted and the uh, first interim budget. Next slide, please. And then this table uh, basically shows by category um, the the differences um, from adopted budget. And so you can see on the unrestricted side, there's the 5.4 million increase and most of that is related to the LCFF um, increase. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the subsequent slides. Um, there you see the 11 million uh, in savings on the expenditures. Um, and you could see it, how it spreads out between salaries, benefits, books and supplies, and other services and operating expenses. Um, and then you see the contributions uh, changed by 3.2 million. Next slide, please. So in terms of the changes for the unrestricted revenues, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the LCFF revenue went up by 5.3 million. Um, that was primarily due to the concentration grant increase from 50% to 65%. Um, and we talked about that as well in the August update. Um, however, I, I believe at that time, that projection was roughly about 8 million. Um, but it's lower because of our unduplicated percentage that we were using for the adopted budget um, has been roughly about 72%, but with our preliminary seabeds uh, report that our IT department is working on currently to certify this, I believe this week, um, we are showing that we are at 68%, and so that's roughly the $3 million difference. And then there was a small increase in local revenue, primarily due to school donations. Next slide, please. And then on the unrestricted um, expenditures, um, this kind of details out the 11 million. Um, we, we're experiencing 6.3 million in one-time savings uh, for a decrease in salaries and benefits, primarily due to savings in, in our sub-budgets, extra duty, and and then our vacancies. And just as a reminder, uh, we built our budget on an enrollment of 39,703 students for the 21-22 year. And to put that in context, our preliminary CBEDS enrollment report that was used for the first interim 
I was using a 38,044 students. So that's roughly a decline of 1,700 students. So um, we staffed at that 39,700 student, but our actual enrollment that we are seeing is in the range of about 38,000. Um, also, we um, see a decrease in supplies and services of 1.4 million, a small increase uh, to capital outlay, and then another big um, change was indirect costs of 3.4 million. And really what that is, is on our restricted revenues, we can claim um, a percentage of that and our percentage is 3.87%. Um, so we can collect it back to the unrestricted uh, side of the budget to, to help offset um, the work that we do at the central office. Um, and, and that's what it goes to. And that increased uh, by 3.4 million. And then again, we saw a decrease in contributions of 3.25 million. Um, and that was related to the increase in special ed um, revenue. Next slide, please. And then this slide basically goes through the um, changes in the restricted revenues. And as you can see, our uh, projection for federal revenues increased by 132 million. And again, this is for the CARES and COVID funds, but I would say it's primarily due to budgeting um, ESSER 2 and partially budgeting ESSER 3. And between those two um, resources or funding sources, that is roughly about 100 and uh, so it's 61 million and 50 million, so 111 million. Um, in just those two resources alone. And then our projected state revenue increased by 12, almost 13 million. And again, that's related to our CARES and COVID funds and one-time carryover. Our local revenues increased by 2.1 million, um, and that's due to budgeting uh, carryover from the 2021 fiscal year. And then again, on the restricted revenues, we see a decrease of the contributions of 3.25 million. Next slide, please. And then on the um, expenditure side for restricted expenses, we, we're seeing an increase in salary benefits of almost 20 million, an increase in supplies and services of close to 102 million. Uh, capital outlay is increased by 11.6. And again, here's those indirect costs. Um, we're seeing an increase because we're adding all these uh, budgeted expenditures and again, this is primarily due to COVID CARES funds and then the carryover um, related to the programs I mentioned earlier, like Title I, Title II, um, grants related to our CTE programs, and, and then our local uh, grants. Next slide. So the, the next few slides, we'll talk about the multi-year projection assumptions that were used. Um, and for the 22-23 year, we projected a 2.48% COLA. Um, our funded ADA is a little under 36,000 students, or 36 ADA. Um, for 23-24, we're using a 3.11% COLA. And then you can see um, our funded ADA is uh, 35,510. Um, and again, um, just as a reminder, uh, we are we adjusted our enrollment for the first interim, and we're using the a thirty eight thousand forty four number, um, and then we're using the the district's natural decline of 05 percent um, in twenty two twenty three, and then twenty three twenty four, and then for restricted revenues, um, the multi year projections are removing the one time COVID nineteen funds, um, funds that are uh, related to expiring programs like. SIG, um, and then removing the one-time carryover. And then in the 23-24 year, we're adding a small amount to budget the additional ESSER three funds of 671,000. Next slide, please. And then um, this slide reviews um, the unrestricted expenditure um, changes that are happening in our multi-year for the two out years. We increased salaries, certificated salaries by 1.5% for step and column. Um, 
adjustments were made to add back the savings from, from the first interim. And then we are also showing a decrease of 5.1 million um, to show a decrease in FTE related to the 1,850 enrollment decline um, between the 39,703 that we used and then the enrollment that was used um, in 22-23. Classified salaries were adjusting by 0.8% for step and column, adding back the savings um, that we that we are seeing for the interim. And then benefits are adjusted each year for STRS and PERS increases. Uh, we're building in an 8% um, increase for health and welfare benefits. And then we're adding back the savings from um, the interim. And again, with uh, supplies and services, um, we are including a projected decrease because our enrollment is declining. And, and with the 68% uh, for our unduplicated pupil percentage. We're also going to see a decline in our supplemental concentration funding. So we're accounting for that uh, decline in fiscal year 22-23. And then um, it will increase slightly in 23-24. And then for indirect costs, we remove um, those costs related to one-time or expiring grants. Next slide, please. And then this slide is going through the uh, restricted expenditure changes. Um, we're still using the same factor of 1.5% for step and column for certificated salaries. On the restricted side, we are including um, increases for special education staffing. And then this is offset by the removal of one-time expenses for expiring grants, um, i.e. Um, ESSER 2 would be a good example because we're fully budgeting that in the current fiscal year. So any salaries and benefit or salaries that are budgeted would be removed. Um, and then for classified again, uh, using the same factor of 0.8% and then uh, projecting increases for special education staffing. And those are offset by one-time expenditures. Uh, benefits adjust again for on the restricted side, the same way I mean, sorry, on the yeah, restricted side, just like the unrestricted for STRS and PERS, uh, we're using an 8% increase for health and welfare. And again, with what you are seeing, the common theme with the restrict restricted expenditure changes is we are removing uh, one-time expenses for expiring grants. And then supplies and services adjust each year due to the removal of one-time expenditures. And then they're offset by projected increases in special education supplies and services. And then capital outlay and indirect costs decrease related to uh, one-time expenditures. Next slide, please. So with all that, um, this slide shows the total revenue. So that's combined. So this is the unrestricted plus the restricted budget. Um, for the three years. And as you can see, we, we show um, a deficit of 2.4 million in the current year. Um, and then we uh, show that deficit of 19.5 in the second year, and then 26.2 in the third year out. Um, the one thing that I would point out in the current year, we see a deficit, although um, we've talked about um, a change uh, to the fund balance of almost 13 million. Um, that net difference is related to us utilizing our, our restricted funds. And so it's creating that deficit. And so again, our target to eliminate deficit spending is 26.2 million. Next slide, please. And then um, just to kind of compare if we didn't have CARES or COVID funds, um, you would see that our, our deficit spend is pretty close in the second and third year out. The primary difference is the removal of indirect costs that are related to um, COVID or CARES funds that would be budgeted in the 22 and 23 fiscal year, as well as the 23 and 24 fiscal year. But as you can see, it, it, the, project, the projected deficit jumps to 20.4 million. Um, in the second year, and then 27.1 million um, in the third year out. So um, with that, I'm gonna 
turn it over to Jesse Castillo and he will take you through uh, cash flow. Thank you, Adrian. Good evening, President Pritchett, members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. This slide is an overview of our 2021 first interim multi year cash flow projections. As you can see, the cash flow positive throughout the three years. Um, but as uh, Adrian and Rose mentioned, as well as you progress throughout the three years, the cash flow balance decreases due to the increase in the deficit spend. Um, so, uh, another important consideration of achieving a, a um, excuse me, a healthy balance budget in order to have a healthy cash flow balance and to continue to meet our financial obligations. This slide is a comparison of our cash flow where we were with uh, one year ago at the 2020-21 first interim cash flow compared to where we are today with the 2021-22 first interim cash flow. As you can see, it's a significant difference, especially if you look at those later months um, in the year, and that was due to a lot of changes and a lot of uncertainty around that time. As you may recall, um, at this time last year, we were still facing cash deferrals and a, a lot of the later months of the year. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty around our LCFF funding and COLA funding. Um, there was little to no conversations at that time regarding the increase in concentration grant funding and less COVID fund, uh, funding flowing throughout the budget as well. Um, so this chart is really just a great illustration of how those changes at the state level can have a significant impact at the local level with our school district budget and our cash flow projections. Next slide, please. This slide is uh, the Government Finance Officer Association's um, recommendation on uh, having a 17% reserve or approximately two months of average payroll, which is about $82 million for our district as of the 2021-22 first interim report. Next slide, please. This slide is an overview of the 2021-22 budget calendar and timeline. As you can see, well, here we are at the first interim report on December 2021, uh, with our next important period being January 2022 with the governor's January budget proposal, uh, followed shortly by the second interim report scheduled for March 2022. Next slide, please. This is the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team or FICMAP Fiscal Health Analysis Update. Uh, back in October 2018, FICMAT came in and conducted a health analysis in which they identified 60 deficiencies and provided recommended corrective actions for each of those. Um, we've corrected 34 of those findings, and there's actually been four of those that have been corrected since our last update. So, a um, great job to those teams implementing those corrective actions, and that leaves 26 findings remaining. Um, we do have an additional detailed report included in our executive summary as well as available on our website. And our next update will be during the 2021-22 second interim report. Next slide, please. This table is an overview of our COVID-19 funding sources received since the 2021 fiscal year. As you can see, a total allocation of 322.5 million. In that rightmost column is the corresponding expiration date for each of those funding sources. Um, definitely an important planning factor as we look at spending down those funds. Um, of note, resource 3220 or our coronavirus relief funds, as well as resource 7420, our learning loss mitigation funds, um, both have been expended in accordance with their expiration date. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Rose Ramos. Thank you, Jesse. Ms. Ramos, before you start, sorry, I need to just uh, do a quick interruption. It's a little past 1030, and uh, we need to extend our meeting. Can I get a motion to extend till 1230? Thank you, I got a motion a second. A student preferential vote. Uh, Superintendent roll call. Or just say, yeah, it's, it's, we don't need roll call, actually. Everyone say aye. <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> All right, abstentions? All right, go ahead. Sorry, Ms. Ramos, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, this is a similar slide that we uh, shared with you earlier in the presentation. It was slide number four. I'm not going to repeat this, but it's just a reminder of our fiscal status, what we are proposing to uh, certify the budget, uh, the budget as, as qualified and the reasons why. Um, next slide, please. And next slide, please. This is the multi-year projection. Uh, you've seen the first three years already, but we also wanted to present to you the next two years out, even though we're not required just to show the impact on the deficit should the district not do anything in terms of being able to address the deficit. Now, we know those two years out, it, it's, you know, it's a pretty good guess, and we try to use as many factors that are available to us out there um, provided by school services, and, uh, and there's some information out there as far as future COLAs are concerned, 
there's information as far as um, our pension plans are concerned and some of the CPI information that's out there. Now, the fifth, the, yeah, the fifth year starts to get a little tricky because, you know, as we project out that far, it, it really can change drastically. But nonetheless, we just wanted to illustrate the impact on the deficit if we're not to do anything and our expenses are to remain as is and our re revenue as well. So what happens is that you quickly start to deplete your reserves. Um, the cash balances that Jesse shared with you in the cash flow, that's what our reserves are. We start to use those up in order to, to, to close this gap because we just do not have enough revenue to manage our expenses. Um, so we're not like at this danger, you know, this danger situation right now where we were about two years ago where we were looking at a state loan quite quickly um, because of all this cash in the system and because of all the one-time savings due to the school closures. We're finding ourselves in a pretty, um, I would say, good situation in terms of financials. I'm, and, you know, academically, I understand that it's been a, you know, very difficult situation to have schools closed. But because of that, we were able to realize one-time savings and really build up our reserves and offset these deficits. Um, so now we're at a point where we can methodically and thoughtfully implement some actions to try to reduce this or to find some other solutions. And you'll hear a lot more about that and when we present the fiscal recovery plan to you but we just wanted to illustrate you know if the district were not to do anything what does that mean to the deficit and what does that mean to our reserves they start to deplete and as you'll see in the fifth year um our ending fund balance does go into a negative it is projected to go into a negative based on this, this information um next slide please um, and here we share these slide, this slide with you also in other reporting periods, the risks and the opportunities. So the risks are that our we're, enrollment will continue to decline significantly as we saw this last year. Um, as Adrian shared, we're projecting a half percent. Um, we're, we're assuming that we're going to go back to a normal and that, you know, this, this latest uh, huge dip that we realized is just going to be this one year and that next year we'll go back to just a half a percent. And of course, we'll keep, keep you apprised of that, you know, as we go into the year and we start to enroll students for the new year. Um, there's a little bit of uncertainty with the state budget and the impact that it can have on K-12. And I talked about that in terms of new money coming in. How are we going to um, see that new money? Is it going to be categoricals or is it going to be unrestricted dollars? And then, of course, any future salary settlements that will have an impact on the district's budget. And the opportunities are, you know, pretty much the opposite of those items that, you know, state budget will be great, uh, we'll recover that enrollment, and that we will find a fiscal recovery plan that's sufficient to restore the district's fiscal stability. Um, in January, as you all know, that's when the governor um, unrolls his, um, rolls out his uh, budget proposal for the coming year. So we're, we're anxiously awaiting to, to see what that information looks like, and we'll provide you with an update as soon as uh, we get that information. Um, next slide, please. And so we're at the end of our presentation. So uh, in summary, again, uh, the district has implemented more than $50 million in ongoing and one-time reductions in the last few years. So that's why when you look at the fiscal recovery plan, it's not as robust in terms of the large dollar amounts because you get to a point where um, it's difficult to find those big savings anymore. And the board did take action back in February of this year to approve a fiscal recovery plan of four and a half million dollars. Um, however, we still need a $26.2 million solution uh, to achieve fiscal sol uh, solvency. And uh, as you know, we're required to um, get, have a, an approved plan by December 15th. And we will be bringing back another interim report in March. And so the next slide is just um, seeking your approval for the first interim uh, budget report. Of course, any questions at this time, you're welcome. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ramos and staff. Um, but we, I believe we have uh, two public comment. We have three, but- Three um, public comment. The first one is Daniel Darby. I do not see him on. Okay. Um, Allison Law. She's not, not on. on. Okay. And Linda Smith. Someone's. All right, go ahead, Miss. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you for. <laughs> thank you for recognizing my hand. I just, I, I'm sitting here and listening to this, and I wasn't going to speak to it, and I just wanted to point out. Now, I'm hoping you can relate to how we may feel. 
that this presentation followed the presentation for approving that new very generous contract for our superintendent. I'm just hoping that you see what, what the public is seeing because it's actually a discussion that many of us have had. How did you follow? We have the money to give him this with, but we're in a structural deficit. I just want you to sit with that, please, because these are the things that we think about when we're in bargaining and the district tells us things, and I quote, the district's not interested in this at this time when discussing how to, to recruit and retain teachers. And they base it on presentations like what we just heard, yet we have the money to take care of these extras for a superintendent who's already very well paid. So I'm just hoping you understand that because it's very frustrating from our point of view. And I'm really trying to, to implore you to understand the neighboring districts, if they are all smart, are coming up with ways to match year to year for your senior teachers. You will be left with no one if you don't find a way to fix this. We need to stop pretending that there's a deficit when obviously it doesn't exist when we want to give raises to the superintendent or raises to the CBO, but we have them when we're trying to figure out ways to keep food on the tables of our teachers. You want to take away benefits from teachers who are widowed. But you want to give more benefits to somebody who has enough. Remember, this is, this is what you're saying to us. And I know you, you don't see it that way, but that's what we're hearing. And I'm asking you, I, I believe somewhere you guys all care about us. But I need to see it. We need to have the action to meet the words because this is becoming a very destructive place to work. Thank you, Ms. Hutchins. Thank you. Thank you. That was the only public comment. Okay, I'll open it up for board discussion. All right, I don't see any board discussion. Uh, this is an action item. Oh, hit your button then. You just gotta hit your button. <laughs> Member Garcia. Thank you. Thank you. You're moving a little fast for us tonight. Um, maybe I'm just moving slow. <laughs> Either way. So, um, Rose, I just want to thank you for including that five-year, um, multi-year projection uh, because I think um, there is a lot of um, funds available in our district now, just like in all the districts in California. Um, there was some very generous um, state funds, um, you know, uh, available this year. Uh, some of those were ongoing, so that helps our bottom line. Um, a lot of those are one time. So, so the fact that you included this five-year multi-year projection is very helpful because many of our federal one-time dollars go away in 2024. So that's when we're going to see that um, that number uh, balloon again, and we continue to see that we're deficit spending. Um, so we continue to rely on our savings to to fund the gap. Um, it also assumes that there are no changes between now and then, right? And we know that's not going to be the case. We know that um, our expenditures will increase because we, you know, we have a pending um, agreement. Um, and then we also know that the, um, the economy is doing really well in California. We're going to have another historic year in terms of funding. So um, I, I expect that education is going to benefit once again. The tricky part is always how much of that will be um, considered ongoing. So that's going to help this, um, these red numbers here. But then how much of it is going to be considered one time? So um, I am cautiously op optimistic. I know we still have some work to do. And, and, I, and I hear that, um, you know, that it's really difficult to, um, to see these numbers, hear this conversation, um, you know, have this item right after... Um, extending the the superintendent's contract i hear that i mean sometimes you know i i have to sit with that and and things don't make sense to me either but i also have know that i have to take one item at a time and i have to um i have to stay focused on um on on each item 
and just and just continue to consider all of the information that is before us, um, you know, in 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 how we how we end up voting on the item. So so I just want to thank you for that. Um, I did um, I did have some questions for you, and you were um, very um, you were great in in providing me with some with some answers. I do want to just um, touch upon a little bit on the enrollment piece. I know we lost many of our students. I think you mentioned about 1,700 students from la between la last year, right? Meaning that I, I don't know how many, uh, I didn't catch how many we were projected to re re recover. Um, and if the half percent decline was was the assumption moving forward because I think we we tend to lose about 200 students per year pre-pandemic and um, the decline in enrollment is something that is hitting um, the vast majority of the districts and by a huge margin um, San Francisco Unified lost um, 7,000 students. They went from 57,000 to, um, to 50. And they had to adopt a plan that um, essentially cut $125 million from their budget. Now that is sobering. And um, so, so I know this is happening um, statewide, but I, I do want to know um, what do we expect in terms of recovering enrollment? And if that half percent is uh, drop in enrollment is half half, um, half a percent drop from where we're at today at thirty eight thousand. Yeah, um, good questions. Yes, it's it's the half percent is based on our new number, our new benching of thirty eight thousand. So um, so to answer your question, we're not anticipating the recovery, the, the 1,700 that we lost or 1,600 in between. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were planning that it was going to be a 200 or so drop, but actually it was an additional 1,400. So we start, we are starting with our new number of 38,000 and so, you know, extra students and then basing the half percent there. Okay. Um, and so then um, how does um, TK play into this? Because TK gets rolled out, um, the first year of expansion is 22-23. How many students do we, in, how many more students do we anticipate serving um, who are four-year-olds? Yeah, we, Adrian, do, I, I'm not sure that we have that data just yet, right? We don't, we don't have that data, so that is not included in the first interim report. So as we, we get that data, then we would include that as we are moving it through second interim and, and um, definitely for budget development for 22-23. Okay, because that, that's the whole goal is that um, twofold. One is serving um, kids at an earlier um, age and providing them with, um, with early education, but two, it also provides with um, districts with the opportunity to recover some of the, um, you know, decline in enrollment that that we've been facing here in California. So I look forward to hearing um, what that growth might be. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we're going to start as as fast and as and serve as many four year olds as we can possibly sustain in our system, because there are a lot of components that go into that, including finding teachers who can teach TK. But I think that these numbers would be um, updated. Um, and hopefully will be more positive in the second interim. Um, and, and those are all the questions that I have for now. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips.
I just realized my mic was off the entire time. <laughs> that was a uh, all I vote, Mr. <laughs> We're moving on to the next. At a 9.3 fiscal recovery plan. <laughs> all right. Good evening again, President Pritchett, members of the board. And uh, presenting with me tonight again is Adrian Vargas and Jesse Castillo. Um, um, and as I shared earlier in the presentation, that our 21-22 uh, adopted budget was conditionally approved with the requirement that the board um, implement and approve a fiscal recovery plan by December 15th. So this is what this presentation is about. It's a proposed fiscal recovery plan. Next slide, please. And this is the agenda for uh, this, this presentation. We'll give you a little, a little bit of a history on the district's budget. We'll briefly review the uh, current budget update and the multi-year projections that you just heard, so we won't spend a whole lot of time, but just to remind ourselves why we need a fiscal recovery plan. Uh, we'll review the cash flow update, and we'll uh, share again the budget reductions to date. And then finally, we'll go into the uh, fiscal recovery plan overview with some proposed action items and some additional uh, considerations and then summary and uh, Q&A. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Adrian Vargas. Okay, so um, I just want to go through and review some of the, the definitions. Uh, a structural deficit occurs when ongoing expenditures exceed ongoing revenues, uh, one-time resources. Uh, that is funding that is one time and not recurring. So examples of those are donations and one time grants uh, or unexpended un funds from the prior fiscal year. So we call that carryover. Um, and then again, as a reminder from our board policy that was revised back in March uh, of this year, um, we do have a use of one time funds. And basically within that, um, where it's not to be used for ongoing. Uh, expenditures unless board approved. Um, reserves are created when revenues exceed expenditures. Um, we we uh, K-12 districts maintain reserves for multiple reasons. One, to satisfy the state required reserve for economic uncertainty and for us at Sac City, that is 2%. Um, also to maintain a, a prudent level above the required percentage to protect against um, the need to reduce service levels due to temporary revenue shortfalls or unpredicted expenditures. Um, and when I say, when I think of unpredicted expenditures, I'm thinking one-time expenditures. And then also um, in the revised board policy 3100, um, we have in there that we would increase the minimum 2% to 5% effective 2223 or after deficit is eliminated. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, the district budget has been operating or projecting a structural deficit for several years um, because of the ongoing expenditures exceeding ongoing revenues. Um, and as I think Rose had mentioned, um, in fiscal years 1920 and 2021, uh, we saw surpluses, but that was the result of one time savings due to uh, less spending during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, also, the district has managed uh, the deficit with one-time sources and reserves, um, which is not a sustainable plan uh, because as we show, or as we were trying to show in the five-year multi-year, you see that um, our fund balance depletes. Um, also, our, our um, employee salaries and benefits account for about 90% of the unrestricted budget. Um, and then as a reminder, the district's benefit structure for active employees and retire, retirees is one of the highest in the region. And with that, salaries and benefits continue to increase year over year um, when revenues are increasing at that same pace. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, this is a, a slide that we showed um, in the first interim report, and it's just a, a rehash of that table. Um, and again, we're projected to spend down 38% of our fund balance over the next two years. Next slide, please. And, and this is the same table showing uh, the multi-year projections without the one-time funds. Um, and that you can see the, the deficit spend that I talked about of 20.4 million in the second year and then 27.2 yeah. million in the third year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse, and he'll take you through the next few slides. Thanks. 
Thank you, Adrian. Uh, good evening. Um, as presented in the first interim presentation, this is the 2021-22 first interim cash flow projections. Um, as mentioned, you can see the positive cash flow balances, but it decreases um, throughout the years as uh, due to the structural deficit. Um, as, as Rose had mentioned, the importance of maintaining healthy cash flow balances to, in order to continue to meet our financial obligations. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is an overview of budget reductions to date. Um, as you can see in the leftmost column are the approval dates of those various budget reductions, um, followed by the total, the first total column, which is the ongoing reductions in total, 54.7 million. Um, and the next to that is the one-time reductions that have been approved of 12.1 million, with the rightmost column being description of what some of those reductions were within the budget. And with that, I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Chief Human Resources Officer, Katsi McCarr. Thank you. Hi, and we wanted to just with this slide quickly provide you an update with the positions that the board approved in July. And so for the past five months, what that we've been able to do in the system or not be able to do in the system with positions newly approved. So this is in addition to our standard classroom positions um, and any of the standard positions that we have. Broken down by bargaining unit, you can see what has been authorized. And what that equals is just over 208 um, FTE in there. What has been filled, about 112 or so, and what remains. So within the first five months, this is what has been able to be accomplished um, and the gaps that remain in being able to fill these positions. Again, this is in addition to the classroom positions that we have standard. And with that, I will pass it back to my budget colleagues. Thank you, Kansi. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, we're gonna move into the fiscal uh, recovery plan. This is just a um, really quick overview that uh, our plan is student-centered and guided by core values. Uh, we've shared with you that the target deficit as of now is proposed at $26.2 million. Um, and of course, we've shared that if we don't address it and it persists, that eventually we will deplete our cash balances. Um, so what we have for you this evening is a five-part plan that includes negotiated items and non-negotiated items. And, and, and I'll carefully explain them because we want to um, explain and make sure that we, um, we make it clear that there are a few items that are up for action and then additional items that are just additional considerations. And I'll clarify that as we get to those slides. And of course, as we shared, we need to take action um, this evening. It's one of the conditions of our budget being conditionally approved. Next slide, please. So this is one of the action items. This is part one. Um, and these budget adjustments would be effective July 1 of 2022 for the following year. So the first line item is uh, simply a reallocation of this expense of $5 million, a textbook adoption that's currently being paid for with base dollars or unrestricted general fund. We're proposing to move this expense to an allowable restricted resource, which is our lottery, our restricted lottery that, that is specifically used or only allowed for textbook adoptions. The other portion uh, would be funded with our, um, our ESSER money uh, for those uh, um, the instructional materials that are online materials, and those are, would be allowable expenses. The other smaller amount of 243000 is the new teacher induction program that's funded with unrestricted dollars. And we are proposing to move this over into the new grant that we just received, the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. That award goes through 2526. So those combined uh, will save off the budget $5.3 million. Of course, 5 million is one time. Nonetheless, what that does is that, that impact that that has is that it replenishes our reserves so that we build up a little bit of savings on the unrestricted side. And then, of course, as Adrian and uh, shared in the first interim report, we're also going to be aligning our staffing to our enrollment decline because we were staffed for the 39,000 and so, um, but we only uh, realized about 38,000. So we'll take that adjustment in the coming year, and it's about $7.9 million. Um, and that has been factored in already in the multi-year projections. Um, next slide, please. And so here is the impact of implementing those action items into the, um, the, the budget. So 
So for uh, 21, 22, of course, that remains the same because these action items would be effective next year for 22, 23. So in the green bars is that they're about a little past midway of this chart. You'll see um, there's the textbook adoption and there's the new teacher induction program. So for next year, that reduces the deficit from 19.4 to $14 million. And then the following year, um, that $5 million goes away because it was a one-time. It was a one-time savings, but nonetheless, it, it, it did bump up our reserves. So we see the deficit there that we shared earlier of 26.2. We reduce it by the 240, and we reduce that deficit down to 25, just about 26 million dollars. But nonetheless, it's moving in the right direction. And of course, these are our projections. Um, next slide, please. So, part two and part three are additional action items for your consideration. Part two simply states that we would continue with our current practice of reserving one-time unrestricted general fund savings that result from unexpended budget categories. In other words, we would not spend, um, let's say we rely savings from um, not, not spending down a contract for whatever reason because we just didn't need to use the contract in, in its entirety. Instead of applying that savings to a new expense, we would simply allow that savings to, to remain in our reserves so that we could use that for the future year deficits. And I apologize, there's a, a typo in there with the red line. It, just disregard that, that should have just been eliminated. And the impact of that is that in the first interim uh, financial report, we are projecting unrestricted general fund savings of $14.2 million due to the vacancies that we shared with you in operational savings. So this $14 million would simply remain in our reserves and be used for future year deficits. So the ask here is that we continue with that practice until we, we address our deficit. And then part three is similar in that any additional unrestricted uh, general fund money that we get from the state would be applied to the deficit first and not be allocated to a new expense. And this would continue until the deficit is resolved. So this also goes kind of in line with, um, with some of the board policies on one-time uh, expenditures and, and trying to build up the reserves from the three to the 5%, just in a different way. Um, this is addressing the deficit. And as I shared with you, the 22-23 state budget uh, proposal would be available in January, which is next month. So these are the three action items that are before the board tonight. The additional items are for your consideration should the district find themselves in need of considering other items. And so let's go to the next slide and I'll explain those a little bit. Um, these are items you've seen in the past that um, we costed out. Um, what would the, the uh, savings be should we see a difference in our contribution uh, towards health benefits? And the first one proposes a contribution of 75% uh, of a Kaiser rate, which would generate about $17.7 .7 million. The second one is for um, any plan um, that would generate 18.7. And then we also modeled some, um, some, some contributions for dental and vision that would generate 1.4 or 2.9. And then the last two are not necessarily um, um, proposing to, to reduce any benefits, but instead these would offer employees a cash in lieu of, in the event uh, an employee does not take an eligible benefit, health benefit, um, the district would be able to realize those savings there, assuming a 3% participation. And some of you have, may have seen these types of, of, of benefits in other um, districts or other organizations you've worked in as well. And so again, this, these are not before you to take action. These are just simply informational, just to show the impact if we were to achieve um, any of these negotiated solutions. And you've seen these in the past, the numbers have just been simply updated. Next slide, please. And then this is part five. Um, uh, there's two parts to part five. This is like part A. Um, these are to revisit additional items for reconsideration should the deficit um, be in a situation where it still needs to be addressed and we, the district is at risk of a loan. Um, you've seen these before and these are not um, favorable cuts because the impact of implementing these reductions would mean that work would not get done or items would not be purchased. The first one is a 15% central office staffing reduction, um, which would generate about $3.6 million. 
Um, that's not a whole lot given our deficit. And so, and, but 15% does seem like a very high number. So what this says is that what's remaining here is not a lot to begin with if we can only generate 3.6, you know, from a 15% calculation. And then the second part to that is a 20% uh, central office reduction to um, some of the supplies and services that the district um, provides right now. That would be 3.2. So, so not necessarily big ticket items, but nonetheless, we're just modeling them for you because they have been pre presented in other fiscal recovery plans. These are not before you for reduction tonight. They're simply informational. And those two would generate about 6.8. So um, yeah, that's that part A. Um, next slide, please. And these, again, I want to emphasize that these are not at all in any way uh, being proposed for reductions, not even should the district need to be in a situation to reduce. These are simply um, being presented as, um, as items that could possibly be funded with alternative sources. And so we've listed these here for you because these are all positions that are currently above the district's um, base allocations that we allocate, the way we allocate some of these uh, staffing um, ratios is based on the enrollment at school sites. But we know that it's not that simple for some of our schools, some of our specialty programs, some of our smaller programs, and some of our schools that require additional resources because of the population of students. Nonetheless, um, those do have to be funded. And so they've currently been funded with base uh, dollars. And so if we could find an alternative uh, funding source, the district stands to save about $7.3 million. And we have an opportunity given that we've received additional concentration dollars and given that supplemental and concentration are now kind of semi-categorical. However, that would require um, additional review and, and a, appropriate approval to, to tap into those dollars for these positions. So more to come on that. This is homework that the district does need to, to pursue, but we just wanted to share this with you as an alternative also to um, assisting the deficit. And then there's a smaller amount for some of the music program. It's only $78,000, but we would explore that as well. Um, next slide, please. And just to say that that slide that you just um, uh, reviewed earlier um, on the alternative funding source, that isn't up for your consideration for approval tonight either. That is just an idea for, for future consideration. So in summary, um, our target is $26.2 million, excluding the one-time COVID relief funds. And um, we're gonna need probably both negotiated and non-negotiated budget reductions to address the deficit completely, unless you know, the state does come in with additional dollars to offset that deficit. Um, and we're able to recover some of our enrollment. Um, and as stated, we do need board action by December 16th to um, approve this fiscal recovery plan. And our next steps are to implement those actionable items by July 1, and then we'll continue to update you on those additional considerations. And certainly by a second interim, we'll have more information for you on that. And I believe that concludes our presentation. So we are, um, we can, we can take questions now. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, I believe we have four live public comment. Yes, President Pritchett. Uh, the first public commenter is uh, May Nye. Online, okay, next. Allison Lal. All right, next comment. Daniel Darby. <laughs> next comment. Mo Kashmiri. Mo. Okay, so we have two additional after Mo. All right, go ahead. Hi, board. Uh, it looks like we're on our annual, um, you know, Groundhog Day conversation, what we say. Looks like we turned out we had a budget surplus after all, instead of a huge deficit, but the future this time will be horrible. But um, as Leticia Garcia very graciously pointed out, the state budget is looking better than expected. This whole thing is just a, you know, is just a projected budget, which seems to have been wrong. I don't know, ten out of the last ten years, um, you know. And I think it's, you know, in putting in this budget, modeling circumstances of what it would be for a one percent pay cut, what it would be for a furlough day, what it would be to cut health and benefits. That's just cool. I mean, we need to be going the opposite direction. What I saw when one of the slides she showed was a forty-two percent vacancy rate. Or, 42% of our vacancies in the SEIU positions are filled. You can't fill these positions. 
We need to be and we need to be putting together a real fiscal recovery plan that actually gets us the revenue that we need to actually provide the services we need to be able to provide. Anything less is a failure of leadership. Again, with the measure P changes in the in the rules, we can now pass ballot initiatives with a 50% vote, which is different than the two thirds that it was before. We just need to work with our city and county partners to actually make such things happen. We just barely lost the measure before I got here, I think a few years ago where we lost by uh, half a percent. We didn't meet to the 66%. We have a chance to redo those and actually not just have the same old conversation about how we're gonna cut you know, blood out of an orange and end up with a horrible district. Instead, we can have conversations about how to build the district we want instead of living in austerity and, uh, you know, and to be honest, failure, right? Because that's where we've been in the last few years. So we need to have a new paradigm where, uh, you know, I'm open to working with you all around it. And I hope you have some vision to come up with a real plan that gets us where we need to go. Thank you. Next comment, Vincent. Uh, next speaker is Terrence Gladney. Go ahead, Terrence. Thank you. Um, I noticed that recently the the language has shifted within the budget presentations to budgeted structural deficit, but yet it's returned to just a simple st structural deficit now. Um, I also noticed when we're talking about language when looking at the budget, we're willing to look at worst case scenarios, but when we're navigating the pandemic, we say that we didn't know where we would be a year ago. So it seems to be conflicting mindsets to fit the narrative that we want to push. Um, I, I think that, you know, there are opportunities to really improve the efficiency of our organization. Um, you know, when we think about the high number of public records act uh, requests, a lot of those are probably just for things that are covered in school board meetings, but we don't have a, a, a you know, a good repository of meetings that are available, whether via YouTube channel or hosted on a native server and made available just for people to consume and extract the data that they want. Um, as a service provider to two school sites in the district, I requested a district email. Um, I try to provide content to students, but the internal network doesn't allow me to do so. So there's manual processes that have to be undertaken to allow that instead of enabling the native Xfinity Wi-Fi uh, WLAN or even segmenting traffic onto a guest network, which would be an automated process. Um, Speaking of that, you know, again, uh, I, I, I went to be verified as a service provider and was told that my fingerprints weren't in the system. I've been volunteering since 2009. I questioned it. They double checked. Still not in the system. It took a trip to CERNA for me to get them to realize that I've been in the system since 2010. But yet in the conversations and emails that went back and forth, they told me that my dead son who passed away in 2008, that was never a student in this district, was verified in the system. Those are operational inefficiencies that don't require additional dollars. They just require our district to work a little bit smarter. So when we say that we have staffing shortages and people are doing things manually that we've invested in via technology, that's not that's not a good use of our district Thank funds. So let's tighten those let's tighten those processes up a little bit and then see where we land. And um, just lastly, I think in part two of the fiscal recovery plan, it was addressed as far as like teacher vacancies. So I hope that that represents um, and I think it represents like, you know, what we said that we need as far as teacher positions, but were unfilled. So those dollars went unspent, let's say, for the first few months. I would prefer that they're spent on students this year instead of rolling to a reserve because that's what they're budgeting Thank you, for. Karen. So. Mm -hmm. Last speaker is Ingrid Hutchins. Hello, um, I heard you guys say tonight how important it was to um, put money in to attracting and retaining a superintendent. I want to make sure that you understand that is um, equally, if not more important to attract and retain the people who actually work with our students. Um, we don't have enough teachers. We have many students, thousands of students every day who don't have a certificated teacher in their classroom. We have students who are still on a waiting list for um, independent study. We have students who every day are, are having to deal with um, being at a school where a custodian is out and they can't be replaced. They can't get to school because there's not enough school bus drivers. Their principal is out and there's no one to help manage um, the, the behavior at school. There are so many issues that need to be solved by having enough employees and we can't attract employees when your 
recovery plan will cut employee benefits. Um, we, we've got to be smarter than that. You, you understand how competition works, how the business world works, and you need to apply that to what we're going to do to attract our employees. Um, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm very frightened what fall is going to look like for us. Um, I, I don't have much faith that we're going to have the number of staff we have now from listening to what my colleagues are saying. They're, they don't want to, to deal with this anymore. And we need to find a way that we're going to fix that. Um, this budget, um, I, you know, I, I see what, what, what Rose is saying about um, trying to, to prevent the structural deficit, but it's like this ghost we keep chasing. We keep hearing about this deficit, but um, we haven't had a fiscal deficit in the past few years. So we need to just get real about what we actually need to provide for our students, and we need to get away from this um, talk thank, of deficit you, until it actually proves to be true. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last comment. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll open this up for board discussion. Member Garcia. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Rose, for the presentation and for the different parts um, that are being proposed. I think for the parts that were informational, um, just for future reference, maybe we can be clear about that in the, um, in the information, um, just so that we don't unnecessarily um, alarm people. Um, you know, who are, um, who are paying close attention just so that we're, we're clear as to, as to what we're working on, um, what's before us. I did, um, I also wanted to um, just appreciate that your, your team is looking for ways to shift costs from one funding source to others that are, um, you know, where, where these expenditures are allowable expenditures. So, the textbook adoption moving from the LCFF base to the lottery um, fund that that's makes perfect sense. Um, I do have a, a question. I have a couple of questions. I do have a question about, I think it's part two, maybe part three, about the savings either due to vacancies or if additional um, unrestricted funds come come the district's way that those be applied and not be applied to new expenditures until the deficit is resolved. So um, I just wanna make sure that that comes before the board and the board has final um, decision on that because um, I think um, it's just really important that we continue to, to balance, um, you know, closing the deficit, you know, minimizing our deficit spending but also um, making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. So I just, I just wanna make sure that they get a clear answer that that decision ultimately comes back to the board. Yes, and member Garcia, they, it comes back to you um, just like it did in the first interim where we disclosed what the savings was um, as a first interim. And you know, the board, uh, you, you can clearly see how, how we generated um, additional savings and or, or, or we were able to um, increase our reserves this year. Part of it was savings and there was a little bit of unrestricted revenue. So, yeah, we'll, and we'll be sure to make sure that we highlight that so that you specifically see that, you know, this is what's coming out of this reporting period if there is a, a little bit of an extra surplus. Okay, and I know sometimes um, those savings are because, you know, a hire didn't happen, you know, I mean, you, the intent was to hire someone and that just didn't happen. So, and then I want to go to the slide um, that um, Kansi, um showed, the new grant funded positions. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to understand um, this number of positions that we've authorized, that is separate and apart from you know, the, the, I guess, um, the reduction in positions due to the, the massive declining enrollment. Are those, that's, that's those correct. are separate, that's right? Yes. Okay, so we're going to continue to hire these positions, even though we have to balance, right size the, um, our budget to reflect that we're going to have 1,700 fewer students. Okay. That's correct. Okay, thank you. 
Is that your last question? Remember oh, yes. Said? Sorry. Okay. Oh, Member Phillips, did I see your light on? No. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't skip over you. Member Murawski? I know it's very late. I'll try to be brief. Thank you. <laughs> Um, just a couple things on this, and I didn't speak on the budget item because I, would, I thought I would just wait. But um, so I just want to to be really, really super clear with everyone and for ourselves of what we what we are um, considering and approving um, tonight, or at least asking for approval of. So the the FRP, the fiscal recovery plan. So really, what we're kind of taking action on is part one, part two, and part three. Where part one is just a fund shift. It was funded with unrestricted general funds. Now these things are still being funded, but with a different funding source that is a restricted funding source. So that frees up some, some savings. Okay. The, the second part of that one, though, is, is this staffing adjustment to enrollment decline. So that is a, a $7.9 million reduction. That's not really part of the fiscal recovery plan action item because that's already included in the budget. That's already kind of built into the budget just in terms of we have this, matter, this number of students. That number of students translate to we need this number of staff. So, um, oh, go ahead. No, it's, that's correct, Mark Malowski, yes. Oh, okay. So, I guess the one thing that I am wondering about this as we, because I know it's December, the, the district and schools are building their budgets for the following um, school year. And I, I really just want to um, echo and highlight a lot of the comments um, that we've heard today from our certificated and classified staff about the crisis we're facing. Um, the need to attract and retain staff. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And um, so just in terms of, I, I, I feel like there are not enough students or are not, not enough adults in our system. Like we need more adults, right? And we have the money. We have federal dollars to be able to, to fund more adults to, to take care of our kids and, and to... Um, you know, help them meet their potential in, in all the different ways we want to do. So um, I guess what I'm asking is the 7.9 million in reductions that assumes like closing positions that, that we don't need. But I feel like we need to maintain the people in our system that we have. Like, I don't feel like we can afford to lose anyone at this point. So I know that's a, maybe a little bit of a different conversation um, because there's like technically like, okay, you don't need, you literally don't need a history teach, a history social science teacher because there's just not enough like demand of students for that particular, spe so you need to like close that. Like I get that part, but in terms of the people in our system, uh, in terms of how we manage, you know, the layoff process and closing positions, but I think we then need to like create them somewhere else because we have so much demand right now for like our students need everything. We heard it. We heard it tonight. I mean, we see it. Um, so I, I, that's not you know part of part of the uh, question here. But I just want to let you know as we're going to you know build those budgets, we need to figure out like how we can put more adults in the system and you know, and retain the staff that we have in, in the sense that both just from like the, the overall um, retention of, of our staff, but also just to keep the people. Like there's no reason to me with the, with the dollars that we have from the feds that any, that any um, employee in our system that we can't fun, find a place for them to continue serving our students next year. So whatever that looks like, however we get there, I feel like that's what that's the direction that I would want to see us go in as we build our budgets. So I'm going to stop and just ask if that makes if that makes sense. Yes. Is that yes. articulated? Okay, okay. But there are there are um, union uh, preventions. Please turn on your mic. Oh. There's, 
employees are not fungible like that though because of uh um employment rest or re uh, restrictions understood so there's lists that would be created if you lay off certain positions um but understanding all of those restrictions and things that we would have to do i think we just should be creative to see where we can where we can keep people to serve our students just because there's just not enough there's just not enough of anyone anywhere and, and board members if i can just mention one of the reasons why we chose to include the slide that member garcia was asking about is because we call those grant funded positions because we we classified them in a way where in june when we adopted that action uh, we indicated that we would strive to find ways to maintain those levels of investments after our one-time funds were exhausted. Uh, in fact, we even, I think, spoke about making an exception to the resolution that the board, the board policy, sorry, that the board passed about the use of one-time funds. And you directed me to give you updates on where we stood with negotiations and such. And I thought that it was important that we, um, give you an update on where we stand with the hiring of those positions and in some ways i think what i'm hearing member morowski and please let me know if, if 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 i'm incorrect here is those are positions that perhaps we would want to continue to try to fund so long as we can identify viable candidates fill the positions by um reducing elsewhere where we might not need a position but we may uh uh, be committed to continuing to hire more social workers mm -hmm. while we're struggling to find uh, find social workers, but not give up on 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 doing that. And you can see that um, you know half a year into this fiscal year, we're at fifty four percent of 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 filling those positions. And time is going to continue to pass, yeah. and we are going to continue to try to fill those positions. Um, but these positions, if you remember, in June when you took action, we were very deliberate in what we thought were the wisest investments based on the needs that we foresaw our students needing. Um, and it also, I think, is a reflection, not so much, and uh, Kansi and her team that do an, a, a fantastic job at, at, at recruiting and posting and such. This is where I think the, the, the challenges of staffing shortages across the state and nation are, are being manifested. And so, we are not going to give up. We want to continue to fill these positions. Um, but as we start looking into the, the season that we all dread of, of, of resolutions that we have to adopt for potential layoffs, I think this is a, a list that we want to keep coming back to and providing updates to you. Yeah, I feel like there, there should be a place for everyone in our system. Um, and so that's, that's a direction that I would appreciate us going in so um, I just wanted to real quick just go through the other three parts that we're actually approving so that's part one so I said my piece part two is just applying general fund savings that happen to to the deficit which seems like a real no-brainer and then part three is applying any unrestricted general funds provided by the state to the deficit which also seems like a no-brainer so I feel I feel like very confident uh, about you know the the fiscal recovery plan. Um, in terms of the part four and part five is sort of um, additional considerations. Um, I do I guess the only thing I'd say is I you know I I do appreciate what has been shared tonight about just retention and um, attracting um, our staff to our district because you know we're we're in a different place now. You know, this the, the, the labor market is very different. Um, you know, so we, we do have to take a close look and make sure that our compensation our total compensation, as you noted, is is generous. Um, and we, we need to make sure, you know, overall that, that we stay competitive in order to attract and retain retain um, uh, and value our employees. So um, I think that's uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Member Morowski. If I don't see any of the board comments going once, going <laughs> twice, going two times. Okay. Uh, this is an action item. And can I get a motion? 
All right, then a motion on the table. Second. 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 All right. Thank you. Student preferential vote. All right. Superintendent roll call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Aye. Great. Thank you. Item 9.4, approve educator effectiveness block, effectiveness block grant, EEBG. Okay, thank you, uh, President Pritchett. We, you guys, uh, we presented this to you back in November on the 18th, um, the first hearing, and now it's coming back to you for approval as required in order for us to receive this grant. Um, and uh, not, not much has changed. The only uh, change that we have in this presentation is that um, Chief uh, McCarn will present to you guys some information on the metrics as requested. And if we can move on to slide, I believe, number five, I'm not going to repeat. This is the same information you got last time, the compliance and the years of the grant, the dollar amounts. Those are all the same as the last presentation. So if we can go to slide five, please. Uh, one more slide, sorry. Six or seven. <laughs> one more. Eight. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> it, it, no, I, I believe it is slide eight. Thank you. Sorry about that. Slide eight and um, it might be slide 10. Oh, my goodness. okay. Okay. Um, good evening, board members. As we go through this, this again is uh, very similar to what you saw previously. What we did was just add in the requested metrics. We talked about within each of those areas what that might look like, and we wanted to share some of our initial thinking with you as you consider this for approval. At the bottom of this slide, as you may recall, the focus is absolutely on retention, on recruitment, recruitment and retention focus, every single item. And as we put some key performance indicators in there, we put the focus area, we put the KPI, and we put the rationale. So if you'll turn to the next slide. This is the portion that is the same. Last time we talked about administrator coaching and partnership program that would tie to other areas of improvement in the SIR and other areas of, um, of improvement district-wide anyways. If you go to the next slide, you'll see where we listed proposed key performance indicators, what we would do in focusing on this retention area and the why. So what we would take in terms of uh, retention data, looking at various groups and why we would need to do it given the human capital investment in the area. I won't read every single piece, but I do think it's important enough to highlight what they are given the board's request last time and to show how we were looking at these grant funds, not only as absolutely a wonderful opportunity to enhance educator effectiveness, but to tie into other initiatives and other things that are taking place with that focus of recruitment and retention. Next slide, please. We talked about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA pathway to teaching and working with our uh, local IHE university colleagues. And as you can see here, the key performance indicators um, noted their baseline targets for each one, but really pointing out two important process steps. First, working with the universities to create the actual pipeline to teaching profession, and then secondly, measuring what the results of those efforts are. Next slide, please. We talked with you last time about supporting some of our teachers who are joining us um, from out of country with visas, work visas, H-1B, J-1 visas. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see we broke up the focus areas in terms of recruitment, what that looks like, and retention with regards to key performance indicators and being able to track the effectiveness and the use of the grant funds towards the larger goal. Next slide, please. Just very quickly on advertising, I don't know how much needs to be said on this one, fairly self-explanatory, but again, uh, being able to measure um, the effectiveness of us using the funds in this way to increase our presence, our social presence particularly. Next slide, please. We also talked about career pathways, both for teachers and for administrators. 
for teacher leaders to work towards becoming administrators and for classified individuals in our system to become teachers. Um, one of the things that we looked at, certainly with local universities, but looking at our own workforce, educating sectors of our workforce to look at how many of our paraeducators are two years or less away from a bachelor's degree and being able to work with specific groups that we um, haven't been able to in the past through the use of these really specific funds. Additionally, we know our local um, IHE partners such as Sac State have a child development VA, which would help with our transitional kinder and preparing us for we know those needs that are going to come. Next slide, please. We also talked about coaching and partnerships for our classified staff. Our hard to fill high need areas are not only in certificated. We absolutely have a high need in recruiting and retaining bus drivers, instructional aides, food service assistance, childcare attendance were some of the ones that we highlighted based on the data that we have in our system with regards to uh, both the recruitment and retention. And as you can see here, um, the indicators that would help us rate our intention rate, retention rate in, um, in more effective ways than we're able to now. Next slide, please. And the last one highlighted here is the professional learning for our substitutes, both certificated and classified and creating ways to not only show value, add value to increase efficiencies and effectiveness, but also absolutely to affect retention. We already look at our substitute pools um, in terms of who has what's so close that they need to get to the next level, whether it's an additional um, authorization, whether it is a, an additional credential or perhaps a permit um, that they might need in order to meet that next step. And so with this, we would be able to do that in more strategic, more targeted, more effective way. And again, using these indicators to help us measure that. So that was really quick because I know it's late and you saw these sure. exact slides with the except, um, except the addition of the, the indicators. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of since you specifically requested them. And it was really helpful in helping us pull things together. Okay. So with that, um, we recommend approval and are ready for questions and answers. Thank you. And we have a two public comment. Yes, we do. However, Daniel Darby is not here. And Renee Webster Hawkins, I don't see her online either. Okay. I'll open this up for board discussion or a motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second student preferential vote. All right, all in favor, or not all in favor. Superintendent. <laughs> Just playing. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Moralski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. All right, thank you. All right, uh, item 10.2, public hearing, second reading of board policy 61, 6159.2. Uh, non-public, non-secretarian school and agency services for special ed education. Oh, I'm Wait. sorry. I, I lie. It's 10.1 for second reading of right, revised policy 6159, individualized education plan. I apologize. No, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, so this is our second reading of our revised board policy around um, individualized education plans. Um, as mentioned before in a previous uh, presentation in November, this is linked to our significant disproportionality work and is an action item to do a review of our policies, procedures, and practices. Um, so this is the start of that work and our group has uh, started off with these two board policies. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, based off of uh, feedback, um, we have revised again a little bit of this board policy um, and, and it's intended to provide a frame for how uh, IEPs are developed for students with disability um, and this update provides uh, uh, alignment with current uh, federal and state regulations uh, ed code and identified best practices next slide please um, you know, as I mentioned before, we, we utilize more uh, special education language uh, within the board policies. We talked about meaningful progress, continuum of supports. We aligned with some major cases 
in special education, like the Andrew F case, for instance, um, and further defining out the importance of uh, parent and guardian participation in the development and review of IEPs. Uh, so our team goal here is to continue to, to work on these board policies uh, as the year goes on, uh, leading to kind of bigger work around the administrative, administrative regulations, which will be uh, sort of what it sounds like, looks like, and feels like um, with these board policies. So uh, for the second reading, uh, an update uh, that we wanted to highlight uh, based off of your feedback uh, is the following on the next slide. Uh, so, uh, what, one of the things that we did is to, um, is in the intro paragraph is to use in light of student circumstances uh, instead of based on a student's assess needs because that mirrors language within the Andrew F case. Um, uh, just to, you know, as kind of mentioned before, just align with that language because it is uh, substantial language uh, in special education. Uh, additionally, we looked at utilizing general education instead of regu regular education across the entire board policy. Uh, and then lastly is uh, making a small adjustment to uh, utilizing unique needs instead of assess needs, which uh, further aligns to federal and state law. And so uh, with that, that is the update for the second reading. Thank you. And do we have any public comment? We have one, Renee Webster Hawkins. She's not on. Okay, perfect. And uh, do we have any board comment or motion? All right, I have a motion and a second. Student preferential vote. All right, Superintendent Roll Call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Villa. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Member Phillips. Thank you. Um, item 10.2, this is the real one, public hearing. Second reading proposed, proposed board policy 6159.2, non-public, non-secretary in school and agency services for special education. Okay, right. thank you very much. Yeah, so a uh, very similar, um, uh, same same frame of what, of what we're working on. Uh, so we can continue on. I can just give you sort of an update on the second reading. Um, to, to save us some time here. Um, we, we further kind of, just based off of your feedback, um, we, we kind of went down, uh, reviewed this one again, and kind of said, how, how do we beef it up even further when it comes to the use of a stronger uh, student-centered uh, language? Um, and so that it, it makes more sense to what our goal is when it comes to uh, NPS and NPA services, that it isn't just, oh, when, you know, uh, when it's not available within the district, we contract out. What does that mean when in, in the frame of FAPE and least restrictive environment and all of that? Um, so that's really sort of the update for this one. Um, I will share that with both this policy and the, the previous one. Um, I know that there was uh, Member Morosky uh, mentioned, uh, would we be sharing this with CAC? We did share it with our CAC uh, at the last CAC meeting uh, early uh, in early December, um, and it's linked with our notes uh, where folks can review it and all of that. And then um, we're also looking at expanding our SIGDIS team to include more members of our CACs to uh, participate in this process going further. So they're, they're more uh, involved with uh, the review of board policies and then uh, the administrative regulations. So that's right. generally the update for this one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, uh, we have one public comment. Renee Webster Hawkins, not Okay, uh, can I get a, a thing? Oh, we have one public comment. Oh. oh, okay, who raised their hand? Okay. Hello. Hi, hi, Tawny. Hi, um, I just wanna make it really clear that um, Gio has done a really good job bringing together um, the voices of parents on this and the voices of parents with who are students of color, who have multiple children in the district, who have faced um, special education, so that, that these policies reflect the voice of those parents. And I, I just wanna make that really clear that that needs to be elevated and it needs to be expanded and expanded in a way that the parents know that it's happening. Um, because had I not been a part of it, I would have never known. And it's important. It's very, 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 very important. So whatever you can do 
to vote on this and then elevate his work to the parents to give him access to more parents who have more severe children, uh, parents of color who have, um, these policies have been used against their children to move children into special ed and cause disproportionality, do it. Um, because the more that you can do this, the more alignment that you will have with your community and not, and, and better listening to the things that you're putting forth. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. All right. I have a, I believe I had a motion and a second on the table. Student, I did, right? Yeah. Okay. Student preferential vote. All right. Superintendent roll call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Aye. Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Aye. Member Phillips? All right. Thank you, Gio. Have a good night. <laughs> All right. Uh, item 11.0, communications. 11.1, .1, employee organization reports. Do we still have SCT on the line? Um, I have one for a Ramsey Odom, but I do not see them online. Okay, is Ramsey one. Odom the public comment? Yes. Okay, go ahead. He's not oh, he's online. Not online. He's oh, not I online. I understand. And SCTA is not online. SCIU, he's no, none of our bargaining partners. Mo is still there? Okay, Mo, we want to give a report for SCIU. Sure. Uh, I just want to say, you know, we've been in bargaining, um, but we're not getting any responses back. The district is saying they don't want to respond to us about economic proposals and like, you know, like, what are we doing? It doesn't seem like it makes sense. We're hoping uh, we want the board to step up and, you know, we want to actually be able to get an agreement and, find, and end some of this labor uh, unrest instead of having to wrap up. I do also, you know, I forgot to, I was not able to read a statement from uh, one of our special aid assistants. Uh, and I'd like to do that now. His name is David Wong, um, and he, he says he works as an instructional aide at Luther Burbank High School. Um, and he said, uh, I work with disabled students who use wheelchairs, students with autism, and students with learning disabilities. I'm a six-hour employee who earns $20.49 an hour. Um, after reduction, my monthly paycheck is $1,636.57. I'm a 10-month employee who works in the extended year program. So in 2020, I earned about $26,000. Um, according to articles uh, in, written by Laura Hammer, welfare recipients in the state of California received 35,287 welfare benefits. Um, and the sad truth is that some of us are in worse situations than welfare recipients in the state of California. Um, the school board and superintendent Jorge Aguilar want to propose benefit reductions and salary reductions for classified employees. The classified employees, uh, you know, don't can't afford to have their health benefits or their salary reduced. Uh, they do, we deserve good health benefits and a living wage because we're the ones who help uh, do the labor to make the system operate. Um, if the school district has the fund, uh, you know, has enough money to pay the superintendent and other executives huge bonuses and, you know, all kinds of benefits and raises, then uh, the least they can do is make sure they do it for all the employees, especially the lowest paid, like the classified workers. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Mo. All right. Um, item 11.2, District Advisory Committees. Do we have any of the advisory committees reporting? Yes, we have uh, Vanessa from the LCAP. Okay. I believe she's on. Hi, Vanessa. Go right ahead. Stay in it for the long evening. haul. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, yes. No, I didn't want to let my PAC members down, so decided okay, to hang on you. here. But <laughs> Good mean evening to everyone, Superintendent Aguilar, President Pritchett, and board members. Special shout out to board member Rhodes. Uh, on behalf of the LCAP Parent Advisory Committee, I'm excited to provide an update on our last couple of meetings. Uh, since our last update in uh, November, the LCAP PAC has had the opportunity to interact with district staff via Zoom. In November, we went with the staff from the academic office, and our conversation included the district's efforts in the areas of restorative restart, implementation of NTSS, universal design for learning, anti-racism equity work. Um, although it was great to hear from the district staff the great programs and assessments the district has worked to make available, a continued concern for the PAC continues to be the voluntary nature of schools to engage or not engage with these tools. 
that PAC wants to continue expressing our concern that the voluntary nature of using or not using these assessments and resources will continue to lead to inequity out, in, in, inequitable outcomes and will negatively impact the effective implementation of MTSS. And we cannot keep waiting for schools to opt in, especially when it comes to the use of common assessments in ELA and math to monitor each student's progress. Um, then this past Monday, the LCAP PAC had the opportunity of meeting with staff from uh, student support and health services to learn more about uh, foster youth services, homeless youth services, suicide prevention, and school-based mental health services. Um, it was clear to the PAC that staff is doing, an in is doing incredible work with a limited number of staff to address the vast mental health and behavioral health needs of our student population. Uh, the PAC was impressed with the use of risk assessment tools and suicide prevention trainings being used throughout the district. Um, a concern expressed by the PAC is that funding for mental health and behavioral health services on school sites are currently structured into their SIPSAs and how this is leading to triage and crisis moments with little to no actual services being provided for students and families on an ongoing basis. The PAC expressed a desire to see further collaboration with community partners, including SCOE, uh, and school sites to provide services for children. School-based mental health services uh, does not necessarily mean that the district is paying for these services. School-based services can also mean that the school is simply a common and safe ground where these services can be rendered by partnering programs that hire and staff therapists, including MFTs, LCSWs, and LPCCs. It's not just a matter of the district hiring more LCSWs, although that is also clearly needed. It is also the district maintaining relationship with community organizations so that these organizations can render services to students in a space students already know, that being their own school site. Um, in our most recent meeting, the PAC also discussed the ongoing efforts to reach out to school sites. Members shared examples of practices they found successful, as well as challenges and barriers in attempting to establish relationship with school sites. The PAC is maintaining its goal to increase our understanding of program implementation and ongoing needs at the school site level. The learning from these experiences will help to inform the PAC's overall input and recommendations to the board. In the coming new year, the PAC will be developing our initial input and recommendations for the LCAP development. Um, so that's the update. So as always, thank you so much for your work and dedication to our district and our students. And let's continue to strive in making our lofty goals and ideas a reality for our children here in SCUSD to model for our children that all great things are accomplished through hard work and that we can get there together. So thank, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your commitment, Vanessa. Our next public commenter is Tony Loken from the African American Advisory Board. Okay. Good evening, Superintendent Aguilar and board members. I'm Tony Loken and I'm the current um, vice chair of the African Black African American Advisory Board. I'd like to take this opportunity to update the board. Um, Superintendent Aguilar, trustee members Garcia, Phillips, Rhodes, Associate Superintendent Allen, and accompanying district personnel, thank you for accepting the invitation and attending the Black African American Board's um, December 14th special meeting. The purpose of this meeting, just to update those who were not there, was a way to stress the urgent needs to respond to and provide progress made towards the demands previously submitted regarding the Kit Carson incident, the West Campus incident, and the mandatory professional development. The Black African American um, Board, or AAAB as we like to call ourselves, is unconditionally and unapologetically committed to it for advocating for the social, emotional, and academic well being of Black African American scholars. To this end, follow up questions. Um, Requesting additional information will be submitted by us with the expectation that they are to be responded to in the requested timeframes and are satisfactorily resolved. It is also imperative that this body become familiar with and keep in the forefront all decisions made, the board, um, that you keep the African American Advisory Task Force recommendations at hand. As Superintendent Aguilar stated, you are my other me, which I absolutely love this. And I think I'm going to carry this superintendent for quite some time. We must all continue to work to change the current practices and to confront 
and interpret inequities that exist to level the playing field and provide opportunities for everyone to learn, to grow, and to reach their greatness. As a reminder, the board approved recommendations were as followed to establish a district-wide Black African-American parent, caregiver, and student body, establish a Black African-American Student Achievement Task Force, implementation, accountability, parent engagement, steering committee, and subcommittees, require sites with over 5% variance on suspension rate disproportionality to develop and implement a plan to reduce suspensions to, a, to at least the district average. Four, eliminate willful defiance suspensions. This was Senate Bill 419. Five, implement multiple measures to assess student progress in order to identify students in need of intervention and prioritize those needs. Um, six, impl implement research-based intervention, acceleration strategies to close persistent learning gaps. Seven, provide school to college and school to career experiences utilizing community stakeholders, career training, university shadowing, mentoring, and in internships. Eight, divest from future funding for school resource officers and reinvest in alternatives. Nine, provide school to college and school to career experiences utilizing community stakeholders, career training, university shadowing, mentoring, and internships. Divest from future funding of, oh, I said this one. Create a district-wide study team tasked to review, monitor K through 12 special education. Um, adopt and implement curriculum that includes and reflects Black African-American experience. Provide professional development addressing inequitable disciplinary practices and mandate 100% faculty and student attend and staff attendant. Eliminate pre K through third grade suspensions. Although it's eliminated, it's still happening. And then finally increase black African-American teachers from 109 to 150. I say all of these because all night I've been listening and nowhere is it specifically called out Black African-American students for who they are, Black African-American students and families. And everywhere that I see metrics, I don't see called out specifically Black African-American students and families. You, in order for us to see and hear that you are with us, we need to see us in the literature, in the metrics, in everything that you say. Thank you, Ms. Logan. If you could please wrap it up. Yeah, and everything that you say and do to call us out so that we know that you hear us and that we are there. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. All right. Do we have any others? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, all right. And 11.3, uh, superintendent's report. I will be very brief, uh, President Pritchett. Um, I was wondering we have this there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> I'm not in my head. Neither am I. So I, I just had to double check myself. <laughs> there you got it. Uh, board members, um, I, I, I'll uh, shorten my comments here um, just because I do want to make sure that um, our community is aware that our nutrition services department is hosting. Um, a very exciting and much needed um, service for our families this coming Monday and next Monday. Um, and I want to thank our partners at Sacramento Food Bank, Family Services, Kaiser, JJB, Family Farms, Beanball, Fresh Innovations. Um, we are going to be hosting curbside food distribution events. Uh, again, this is on Monday, December 20th, and again, Monday, December 27th from 9 to 1030 a.m., um, boxes will be available for students, for staff, for our community, uh, limiting one per vehicle while supplies last um, at a number of our school sites across the entire district. Abraham Lincoln, Bowling Green, Edward Kimball, Alger Creek, John Still, Pony Express, Washington, Wilsey Wood, Woodbine. All of this information, uh, board members and community members, is on our website. We will continue to 
promote it via social media outlets, but I would um, just encourage our board members to also notify each of our constituents. Um, you heard earlier today from our team, uh, we are going to continue to focus on doing outreach and increasing vaccination rates uh, for all of our students, our district families, our community neighbors, and we'll continue uh, to do that into the new year. For now, just uh, mark on your calendars on January 4th from 2 to 4, uh, we will be doing a vaccination and flu clinic for ages 5 and up at Peter Burnett. On the 13th, which is our board meeting from 3 to 7, uh, we're going to have a COVID-19 vaccination clinic for ages 5 and up at Earl Warren. Um, and our district clinics are now offering, and Member Morawski made a point uh, to encourage our families, we will be offering booster shots for the newly approved age group of 16 and 17-year-old students, um, which have been called crucial uh, given the research that has been done by uh, a number of government entities. Uh, and the last thing, of course, is I want to congratulate um, our uh, executive uh, committee members that were voted in this evening, uh, President Pritchett as president, Member Garcia as first vice president, and uh, Member Rhodes as um, second vice president. So congratulations. Thank you, Superintendent. All right. Uh, there was no public comment on any of these items, right? Okay. 11.4 president support i'll keep mine really brief as well um i just wanted to thank you all for um once again your confidence and serving as your president i look forward to this coming year and congratulations to my newly inducted um executive team members um and uh um a couple things um first uh when we come back in the new year we'll see a couple changes on the dais um i had the privilege of um, sitting on a panel and speaking at the CSBA conference to about 80, 90 students. I don't even know how many students were in that room. It was a lot. Um, and it was very heartening to me listening to the students. I know our student board member was able to do the virtual setting as well. Um, and uh, But I spoke to many of the students. And one thing that really struck a chord to me, on me, um, that's been in my mind a lot, is um, the comment that I had a couple times about student board members feeling like they're not part of the board. And I've thought a lot about this um, lately. And when we come back um, in the new year, I've decided that the student board member will be sitting next to me um, on, on the dais. And um, so be, be prepared. <laughs> we want you to feel you're, you're the reason why we're here. So we want you to feel included. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, I just want to put in a formal request with the superintendent. Um, as we know, we've had several scary experiences at our school sites. And just to name a few, the violent fight at Hiram Johnson, Burbank, the TikTok challenges on school shootings, and the actual school shootings that we've seen nationally. Um, and so um, I do not feel comfortable with student safety at this moment, um, to be honest with you. And as I sat here tonight, I showed the superintendent I was receiving messages of, um, uh, uh, that people were sending me about Rosemont High School and pe um, kid, uh, the kid yelled that there's a shooter on campus today and kids went running. And now parents are not going to send their kids to school tomorrow because they're scared. Um, so um, with that said, I'm formally requesting that at an upcoming board meeting that we have a discussion about school safety and the possibility of um, talking to SAC PD officers about um, being at, at the school events, number one, football games, dances, those type, or I shouldn't say just football, games, dances, any types of events at school campuses. And then second, bringing back roaming officers, not on campus. That way they're in the area when emergencies happen. Um, we know that the response times are not good right now. Um, and then... Uh, uh, and then I'm also happy to have a conversation about additional safety calls um, of protocols as we move forward. All right, that's the only thing I had. Um, student 11.5, uh, student member report. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to say that I attended the CSBA virtual panel and I actually gave a piece of advice to other student board member about um, imposter syndrome in the board and feeling like you don't deserve the job. So I really appreciate um, the changes that were going to be made and I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, and other than that, I would also 
like to add on to what you said about school safety. Um, this year has been really tough, and thank you to all students, teachers, staff, and also um, parents for sticking around and being strong. See you next year. <laughs> Aw, thank you. Thank you. All right, 11.6, information sharing by board members. Uh, Member Garcia. Um, thank you. I would share that um, some of us still struggle with imposter syndrome in all <laughs> aspects of life. So sometimes that doesn't go away. Um, I did want to um, just highlight a couple of exciting news. Um, one is celebrating um, the big state funds, $1 million from the state budget, thanks to Assemblymember Kevin McCarty and Senator Richard Pan. This $1 million is for Hiram Johnson to um, complete a golf facility um, center. And this is going to be a state-of-the-art golf facility. There's no other one in the country. It's the first one, um, obviously, in California. So it, will, um, it would close out the funding gap that we have. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and also um, to begin the work on a CTE program similar to the one at Rosemont in partnership with some of our trades, um, with um, plumbers, engineers, um, et cetera. So that's been a very successful program there. And Hiram Johnson has been asking for a similar program for several years now. I will um, also ask um, for, um, for meetings with staff, with district staff, to make sure that um, we're moving these dollars as quickly as possible to complete these programs, um, especially the golf facility at, um, at Hiram Johnson. And I also want to um, just bring it back to some uh, public comments that we've heard earlier regarding um, just really uh, thinking about how we are working at our school sites and then um, figuring out how we can maximize um, other opportunities in in this particular um, case, uh, the, the baseball field. How do we, as we're working on, on, on finishing the golf facility, how do we take into consideration um, how some of that work can also um, benefit um, advancing the work on the, on the baseball field at Hiram Johnson? So I also attended the CSBA conference in person. This was my first year uh, in person as assembly delegate. Um, board member Rhodes and I um, attended in, in that capacity representing Sac City. Um, so a two, three hour uh, or day conference became a five day conference. Uh, yeah, five day conference. A lot of work happens, a lot of learning. It's essentially the um, association for school board members so that we can learn. It's our professional development opportunity. I learned a lot about OPEB and the, um, the liability that that essentially has on school budgets. I learned a lot about um, just budgets um, from the board member's perspective. I learned um, about superintendent evaluation um, and what to look for and, and what is a fair process for all parties involved. And then um, I also attended a, a workshop on community outreach efforts. So I know that today some of us had the opportunity to um, record um, some messages on behalf of the of, you know, school district related to vaccines. But I do have a request to, um, to think about um, how we can come up with a more, um, uh, I guess, structured um, way of doing this that involves board members, maybe on a rotating basis so it's not the same board members all the time that we can um, send out messages to parents in our, in our district. So um, I don't know if those are once or twice a month, but we report out maybe the top three things um, that, we, that the board did or that our district is doing. And again, we can take turns so that everybody has an opportunity. And then lastly, I do want to also um, request um, an update on school safety. Um, I know that a lot of the um, the um, issues that we're dealing with um, go back to behavioral issues. Um, and then this is just kind of the way that things are manifesting. It's, it's our kids have been out of school for so long and um, we're seeing this, um, you know, across the grade span. Sometimes it's as, as early as second graders. 
but um, but certainly in our high schools, I know I hear about fights in middle schools. So um, so I am requesting also that um, a board update come back to us, and um, I, I am particularly interested in in knowing what the needs are. What is it that we're doing as a district to address those needs in the um, immediate um, uh, immediately? And then what is it that we're doing, um, you know, in the, in the near future and then longer term? And how this all ties into um, some of the investments in um, mental health, because I think it's, it's all rooted in, um, in, in those needs as well. So, so echoing the, the, the request um, of board member Pritchett, um, and, um, and then, but I, I'm looking for a more comprehensive um, sort of plan. Um, so, and with that, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Member Garcia. Member Phillips? I guess I just want to circle back on my original comment regarding SROs. I do that now? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that, just like President Pritchett said and Vice President, first oh. Vice President Garcia okay. said, it's important for us to look into the safety of our students. Um, we need to look into also the safety of our black and brown students. Um, so when we have this discussion, when we get this on the, the, the uh, agenda as soon as possible, hopefully, um, I hope that we have a, a, a really good conversation about the emotional impact that SROs, law enforcement officers can have on black and brown students in our school. Because once again, that is, you know, one of our higher populations, black and brown folks, we need to make sure that we are being um, not sensitive, but being, I guess, being as, as I don't know the word, I don't know, we're pushing it, pushing forward the, the alternatives to law enforcement in our schools. Um, but again, we are looking at safety. Black Parallel School Board, you know, made it very clear before school got back into live session that there were a lot of things going on in the internet and, you know, virtually on, on our platforms that, that children have put themselves in a position where they are acting out relatively um, unsafe things at school. So I, I really want to make sure that we're having a conversation. It will be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It will not be a comfortable conversation, but I, I really want to have it. So, um, you know, the guy who mentioned it earlier, it's, there's, a, there's, there's going to be a strong push to put SROs back in because the schools aren't safe. But we need to look at why schools are not being safe right now. And if we're not looking at the why, we're just putting a what in there and it's not going to help our situation. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, a, a, as we say, a robust discussion. Great, thank you. Member Rhodes. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, uh, we've been in, in Area 5, uh, we've been trying to um, reimagine our, our school sites, um, how we utilize our school sites, and and what we offer um, through that reimagining with principals and school site staff, uh, specifically at Success Academy. Uh, we've launched something called uh, Project Activation MetaView, um, and we've been holding monthly activations uh, in South Sacramento, um, leading up to uh, our current position now. Um, we've had an, a small investments from local electeds and other agencies, um, but now we um, just recently started uh, having a partnership with SMUD, um, who's giving donations so if we can continue that work over the next uh, year, or a year, two years, I'm sorry. And um, it's very exciting to see a pilot program um, get a little bit of the stability as we move forward. Um, and, and I'm super excited about the work and I look forward to expanding uh, the idea of reimagining our school sites as hubs of their community um, as we uh, continue into the work. So I just wanted to 
Uh, let my colleagues know about that. Um, also, South Sacramento, let you guys know about that as well. Come on out, uh, Success Academy. It's always a, a great time. We have a great uh, number of partners uh, providing great services to our community. Great. Thank you, Member Rhodes. Member Morawski. Yeah, um, again, congratulations to, to my colleagues on the executive committee. Um, I just wanted to, to say, you know, just to, to offer my assistance um, if needed with you know, if if we want to do committees um, to look at things, um, just have some some thoughts about governance, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, I I am just wanted want to let uh, my colleagues know that I'm I'm willing to participate or or lead some of those governance efforts if that's of um, of interest. And um, one one thing that I would like to see. Um, that could be exec committee, could be um, a, another committee, but but just some real intentional effort around um, the board planning calendar, and really making sure that we're building in um, appropriate uh, reports, and it's really being driven by the board um, as far as what we want to see when. Um, in terms of, we have a lot of you know mandated things that we have to do. We have to adopt a budget, et cetera, but also you know um, we. We have a facilities master plan. You know, when when are we going to build in regular times to come back to that and see um, what's happening? So just just things like that. You know, if we do that um, real quickly in the coming year, you know, I think that would be great. So just wanted to put that out there. I'm always happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Member Morales. Happy holidays. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, not seeing any other board comment. Item 12.0, consent agenda. Can I get a motion? Oh, thank you. Oh, hi, Terrence. You stayed on for the long haul of this meeting. Yep. Um, Welcome to tomorrow. Happy <laughs> thank you. Go thank ahead. You. Happy, uh, happy Friday before break. <laughs> To everybody, I hope that everyone, uh, you know, gets well-deserved rest and, um, you know, that we take the time, just like we did earlier, to just reflect on everything and come into the new year, um, you know, prepared to get back at this work that we do. It's a grind, but we got to keep doing it. Um, but, you know, if we're more rested, I think we can impact our scholars more effectively. Um, I, I implore you guys to act urgency that you push to return schools to a potentially uh, i mean students to a potentially unsafe environment to to return us to in-person meetings with you um i think in the same way that you know people get twitter fingers and get emboldened behind the screen um i question some of you guys decisions and i think a lot of that has to do with the disconnect because you say that you hear us but you don't see us even when we are making public comment you can't see our face you can't feel the emotion or the raw impact of your decisions so i think that that is imperative if we're going to move forward as a community on both sides of the screen right now in the same room um it's great that you guys are moving that student voice closer to the president president um but at least start with getting you know some scholars in that room with you so you guys are reminded of why you're doing the work not just on paper you know we we've done that for years like in pta and everything else and it really does make an impact that's why i spend so much time around young people because they hold me true to the impacts of what I decide, what I say, how I say them, and if I am doing what I say I stand for. So they hold me honest. Um, so even if you guys just start with allowing scholars back into that space, even if it's just the, scholar, uh, the stellar students, I think that that's a tremendous step um, to get us all to a better space. So um, again, thank you guys always, you know, for your time and, um, you know, bless you all and, and you guys have a, a great holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence, and thank you. We we are on that same page together. Um, we've just to have been allowing our staff to focus on uh, keeping our school safe and making sure that they stay opened. Um, but the plan is to hopefully soon have open meetings. So thank you. Okay. Uh, did we already have a motion? In a, okay, motion and a second. All right. Student preferential vote. Perfect. Thank you, Superintendent. Roll call. Member Pritchett? Aye. Member Morawski? Aye. Member Wu? Aye. Member Garcia? Aye. Member Villa? Aye. Member Rhodes? Aye. Member Phillips? Aye. Great. Item 13.0, Business and Financial Information Reports. We have received and future board meetings, January 13th um, and February 3rd. 
um, with that five um, item. <laughs> can't talk right now. Item 15.0 adjournment. Before we adjourn, I'd just like to um, adjourn in the memory of um, Terry V. Hill. Terry um, was, uh, uh, she worked for the California School Board Association and had worked closely with our board on our board workshops. Um, and uh, Terry, um, passed away from complications of, of COVID um, right before Thanksgiving. Um, Terry uh, was a, an advocate for all kids, was a board member in Fall River um, Union Senior High um, District for over 20 years. Um, she put her heart and soul um, into being a mother to her children and second to her community as a board member. Um, she will be sorely missed. So with that, I'll take a motion for adjournment. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Have a wonderful holiday break. We'll see you next year. <laughs>